Memoirs by Pablo Neruda Originally published in Spanish as Confieso que he vivido or I confess I have lived In these memoirs or recollections there are gaps here and there and sometimes they are also forgetful because life is like that Intervals of dreaming help us to stand up under days of work Many of the things I remember have blurred as I recalled them they have crumbled to dust like irreparably shattered glass What the memoir writer remembers is not the same thing the poet remembers He may have lived less but he photographed much more and he recreates for us with special attention to detail The poet gives us a gallery full of ghosts shaken by the fire and darkness of his time Perhaps I didn't live just in myself perhaps I lived the lives of others From what I have left in writing on these pages there will always fall as in the autumn grove or during the harvesting of the vineyards yellow leaves on their way to death and grapes that will find new life in the sacred wine My life is a life put together from all those lives the lives of the poet one the country boy the chilean forest under the volcanoes beside the snow capped mountains among the huge lakes the fragrant the silent the tangled chilean forest my feet sink down into the dead leaves a fragile twig crackles the giant rolly trees rise in all their bristling height a bird from tb cold jungle passes over flaps its wings and stops in the sunless branches and then from its hide away It sings like an oboe. The wild scent of the laurel, the dark scent of the boldo herb, enter my nostrils and flood my whole being. The cypress of the great cast blocks my way. This is a vertical world, a nation of birds, a plenitude of leaves. I stumble over a rock, dig up the uncovered hollow, an enormous spider covered with red hair stares up at me, motionless, as huge as a crab. A golden carabus beetle blows its mephitic breath at me as its brilliant rainbow disappears like lightning. Going on, I pass through a forest of ferns much taller than I am. From their cold green ice sixty tears splash down on my face and behind me their fans go on quivering for a long time. A decaying tree trunk. What a treasure. Black and blue mushrooms have given it years. Red parasite plants have covered it with rubies. Other lazy plants have let it borrow their beards, and a snake springs out of the rotted body like a sudden breath, as if the spirit of the dead trunk was slipping away from it. Farther along, each tree stands away from its fellows. They soar up over the carpet of the secretive forest, and the foliage of each has its own style: linear, bristling. Ramulos lanceolate as if cut by shears moving in infinite ways a gorge below the crystal water slides over granite and jasper a butterfly goes past bright as a lemon dancing between the water and the sunlight close by innumerable calceolarias nod their little yellow heads in greeting high up red copy hues lapageria rosea dangle like drops from the magic forests arteries The red copy hue is the blood flower the white copy hue is the snow flower a fox cuts through the silence like a bash sending a shiver through the leaves but silence is the law of the plant kingdom the barely audible cry of some bewildered animal far off the piercing interruption of a hidden bird the vegetable world keeps up its iou rustle until a storm churns up all the music of the earth Anyone who hasn't been in the Chilean forest doesn't know this planet. I have come out of that landscape, that mud, that silence to roam, to go singing through the world. Child and poetry. I'll start out by saying this about the days and the years of my childhood, the rain was the one unforgettable presence for me then. The great southern rain coming down like a waterfall from the pole. from the skies of cape horn to the frontier on this frontier my country's wild west i first opened my eyes to life the land poetry and the rain i have traveled a lot and it seems to me that the art of raining 
practiced with a terrible but subtle power in my native Araucania, has now been lost. Sometimes it rained for a whole month, for a whole year. Threads of rain fell, like long needles of glass snapping off on the roofs or coming up against the windows in transparent waves, and each house was a ship struggling to make port in the ocean of winter. This cold rain from the south of the Americas is not the sudden school of hot rain that comes down like a whip and goes on, leaving a blue sky in its wake. The southern rain is patient and keeps falling endlessly from the grey sky. The street in front of my house has turned into a huge sea of mud. Out the window, through the rain, I watch a cart stuck in the middle of the street. A peasant wearing a heavy black woolen cloak beats his oxen, the rain and the mud are too much for them. We used to walk to school, along the unpaved sidewalks, stepping from stone to stone, despite the cold and the rain. The wind carried off our umbrellas. Raincoats were expensive, I didn't like gloves, my shoes got soaked through. I'll always remember the wet socks hanging next to the brazier, and lots of shoes, steaming like toy locomotives. Then the floods would come and wash away the settlements along the river where the poor lived. The earth shook and trembled. At other times, a crest of terrifying light up yard on the Siraz, Metricton. Lama, the volcano, was stirring. Emuko is a pioneer town, one of those towns that have no past, though it does have hardware stores. Since the Indians can't read, the stores hang their eye-catching signs out on the streets, an enormous saw, a giant cooking pot, a cyclopean padlock, a mammoth spoon. Farther along the street, shoe stores, a colossal boot. Temuco was the farthest outpost of Chilean life in the southern territories, and therefore it had a long bloody history behind it. When the Spanish conquistadors pushed them back, after 300 years of fighting, the Araucanian Indians retreated to those cold regions. But the Chileans continued what they called the pacification of Araucania, their war of blood and fire to turn our countrymen out of their own lands. Every kind of weapon was used against the Indians, unsparingly, carbine blasts, the burning of villages, and later, a more fatherly method, alcohol and the law. The lawyer became a specialist at stripping them of their fields, the judge sentenced them when they protested, the priest threatened them with eternal fire. And hard spirits finally consummated the annihilation of a superb race whose deeds, valor, and beauty Don Alonso de Ursula carved in stanzas of jade and iron in his Arocana. My parents had come from Paril, where I was born. There, in central Chile, vineyards thrive and wine is plentiful. My mother, Dua Rosa Basulto, died before I could have a memory of her, before I knew it was she my eyes gazed upon. I was born on 12th July 1904, and a month later, in August, wasted away by tuberculosis, my mother was gone. Life was difficult for small farmers in the central part of the country. My grandfather, Don Joe's Angel Rice, had little land and many children. To me, my uncle's names were like the names of princes from far-off kingdoms. AM6S, Ozias, Joel, Abadfas. My father's name was simply Joe's Dale Carmen. He left his father's farm while he was still very young and worked as a laborer at the dry docks in the port of Talcahuano, eventually becoming a railroad man in Temuco. He was a conductor on a ballast train. Few people know what a ballast train is. In the southern region, with its violent gales, the rains would wash away the rails if gravel wasn't poured in between the ties. The ballast had to be taken out of the quarries in hoods and this caused gravel dumped onto flat cars. Forty years ago, the crew on this type of train had to be made of iron. They came from the fields, from the suburbs, from jails, and were huge, muscular laborers. The company paid miserable wages and no references were asked of those looking for work on these trains. My father, the conductor, had grown used to giving and taking orders. 
Sometimes he took me along. We quarried rocks in Boroa, savage heart of the frontier, scene of the terrible battles between the Spaniards and the Araucanians. There, nature made me euphoric. Birds, beetles, partridge eggs fascinated me. What a miracle it was, finding them in the ravines, blue, dark, and shiny, the color of a shotgun barrel. I marveled at the perfection of the insects. I collected snake mothers. This was the grotesque name given to the largest times beetle, black, glistening, and tough, the titan of insects in Chile. He gives you quite a turn when you come upon him suddenly, on the trunk of a ginger, wild apple, or coyu tree, and I knew he was so strong that I could stand on him and he wouldn't even crack. With his mighty shield to protect him, he had no need of venomous pincers. My expeditions filled the workers with curiosity. Before long, they started taking an active interest in my discoveries. The moment my father's back was turned, they slipped off into the jungle and with more skill, strength and intelligence than I. They found fantastic treasures for me. There was one fellow called Monj. According to my father, he was a dangerous man with a knife. He had two huge incisions on his swarthy face. One was the vertical scar left by a knife and the other his white, horizontal grin, full of charm and devil try. This fellow, Monj, would bring me white kopi hues, furry spiders, sucking ring doves, and once he found for me the most dazzling of all, the beetle of the koyu and the luma trees. I don't know if you have ever seen one. That was the only time I ever did. It was a streak of lightning dressed in the colors of the rainbow. Red and violet and green and yellow glittered on its shell. It escaped from my hands with the speed of lightning and went back into the forest again. Monge wasn't there to catch it for me. I have never quite recovered from that dazzling apparition. Nor have I forgotten my friend. My father told me about his death. He fell from a train and tumbled down a precipice. The convoy was stopped, but by then, my father told me he was just a sack of bones. It's difficult to describe a house like ours, a typical frontier house of 60 years ago. In the first place, these homes intercommunicated. Through the patio of the rice and the ortigas, of the Candia and the Messon families, tools and books, birthday cakes, liniments, umbrellas, tables and chairs changed hands. These pioneer homes formed the hub of all the activities of the village. Don Carlos Messon, a North American with a white mane of hair, who looked like Emerson, was the patriarch of this particular family. The Messon children were true Creoles. Don Carlos respected the law and the Bible. He was not an empire builder but one of the original settlers. No one had money, and yet printing presses, hotels, slaughterhouses burgeoned in this family. Some of the sons were newspaper editors and others just worked for them. In time, everything crumbled and everyone was left as poor as before. Only the Germans kept a stubborn hold on their assets and that singled them out in the hinterlands. Our houses, then, had something of a settler's temporary camp about them, or of an explorer's supply base. Anyone who came in saw kegs, tools, saddles, and all kinds of indescribable objects. There were always rooms that weren't finished, and half-completed stairways. There was, forever, talk of going on with the building. Parents were already beginning to think of a university education for their children. In Don Carlos Mason's home, the innost important holidays were observed. For every birthday dinner there was turkey with celery, lamb barbecued on a wooden spit, and floating island for dessert. It has been many years since I last tasted this custard. The white-haired patriarch sat at the head of the interminable table with his wife, Dofia Mycela Candia. Behind him, there was a huge Chilean flag with a tiny American one pinned onto it. 
those were also the proportions of their blood. Chile's Lone Star predominated. In the Messin house there was also a living room that we children were not allowed to go into. I never knew what color its furniture was because it was kept under white covers until a fire swept it away. There was an album in there with photographs of the family, finer and more delicate than the horrid colored blow-ups that invaded the frontier later on. There was a picture of my mother. She was a lady dressed in black, slender, with a faraway look. I have been told that she wrote poems, but I have never seen them, only the lovely portrait. My father had married again, his second wife was Dofia Trini that Candia Marward, my stepmother. I find it hard to believe that this is what I must call the guardian angel of my childhood. She was devoted and loving, and had a countryman's sense of humor and a diligent, inexhaustible kindness. As soon as my father came in, she would turn into a quiet shadow, as did all the women there in those days. I saw mazurkas and quadrilles danced in that living room. At home we had a trunk filled with fascinating things. A marvelous parrot preened on a calendar at the bottom of the chest. One day, while my mother was going through that sacred arc, I reached for the parrot and fell in, head first. As I got older, I used to open the trunk on the sly. There were some lovely fragile fans in it. I recall something else in that trunk. The first love story that intrigued me passionately. It consisted of hundreds of postcards sent by someone who signed himself Enrique or Alberto, I don't remember which, all addressed to Marfa Thielman. These cards were marvelous. They were photographs of the great actresses of the day, embossed with little chips of glass and sometimes with real hair pasted on the heads. There were also castles, cities, and foreign landscapes. For years I found pleasure only in the pictures. But, as I grew older, I read those love notes written in a flawless hand. I always imagined the suitor as a man with a derby, a cane, and a diamond stickpin. His messages, sent from all corners of the globe, were filled with reckless passion expressed in dazzling phrases, with love that threw caution to the winds. I, too, began to fall in love with Marfa Thielman. I imagined her as a haughty actress diademed, covered with pearls. But how did these letters come to be in my mother's trunk? I never found out. The year 1910 came to Temuco. That memorable year I started school, in a rambling mansion with sparsely furnished rooms and a gloomy basement. In the spring we could see from the school the graceful Cotfin River winding its way down below, its shores bordered with wild apple trees. We used to sneak out of class to dip our feet in the cold water running over the white stones. The school opened infinite vistas for this six-year-old. Anything might contain a mystery. The physics lab, which I was not allowed to enter, filled with glistening instruments, retorts, and test tubes. The library, forever closed. The sons of settlers had no love of book learning. Still, the cellar was the most fascinating place of all. There was a deep silence, a deep darkness, but with candles to light it up for us, we used to play war games there. The victors would tie their prisoners to some ancient columns. The odor of dampness, of a hideaway, a tomb, given off by the school basement in Temuco, still haunts my memory. I grew older. Books began to interest me. Buffalo Bill's adventures and Salgari's voyages carried me far into the world of dreams. My first loves, the purest ones, found expression in letters to Blanca Wilson, the blacksmith's daughter. One of the boys had fallen head over heels in love with her and asked me to write his love letters. I don't remember what these letters were like exactly, but they may have been my first literary achievement, because one day, when I ran into this schoolgirl, she asked if I was the author of the letters her sweetheart brought her. I couldn't deny my work and I said yes, very embarrassed. 
Then she handed me a quince, which of course I would not eat and put away like a treasure. Having thus replaced my friend in the girl's heart, I went on writing endless love letters to her and receiving quinces. The boys in school didn't know I was a poet and wouldn't have respected me for it. The frontier still had its marvelous quality of a wild west without prejudices. My companions' names were Snake, Schler, Hauser, Smith, Tato, Seranis. All of us, including the Aracinas and the Ramfreezes and the Rice, were equal. There were no Basque family names. There were Sephardim, Albalas, Francos, and Irish, Makjintis, Poles, Yanichuskis. The Araucanian names gave off a mysterious light, an aroma of wood and water, Melevilis, Ketrilios. Sometimes we would fight with acorns in the huge closed-in shed. Anyone who has never been hit by an acorn doesn't know how much it really hurts. Before reaching school, we would stuff our pockets with ammunition. I had little skill, no strength, and not much cunning. I always got the worst of it. While I was busy examining the marvelous acorn, green and polished, with its gray, wrinkled hood, or while I was still trying clumsily to make one of those pipes they eventually would grab away from me, a downpour of acorns would pelt my head. During my second year, I decided to wear a bright green rain hat. It belonged to my father, like the heavy woolen cape, the red and green signal lanterns, which I found so fascinating and took to school as soon as I got the chance to strut around with them. This time it was pouring and there was nothing so fantastic as the green oilskin hat that looked like a parrot. The moment I reached the shed, where three hundred roughnecks were chasing around like madmen, my hat flew off like a parrot. I ran after it, and each time I was about to catch it, off it flew, followed by the most deafening howls I have ever heard. I never laid eyes on it again. Among these memories, I can't see clearly the precise order of dying. I confuse insignificant events that were very special to me, and this one coming back to my mind now seems to have been my first erotic adventure, strangely mixed in with natural history. Perhaps love and nature were, very early on, the source of my poems. Across from my house lived two girls who were always giving me looks that made my face turn red. They were as precocious and diabolical as I was timid and quiet. This time I stood in my doorway trying not to look at them, they were holding something that fascinated me. I went closer, gingerly, and they showed me a wild bird's nest, woven together with moss and tiny feathers, in it were several marvelous little turquoise blue eggs. When I reached for it, one of the girls told me that they would have to feel through my clothes first. I was so scared I started to tremble and scurried away, pursued by the young nymphs holding the exciting treasure over their heads. During the chase, I went into an alley leading to a vacant bakery owned by my father. My assailants managed to catch me and had started to strip off my trousers when we heard my father's footsteps coming down the passage. That was the end of the nest. The marvelous little legs were left shattered, while under a counter we, the attacked and the attackers, held our breath. I also recall that one day, while hunting behind my house for the tiny objects and minuscule beings of my world, I discovered a hole in one of the fence boards. I looked through the opening and saw a patch of land just like ours, untended and wild. I drew back a few steps, because I had a vague feeling that something was about to happen. Suddenly a hand came through. It was the small hand of a boy my own age. When I moved closer, the hand was gone and in its place was a little white sheep. It was a sheep made of wool that had faded. The wheels on which it had glided were gone. I had never seen such a lovely sheep. I went into my house and came back with a gift, which I left in the same place, a pine cone, partly open fragrant and resinous, and very precious to me. I never saw the boy's hand again. 
I have never again seen a little sheep like that one. I lost it in a fire. And even today, when I go past a toy shop, I look in the windows furtively. But it's no use. A sheep like that one was never made again. Art and the rain dot just as the cold, the rain, the mud in the streets, that is, the nagging and crumbling winter of the southern part of America, came down on us, so to the yellow, scorching summer visited these regions. We were surrounded by unexplored mountains, but I wanted to know the sea. Providentially, my obliging father was loaned a house by one of his numerous railroad friends. In total darkness, at four o'clock in the night, I have never found out why they say four in the morning, my father woke up the whole house with his conductor's whistle. From that moment on, there was no rest, or any light either, and surrounded by candles whose tiny flames were battered by the drafts filtering in everywhere, my mother, my brother and sister Rodolfo and Laura, and the cook ran to and fro, doing up mattresses into enormous balls wrapped in burlap that were hastily rolled out of the way by the women. The beds had to be put aboard the train. The mattresses were still warm when they left for the nearby station. Sickly and weak by nature, and startled out of sleep, I felt nauseated and chilled to the bone. All the while, the fuss around the house went on, never ending. Everything was taken along on that month-long, poor man's vacation. Even the wicker dryers that were laid over the lit braziers to dry the sheets and clothes ever damp in that climate were tagged and bundled into the cart waiting outside for the luggage. The train's run was the stretch of that coal province between Temuco and Karahu. It crossed immense, unpopulated, uncultivated terrain, crossed virgin forests, rumbled through tunnels and over bridges, like an earthquake. The way stations were isolated in that wide countryside, among mimosas and flowering apple trees. In their ritual dress and ancestral majesty, Araucanian Indians waited at the stations to sell lambs, chickens, eggs, and textiles to the passengers. My father always bought something, after endless bargaining. His blonde goatee was something to watch as he picked up a hen in front of some inscrutable Araucanian woman who would not lower the price of her merchandise by half a cent. Each station had a lovelier name, almost all of them inherited from the ancient Araucanian. This was the region of the bloodiest battles between the invading Spaniards and the first Chileans, deep-rooted sons of the land. Labranza was the first station. Boroa and Ranquilco followed. Names with the fragrance of wild plants, the sound of their syllables captivated me. These Araucanian names always signified something delicious, buried honey, lagoons or a river beside a forest, or a wooden with the name of a bird. We passed the hamlet of Imperial, where the poet Don Alonso de Ursula was nearly executed by the Spanish Ghana. This was the capital of the conquistadors in the 15th and 16th centuries. During their war of independence, the Araucanians invented the tactic of scorched earth. They did not leave one building standing in the city described by Ursula as beautiful and proud. And then we came to the city on the river. The train whistled cheerfully, darkening the countryside and the station with giant plumes of coal smoke, bells clanged and you could now smell the wide, sky-blue, and tranquil imperial river as it ran to the ocean. Taking down the countless pieces of luggage, getting the small family organized and going in the oxcart to the boat that would ride down the imperial river was quite a production, directed, of course, by my father's blue eyes and his railwayman's whistle. We squeezed both the luggage and ourselves into the small boat that would take us to the sea. There were no birds. I sat near the bow. The wheels churned the river currents with their paddles, the small vessel's engines snorted and whined, and the taciturn southerners were spread about on the deck like motionless pieces of furniture. An accordion broke into its romantic plea, its love call. Nothing can flood a fifteen-year-old's heart with feeling like a voyage down a strange, wide river, between steep banks, on the way to the mysterious sea. 
Bajo Imperial was only a string of houses with red roofs. It was situated on the reverse bro. From the house that had been awaiting us and, even before, from the rickety piers where the little steamer tied up, I heard the ocean thundering in the distance, a commotion far away. The sea swells were coming into my life. The house belonged to Don Horatio Pacheco, a giant of a farmer who, all during the month we took over his house, went up and down the hills and impassable roads driving his tractor and thresher. With his machine he harvested the wheat of the Indians and those peasants cut off from coastal towns. He was a huge man who would suddenly burst in upon our railwayman's family with a booming voice, his body covered with cereal dust and straw. Then he would return just as noisily to his work in the mountains. For me he was one more example of the hard life in our southern region. I found everything mysterious in that house, in the neglected streets, in the unknown lives around me, in the deep roar of the sea far off. The house had what seemed to me a huge, straggly garden and, in the center of this, a summer house battered by the rain, a summer house of white slats covered with wines. No one except me, a mere nobody, ever penetrated this grey solitude, where the ivy, the honeysuckle, and my poetry thrived. And there was another fascinating thing in that strange garden, a huge lifeboat, orphaned in some great shipwreck and now stranded in this garden without waves or storms, a castaway among the poppies. The strange thing about this unkempt garden was that, by design or through neglect, only poppies grew there. The other plants had disappeared from this gloomy corner. Some were huge and white like doves, some scarlet like drops of blood, some purple or black, like widows forgotten there. I had never seen such a wilderness of poppies, and I have never seen another like it. And though I had a deep respect for them, and a superstitious dread only they, of all flowers, inspire in me, that did not stop me from snapping one off, now and again, the broken stem leaving sticky milk on my hands and a whiff of unearthly perfume. Then I would stroke its sumptuous petals lovingly and put them into a book to keep. To me they were the wings of huge butterflies that couldn't fly. The first time I stood before the sea, I was overwhelmed. The great ocean unleashed its fury there between two big hills, Uilk and Mall. It wasn't just the immense snow-crested swells, rising many meters above our heads, but the loud pounding of a gigantic heart, the heartbeat of the universe. The family laid out its table linen and tea things in that spot. The food reached my mouth sprinkled with sand, but I didn't care. What terrified me was the apocalyptic moment when my father ordered us to take our daily swim. Far back from the giant rollers, my sister Laura and I were splashed by the water's icy lash. And we trembled, believing that some wave's finger would hook us into the mountains of the sea. When, our teeth chattering and our ribs blew, my sister and I prepared to die, Hand in hand, the railwayman's whistle blew and my father's voice freed us from martyrdom. I'll tell about other mysteries in that place. One of these was the Percherons, and another the house of the three enchanted sisters. Several big buildings stood at the end of the small village. They may have been tanneries, owned by French Basques, who almost always ran the leather industry in southern Chile. I don't really know what they were used for. All I was interested in was watching the huge horses that came out of the front gates toward sundown and crossed the town. They were percherons, gigantic calls and mares. Their long manes fell down their very tall backs like human hair. They had enormous legs, also covered with tufts of hair that waved like huge plumes when they galloped off. They were deep red, white, Roan, powerful. That's how volcanoes would have moved if they had been able to trot and gallop like those colossal horses. They would go down the dusty, rocky streets like the violent shock of an earthquake. They whinnied huskily, producing subterranean sounds that sent a shudder through the quiet air. I have never again in my life seen such arrogant, massive, 
and statuesque horses, except perhaps for those I saw in China carved in stone for the tombs of the Ming dynasty. But even the most venerable stone cannot provide a sight like those huge animals that seemed, in my childish eyes, to emerge from the darkness of dreams, headed for some other world of giants. In fact, that untamed world was filled with horses. Chilean, German, and Araucanian riders, all wearing ponchos of black Castilian wool, mounted and dismounted in the streets. Scrawny or well-fed, shabby or sleek, the horses stayed where the riders left them, munching on the grass, with steam coming out of their nostrils. They were accustomed to their masters and to the lonely life of the settlement. Later they would return, loaded down with sacks of food or farm implements, to the labyrinthine highlands, climbing up dreadful roads or endlessly galloping over the sand by the sea. From time to time an Araucanian rider would come out of a pawn shop or a dim tavern, mount his unperturbed horse with difficulty, and take the road back to his home in the hills, swaying from side to side, drunk to the point of unconsciousness. As I watched him start off on his journey, it seemed to me that the tipsy centaur was about to fall every time he lurched dangerously, but I was wrong, he always righted himself, only to double over again, swaying toward the other side and always recovering, glued to the saddle. He covered mile after mile, sitting his horse like that, until he merged into the wild world of nature like an animal unsure of its way but mysteriously protected. We returned many other summers, with the same household ceremonies, to that fascinating region. With the passing of time, between the bitter winters in Temuco and the wonderful summers on the coast, I was growing up, reading, falling in love, and writing. I got used to riding on horseback. My world expanded upward and outward along the towering mud trails, over roads with sudden curves. I encountered the tangled vegetation, the silence or the sounds of wild birds, the sudden outburst of a flowering tree dressed in scarlet robes like a gigantic archbishop of the mountains, or snowed under by a riot of blossoms I had never seen before. Or from time to time, when least expected, the kopi hue bellflower, wild, untamable, indestructible, dangling from the thickets like a drop of fresh blood. Slowly I got used to the horse, the saddle, the stiff, complicated riding gear, the cruel spurs jangling at my heels. Along endless beaches or thicket hills, a communion was started between my spirit, that is, my poetry, and the loneliest land in the world. This was many years ago, but that communion, that revelation, that pact with the wilderness, is still a part of my life. My first POM now I am going to tell you a story about birds. In Lake Budhi, swans were brutally hunted. They were stalked quietly in boats and then, roving faster, faster swans, like the albatross, take to the air clumsily, they have to make a run, skimming the water. They lift their huge wings heavily, and so were easily caught, and finished off with sticks. Someone brought me a swan that was half dead. It was one of those magnificent birds I have not seen again anywhere in the world, a black-necked swan. A snowy vessel with its slender neck looking as if squeezed into a black silk stocking, its beak an orange color and its eyes red. This happened at the seaside, in Puerto Saavedra, Imperial Del Sur. It was almost dead when they gave it to me. I bade its wounds and stuffed bits of bread and fish down its throat. It threw up everything. But it recovered from its injuries gradually and began to realize that I was its friend. And I began to realize that homesickness was killing it. So I went down the streets to the river with the heavy bird in my arms. It swam a little way, close by. I wanted it to fish and showed it the pebbles on the bottom, the sand the silver fish of the south went gliding over. But its sad eyes wandered off into the distance. I carried it to the river and back to my house every day for more than twenty days. The swan was almost as tall as I. One afternoon it seemed dreamier, 
It swam near me but wasn't entertained by my ruses for trying to teach it how to fish again. It was very still and I picked it up in my arms to take it home. But when I held it up to my breast, I felt a ribbon unrolling and something like a black arm brushed my face. It was the long, sinuous neck fog. That's how I found out that swans don't sing when they die. Summer is like fire in Cotfin. It scorches the sky and the wheat. The land would like to shake off its lethargy. The houses are not prepared for summer, just as they were not prepared for winter. I wander off into the countryside and one walk, walk, walk. I become lost on Nylol Hill. I am alone, my pocket filled with beetles. In a box, I carry a hairy spider I just caught. Overhead, the sky can't be seen. The forest is always damp, my feet slip. Suddenly a bird cries out, it's the ghostly cry of the Chukau bird. A chill of warning creeps upward from my feet. The kopi hues, drops of blood, can barely be made out. I am only a tiny creature under the giant ferns. A ring dove flies right past my mouth with a snapping sound of wings. Higher up, other birds laugh harshly, mocking me. I have trouble finding my way back. It's late now. My father is not here yet. He will be back at three or four in the morning. I go upstairs to my room. I read Salgari. The rain pours down like a waterfall. In less than no time, night and the rain cover the whole world. I am alone, writing poems in my math notebook. I am up very early the next morning. The plums are green. I charge up the slopes. I carry a little packet of salt with me. I climb a tree, make myself comfortable, bite a little chunk out of a plum carefully and dip the plum into the salt. I eat it. And I repeat this, up to 100 plums. I know I'm overdoing it. Our other house burned down and this new one is filled with mystery. I climb up on the fence and I watch for the neighbors. There is no one around. I lift up some logs. Nothing but a few measly spiders. The toilet is at the back of the place. The trees next to it have caterpillars. The almond trees display their fruit covered with white down. I know how to catch bumblebees without harming them with a handkerchief. I keep them captive for a little while and hold them up to my ears. What a beautiful bus! How lonely a small boy poet, dressed in black, feels on the vast and terrifying frontier wilderness. Little by little, life and books give me glimpses of overwhelming mysteries. I can't forget what I read last night, in faraway Malaysia, Sandokan and his friends survived on breadfruit. I don't like Buffalo Bill because he kills Indians. But he's such a good carpenter. The plains and the cone-shaped tepees of the redskins are so beautiful. I have often been asked when I wrote my first poem, when poetry was born in me. I'll try to remember. Once, far back in my childhood, when one had barely learned to read, I felt an intense emotion and set down a few words, Half rhymed but strange to me, different from everyday language. Overcome by a deep anxiety, something I had not experienced before, a kind of anguish and sadness, I wrote them neatly on a piece of paper. It was a poem to my mother, that is, to the one I knew, the angelic stepmother whose gentle shadow watched over my childhood. I had no way at all of judging my first composition, which I took to my parents. They were in the dining room, immersed in one of those hushed conversations that, more than a river, separate the world of children and the world of grown-ups. Still trembling after this first visit from the muse, I held out to them the paper with the lines of verse. My father took it absent-mindedly, read it absent-mindedly, and returned it to me absent-mindedly, saying, Where did you copy this from? 
Then he went on talking to my mother in a lowered voice about his important and remote affairs. That, I seem to remember, was how my first poem was born, and that was how I had my first sample of irresponsible literary criticism. And all the while I was moving in the world of knowing, on the turbulent river of books, like a solitary navigator. My appetite for reading did not let up day or night. On the coast, in the tiny town of Puerto Saavedra, I found a public library and an old poet, Don Augusto Winter, who was impressed by my literary voracity. Have you read them already? He would to me, handing me a new Vargas Villa, an Ibsen, a Rocambole. I gobbled up everything, indiscriminately, like an ostrich. Around this time, a tall lady who wore long, long dresses and flat shoes came to Temuco. She was the new principal of the girls' school. She was from our southernmost city, from Magellan's Snows. Her name was Gabriela Mistral. I used to watch her passing through the streets of my hometown with her sweeping dresses and I was scared of her. But when I was taken to visit her, I found her to be very gracious. In her dark face, as Indian as a lovely Araucanian pitcher, her very white teeth flashed in a full, generous smile that lit up the room. I was too young to be her friend and too shy and taken up with myself. I saw her only a few times, but I always went away with some books she gave me. They were invariably Russian novels, which she considered the most extraordinary thing in world literature. I can say that Gabriela introduced me to the dark and terrifying vision of the Russian novelists and that Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, and Chekhov soon occupied a special place deep within me. They are with me still. The House of the Three Widows One time I was invited to a threshing, it was to be done in the old way, with mares. The place was high up in the mountains and pretty far from town. I liked the adventure of going off by myself, figuring out the right route in that mountainous country. I thought if I got lost, somebody would help me out. On my horse, I left Bajo Imperial behind and narrowly made it across the sandbar of the river. There the Pacific breaks loose and attacks, again and again, the rocks and the clumps of bushes on Mall Hill, the last height, standing very tall. Then I tumbed off along the shore of Lake Budi. The surf pounded the foot of the hill with savage blows. I had to take advantage of the few minutes that elapsed when a wave smashed and pulled itself in to regain its strength. We would hurry across the strip between the hill and the water, before a new wave could crush us, my horse and me, against the rugged hillside. The danger passed, the smooth blue sheet of the lake opened out to the west. The sandy coast ran on endlessly toward the mouth of Lake Tolton, a long way off. These coasts of Chile, often rugged and craggy, suddenly turn into endless ribbons and you can go for days and nights over the sand, close to the sea's foam. The beaches seem infinite, forming, along the length of Chile, something like a planet's ring, a winding band, pursued relentlessly by the roar of the southern seas, a trail that appears to go around the coast of Chile and beyond the South Pole. On the forested side, Hajil trees with shining dark green branches waved to me, some trimmed with clusters of fruit, hazelnuts that seemed to be painted vermilion, so red are they at that time of year. The giant ferns of southern Chile were so tall that we could pass under their branches without touching them, my horse and I. Whenever my head brushed against their green, a shower of dew would drench us, Lake Budi spread out on my right, a steady blue sheet bordered by far-off woods. It was only at the end of the lake that I saw some people. They were strange fishermen. In that strip where the ocean and the lake join, or embrace, or clash, between the two waters, there were some saltwater fish, cast out by the rough waves. The huge loaches were specially coveted, broad silver fish, strays thrashing about on those shoals. One, two, three, four, five fishermen, erect, concentrating, 
washed for the wake of the lost fish and suddenly brought a long trident down on the water with a terrific blow. Then they lifted high the oval-shaped silver fish, shuddering and gleaming in the sun before dying in the fish and times nins baskets. It was growing late. I had left the banks of the lake and moved inland looking for the road along the jagged spurs of the hills. Darkness was inching in. Suddenly the wail of a strange wild bird passed overhead like a hoarse moan. An eagle or a condor high up in the twilight sky seemed to halt its black wings as a signal that I was there, following me in its heavy flight. Red-tailed foxes howled or barked or streaked across the road, and small predatory animals of the secret forest that were unknown to me. I realized that I had lost my way. The night and the forest which had made me so happy became menacing now, they filled me with terror. One solitary traveller appeared unexpectedly in front of me, in the darkening loneliness of the road. As we approached each other, I stopped and saw that he was just one more of those rough peasants, with cheap poncho and scrawny haws, who emerged from the silence every now and then. I told him what had happened to me. He answered that I couldn't get to the threshing that night. He knew each and every corner of that terrain. He knew the exact spot where they were threshing. I told him I didn't want to spend the night outdoors and asked if he could tell me where I might find shelter till daybreak. He instructed me, in a few words, to go to leagues down a small trail that branched off from the road. You'll see the lights of a big two-story frame house in the distance, he told me. Is it a hotel? I asked him. No, young man. But you'll be welcomed. There are three French ladies in the lumber business who have been living there thirty years now. They're nice to everybody. They'll put you up. I thanked the horseman for his meager counsel and he trotted off on his rickety nab. I continued along the narrow trail, like a lost soul. A virgin moon, curved and white like a fragment of fingernail newly clipped off, was starting its climb up the sky. About nine o'clock that night, I made out lights that could only be a house. I spurred my horse on before bolts and crossbars could block my way to that godsend heaven. I went in the gate of the property and, dodging logs and hills of sawdust, I reached the entrance, or white portico, of that house lost so far out of the way in the wilderness. I rapped on the door, softly at first, and then harder. Some minutes passed, the dreadful thought that no one was there running through my head, before a slender white-haired lady dressed in black appeared. She examined me with stern eyes, opening the door part way to question so late a traveller. Who are you? What do you want? A quiet, ghostly voice asked. I've lost my way in the forest. I'm a student. I was invited to the threshing at the Hernandez. I'm very tired. Someone told me you and your sisters are very hospitable. I'd just like a corner to sleep in, and I'll be on my way at daybreak. Do come in, she said. Please feel at home. She led me to a dark parlour and lit two or three parafna lamps. I noticed that they were lovely Art Nouveau lamps, opaline and gilt bronze. The room had a dank smell. Long, red draperies shielded the tall windows. The armchairs were under white slipcovers to protect them. From what? It was a room from some other century, hard to place and as disquieting as a dream. The white-haired lady, wistful, in black, moved about on feet I couldn't see, with steps I couldn't hear, her hands touching first this, then that, an album, a fan, here, there, in the silence. I felt as if I had fallen to the bottom of a lake and lived on, exhausted, dreaming down there. Suddenly two ladies, just like the one who had received me, came in. It was late and it was cold. They sat close to me, one with the wake smile of someone flirting just a little, the other with the melancholy eyes of the one who had opened the door. 
Suddenly the conversation wandered very far from that out of way countryside, far also from the night drilled through by thousands of insects, the croaking of frogs, and the songs of night birds. They wanted to know all about my studies. I happened to mention Baudelaire and told them I had started to translate his poems. It was like an electric spark. The three dim ladies lit up. Their lifeless eyes and their stiff faces were transfigured, as if three ancient masks had dropped from their ancient features. Baudelaire! They exclaimed. This is probably the first time since the beginning of the world that anyone has spoken his name in this lonely place. We have his fleurs du mal here. We are the only ones, for 500 kilometers around, who can read his marvelous pages. No one in these mountains knows any French. Two of the sisters had been born in Avignon. The youngest, also of French blood, was Chilean by birth. Their grandparents, their parents, all their relatives, had died a long time ago. The three had grown accustomed to the rain, to the wind, to the sawdust from the mill, to having contact with only a very few primitive peasants and country servants. They had decided to remain there, the only house in those shaggy mountains. An Indian servant girl came in and whispered something into the ear of the eldest lady. We went out then, down chilly hallways, until we came to the dining room. I was stunned. In the center of the room, a round table with trailing white tablecloth was illuminated by two silver candelabra with many burning candles. Silver and crystal glittered on that amazing table. I was overcome by great timidity, as if Queen Victoria had invited me to dine at her palace. I had arrived disheveled, exhausted, and covered with dust, and this was a table fit for a prince. I was far from being one. And to them must have looked more like a sweaty mule driver who had left his drove at their door. I have seldom eaten so well. My hostesses were masters of the art 6F cooking and had as a legacy from their grandparents the recipes of their beloved Franz. Each dish was a surprise, tasty and aromatic. From their cellars they brought out vintage wines, aged by them in the special French way. Although weariness would suddenly close my eyes, I listened to them speaking of strange wonders. The sisters' greatest pride was the fine points of cookery. For them, the table was the preservation of a sacred heritage, of a culture to which they, separated from their country by time and great oceans, would never return. Laughing a little at themselves, they showed me a curious card file. We are just crazy old women, the youngest said. Over the past 30 years they had been visited by 27 travellers who had come as far as this remote house, some on business, others out of mere curiosity, still others, like myself, by chance. THC incredible thing was that they had a personal file for every one of them, with the date of the visit and the menu they had prepared on each occasion. We saved the menu so as not to repeat even a single dish, if those friends should ever return. I went off to sleep and dropped into bed like a sack of onions in a market. At dawn I lit a candle, washed up, and got dressed. It was already getting light when one of the stable boys saddled my horse. I didn't have the heart to say goodbye to the kind ladies in black. Deep in me, something told me it had all been a strange, magical dream, and that, to keep from breaking the spell, I must try not to wake up. All this happened 45 years ago, when I was just entering adolescence. What became of those three ladies exiled with their fleurs du mal in the heart of the virgin forest? What happened to their bottles of old wine, their resplendent table lit by twenty wax candles? What was the fate of the sawmill and the white house lost among the trees? The simplest fate, death and oblivion. Perhaps the forest devoured those lives and those rooms that took me in, one unforgettable night. Yet they live on in my memory as in the clear bed of a lake of dreams. Honor to those three melancholy women who struggled in that wild solitude, 
with no practical purpose to maintain an old world elegance defended what their ancestors had forged with their own hands the last traces of an exquisite culture far off in the wilderness at the last boundaries of the most impenetrable and lonely mountains in the world love in the wheat i reached the hernandez camp before noon fresh and cheerful my solitary ride over empty roads and a good night's sleep had given my reticent young face a certain glow the threshing of wheat oats barley was still done with mares there is nothing gayer in the world than the sight of mares circling trotting around a heap of grain under the goading shouts of the riders there was a splendid sun and the air an uncut diamond made the mountains glitter the threshing is a golden feast the yellow straw piles up into golden hills and there's noise and activity everywhere sacks rushing to get filled women cooking runaway horses dogs barking children who are constantly having to be plucked like fruit borne by the straw from under the horses hoofs the hernandez were a unique tribe the men were unkempt and unshaven in shirt sleeves with revolvers in their belts and almost always splattered with grease with dust from the grain with mud or soaked to the bone by rain fathers sons nephews cousins all looked alike They spent hours on end working under a motor on a roof perched on a threshing machine. They never had anything to talk about. They joked about everything except when they got into a brawl. Then they fought with the fury of a tornado, knocking down anything that stood in their way. They were always the first to get to the beef barbecues out in the open fields, to the red wine and the brooding guitars. They were frontiersmen. the kind of people i liked studious looking and pale i felt puny next to those vigorous brutes and i don't know why but they treated me with a deference they generally didn't show anyone after the barbecue the guitars the blinding fatty brought on by the sun and the threshing we had to find a makeshift bed for the night married couples and women who were alone bedded down on the ground inside the camp walls put up with freshly cut boards We males had to sleep on the threshing floor. This rose into a mountain of straw and a whole hamlet could have settled into its yellow softness. All this lack of comfort was new to me. I didn't know how to go about spreading out. I put my shoes carefully under a layer of wheat straw and this was to serve as my pillow. I took off my clothes, bundled myself up in my poncho and sunk into the mountain of straw. I lagged far behind all the others who gave themselves up to their snoring at once as one man. I lay stretched out on my back for a long while with my eyes open, my face and arms covered with straw. The night was clear, cold and penetrating. There was no moon, but the stars looked as if they had recently been watered by the rain and high above the unseeing sleep of all the others, they twinkled in the sky's lap just for me. Then I fell asleep. But I woke up suddenly because something was coming toward me. A stranger's body was moving through the straw and coming closer to mine. I was afraid. The thing was slowly drawing closer. I could hear the wisps of straw snapping, crushed by the unknown shape that kept moving toward me. My whole body stiffened, waiting. Maybe I ought to get up and yell. I remained stock still. I could hear breathing right next to my head. Suddenly a hand slid over me, a large, calloused hand, but it was a woman's. It ran over my bro, my eyes, my whole face tenderly. Then an avid mouth clung to mine and I felt a woman's body pressing against mine all the way down to my feet. Little by little my fear turned into intense pleasure. My hand slid over braided hair, a smooth brow, eyes with closed lids soft as poppies, and went on exploring. I felt two breasts that were full and firm, broad, rounded buttocks, legs that locked around me, and I sunk my fingers into pubic hair like mountain moss. Not a word came from that anonymous mouth. How difficult it is to make love 
without making noise, in a mountain of straw burrowed by the bodies of seven or eight other men, sleeping men who must not be awakened for anything in the world. And yet we can do anything, though it may require infinite care. A little while later, the stranger suddenly fell asleep next to me, and worked into a fever by the situation, I started to get panicky. It would soon be daybreak, I thought, and the first workers would discover the naked woman stretched out beside me on the threshing floor. But I also fell asleep. When I woke up, I put out a startled hand and found only a warm hollow, a warm absence. Soon a bird began to sing and then the whole forest filled with warbling. There was a long blast from a motor horn, and men and women began moving about and turning to their chores. A new day of threshing was getting underway. At midday all of us had lunch together around a makeshift table of long planks. I looked out of the corners of my eyes as I ate, trying to find which of the women could have been my night visitor. But some were too old, others too skinny, and many were merely young girls as thin as sardines. And I was looking for a well-built woman with full breasts and long, braided hair. Suddenly a woman came in with a piece of roast for her husband, one of the Hernandez men. This certainly could be the one. As I watched her from the other end of the table, I was sure I caught this attractive woman in long braids throwing me a quick glance and the slightest of smiles. And I felt as if the smile was growing broader and deeper, opening up inside my whole being. Memoirs by Pablo Neruda Lost in the city Rooming houses After many years of school and the struggle through the math exam each December, I was outwardly prepared to face the university in Santiago. I say outwardly because my head was filled with books, dreams, and poems buzzing around like bees. Carrying a metal trunk, wearing the requisite black suit of the poet, all skin and bones, thin featured as a knife, I boarded the third class section of a night train that took an interminable day and night to reach Santiago. This long train crossed different zones and climates, I took it so many times and it still holds a strange fascination for me. Peasants with wet ponchos and baskets filled with chickens, uncommunicative Indians, an entire life unfolded in the third-class coach. Quite a number of people travelled without paying, under the seats. Whenever the ticket collector came around, a metamorphosis took place. Many disappeared, and others might hide under a poncho on which two passengers immediately pretended to play a game of cards to keep the conductor from noticing the improvised table. Meanwhile, the train passed from the countryside covered with oaks and araucaria trees and frame houses with sodden walls to the poplars and the dusty adobe buildings of central Chile. I made the round trip between the capital and the provinces many times, but I always felt myself stifling as soon as I left the great forests, the timberland that drew me back like a mother. To me, the adobe houses, the cities with a past, seemed to be filled with cobwebs and silence. Even now I am still a poet of the great outdoors, of the cold forest that was lost to me after that. I brought my references to a rooming house at 513 Maruri Street. Nothing can make me forget this number. I forget all kinds of dates, even years, but the number 513 is still in my mind, where I engraved it so many years ago, fearing I would never find that rooming house and would lose my way in the strange, or inspiring city. On the street just mentioned, I used to sit out on the balcony and watch the dying afternoon, the sky with its green and crimson banners, the desolation of the rooftops on the edge of town threatened by the burning sky. At that time, living in a rooming house for students meant starvation. I wrote a lot more than I had up until then, but I ate a lot less. Some of the poets I knew in those days broke down under the strict diet of poverty. Among them, I remember Romeo Murga, a poet my own age but much taller and gawkier than I, whose subtle lyric poetry was filled with emanations that lingered wherever it was heard. 
Romeo Murga and I went to read our poetry together in the city of San Bernardo near the capital. Before we took the stage, everyone had been in a festive mood watching the queen of the floral games, fair and blonde, with her court and enjoying the speeches of the town dignitaries and the so-called local bands, but when I went on and began reciting my poems in the most wretched voice in the world, everything changed. The audience coughed, joked about me, and had a good time laughing at my melancholy poems. Seeing this reaction from the barbarians, I rushed through my reading and left the stage to my companion, Romeo Murga. It was something to remember. When this quicksort, over six feet tall, with dark, frayed clothes, came on and began reading in a voice that was even more wretched than mine, no one in the audience could hold back his indignation and they all began to shout, You starving poets! Get out! Don't spoil the celebration! I moved out of the Maruri street rooming house like a mollusk leaving its shell. I said goodbye to that shell and went out to explore the sea, that is, the world. The unknown sea was the streets of Santiago, which I had seen almost nothing of, as I walked back and forth between the university and the room I was now leaving for good. I knew that during this adventure there would be more of the old hunger to face. At least my former landladies, remotely linked to my part of the country, mercifully doled out a potato or an onion from time to time. But I could not help it, life, love, glory, freedom called to me. Or so it seemed. I rented the first room where I was completely on my own, over on Arguel Street near the Teachers' Institute. A sign peered through a window on that grey street, Rooms for Rent. The landlord lived in the front rooms. He was a man with graying hair, a noble bearing, and eyes that seemed odd to me. He was talkative and quite eloquent, and he earned a living as a lady's hairdresser, an occupation he shrugged off. He explained that he was more interested in the invisible world, the world of the beyond. I unpacked my books and the few clothes I possessed, from the trunk that had travelled with me from Temuco, and I stretched out in bed to read and sleep, filled with pride at my independence and my idleness. The house had no patio, only a gallery lined with innumerable closed rooms. The next morning, as I explored the nooks and crannies of the lonely mansion, I noticed that all the walls, including the toilets, displayed signs saying more or less the same thing, resign yourself. You cannot get in touch with us. You are dead. Alarming notices that cropped up in every room, in the dining room, in the corridors, in the tiny parlors. It was during one of Santiago's harsh winters. From colonial Spain my country had inherited a vulnerability to the rigors of nature as well as a disregard for them. Fifty years after the events I am recounting now, Ilya Ehrenberg, who had just come from the snowy streets of Moscow, told me he had never felt so cold as he had in Chile. Winter had turned the glass windows blue. The trees on my street shivered with cold. The horses pulling the old carriages blew clouds of steam through their nostrils. It was the worst possible time to be in that house, among sinister intimations of the beyond. Koffer poor Diemenes and occultist, the landlord stared straight through me with the eyes of a madman, and calmly explained. My wife Charito died four months ago. This is a trying moment for the dead. They go on visiting the old places where they lived. We can't see them, but they don't know that we can't see them. We have to let them know this so they won't suffer, thinking we are indifferent. That's why I've put up those signs for Charito, they will make it easier for her to understand that she is dead now. But the grey-headed man must have thought that I was much too clever. He started to watch my comings and goings, to make rules about female visitors, to pry into my books and my letters. I would enter my room without warning, to find the occultist going over my scanty furniture, investigating my poor belongings. 
I had to look for new lodgings to shelter my threatened independence, so I made the rounds of the unfriendly streets in the dead of winter. I found a place a short distance away, in a laundry. It was obvious to me that here the landlady had nothing to do with the world beyond. Rundown gardens straggled through chilly patios with fountains whose stagnant water the algae covered with solid green rugs. There was a back room with a very high ceiling and transoms over tall doors. In my eyes, this increased the distance between the floor and the ceiling. I stayed in that house, in that room. We student poets led a wild life. I kept up my country ways, working in my room, writing several poems every day, and forever drinking cups of tea I prepared for myself. But, away from my room and my street, the turbulent life of writers in those days had its special fascination. They didn't go to the cafes but to the bare taverns and the regular bars. Conversations and poems were passed around till daybreak. My studies were suffering from all this. The railroad company supplied my father with a cape of thick grey felt for his outdoor work, but he never wore it. I made it a feature of the poet. Three or four other poets also started wearing similar capes, and these constantly changed hands. This garment used to stir up the fury of good people and of others who were not so good. It was the heyday of the tango, which came to Chile not only with its heavy beat and its thrumming, tijera, its accordions and its rhythm, but also with its entourage of toughs who invaded a nightlife and the out-of-the-way places where we got together. These underworld characters, dancers and troublemakers, sniggered at our capes and our way of life. We poets fought back hard. Around that time, I unexpectedly struck up a friendship with a widow who is stamped forever on my mind. She had big blue eyes that became misty with tenderness whenever she remembered her late beloved husband. He had been a young novelist, noted for his handsome physique. Together they had made a striking couple, she with her wheat-colored hair, her irreproachable figure, and her deep blue eyes, and he very tall and athletic. The novelist had been destroyed by what used to be called galloping consumption. Later I felt sure that his blonde consort also contributed her share as galloping Venus, and that together the prepenicillin age and the spirited widow carried off the monumental husband in a couple of months. The lovely widow had not yet peeled off her dark clothing for me, the black and purple silks that made her look like a snow-white fruit covered with a rind of morning. That skin slipped off one afternoon in my room, at the rear of the laundry, and I was able to fondle and explore all that fruit of fiery snow. The natural rapture was about to be consummated, when I noticed her eyes closing below mine, as she cried out, sighing and sobbing, Oh, Roberto, Roberto! It seemed to be a ritual performance. The Vestal Virgin calling on the vanished God before surrendering to a new rite. However, in spite of my youth and need, this widow seemed too much for me. Her invocations became more and more urgent and her spirited heart was slowly leading me to a premature destruction. Love, in such doses, is not good for malnutrition. And my malnutrition was becoming more dramatic every day. Shyness I really lived many of the first years of my life, and perhaps many of the next ones and the ones after that, as a kind of deaf-mute. Dressed in ritual black since I had been a young boy, like the true poets of the last century, I had the vague impression that I didn't look bad at all. But, instead of going after girls, since I knew I would stutter or turn red in front of them, I preferred to pass them up and go on my way, showing a total lack of interest I was very far from feeling. They were all a deep mystery to me. I would have liked to burn at the stake in that secret fire, to drown in the inscrutable depth of that well, but I lacked the courage to throw times myself into the fire or the water. And since I could find no one to give me a push, I walked along the fascinating edge, without even a side glance, much less a smile. The same thing happened to me in front of grown-ups, insignificant persons, 
railroad or post office employees with their sefioras esposas their lady wives so referred to because the petite bourgeoisie is shocked intimidated by the word mujer woman or wife i listened to the conversations at my father's table but the next day if i ran into those who had dined at my home the evening before i didn't dare greet them i even crossed over to the other side of the street to avoid embarrassment Shyness is a kink in the soul, a special category, a dimension that opens out into solitude. Moreover, it is an inherent suffering, as if we had two epidermises and the one underneath rebelled and shrank back from life. Of the things that make up a man, this quality, this damaging thing, is a part of the alloy that lays the foundation, in the long run, for the perpetuity of the self. My reign haunted backwardness. My long drawn out retreat into myself lasted longer than it should have. When I came to the capital, I slowly acquired new friends of both sexes. The less attention people paid to me, the easier it was for me to make friends. I was not particularly curious about mankind then. I can't get to know all the people in this world, I said to myself. Still and all, a faint curiosity was stirred up in certain circles by this new poet just over 16 a reticent boy a loner whom they saw come and go without so much as a good morning or goodbye aside from the fact that i'd be wearing a long spanish cape that made me look like a scarecrow no one suspected that my striking attire was made to order for my party among the people who sought my company were two big snobs of the day Below Yafis and his wife Mina they were the perfect embodiment of the beautiful idyl life i would have loved to live more remote than a dream it was my first time in a house with heat soft lighting pleasant furniture walls covered with books whose multicolored spines were like a springtime that was inaccessible to me kindly and discreet overlooking my various layers of silence and withdrawal The Yafises often invited me to their home. I used to leave their house in a happy mood, and they noticed and invited me again. I saw Cubist paintings for the first time in that house, a Juan Gris among them. They told me that Juan Gris had been a friend of the family in Paris. But what intrigued me most was my friend's pajamas. Whenever I could. I examined them out of the corner of my eye with intense admiration. It was winter and the pajamas were made of a heavy material like the base on billiard tables but a deep sea blue. In those days I couldn't imagine any kind of pajamas except striped ones like prison uniforms. Below Yao's wees like nothing I had ever seen. Their heavy fabric, their resplendent blue aroused the envy of the poor poet who lived in the Santiago suburbs and in 50 years i have not come across any pajamas quite like those i lost sight of the yafises for many years she gave up her husband and she also gave up the soft lighting and excellent armchairs for an acrobat in a russian circus that passed through santiago later on she sold tickets all the way from australia to the british isles to help out the acrobat who had swept her off her feet she ended up as a rosicrucian or something like that with a group of mystics in the south of france as for pillow yaways the husband he changed his name to one emmer and in time became a powerful though still undiscovered writer we were lifelong friends silent and kindly but poor that's how he died His many books have yet to be published but they are sure to take root and blossom some day. I leave below Ifees or Juan Emmer and take up my shyness again recalling that during my student days my friend below was set on introducing me to his father. I'm sure he'll get you a trip to Europe he told me. At that moment all Latin American poets and painters had their eyes riveted on Paris. Pillow's father was a very important man, a senator. He lived in one of those enormous ugly houses on a street near the Plaza de Armas and the Presidential Palace, where no doubt he would have preferred to live. 
my friends stayed in the anteroom after stripping off my cape to make me look more normal they opened the door to the senator's study for me and shut it behind me it was an immense room and may have been a great reception hall at one time but it was just about empty now except deep inside at the far end where i could make out an armchair with the senator in it under a floor lamp the pages of the newspaper he was reading hid him completely like a screen taking my first step on the murderously waxed and buffed parquet i slid like a skier i picked up speed dizzily i tried to break myself only to lose my footing and fall several times my last spill was right at the feet of the senator who was observing me now with cold eyes without letting go of his paper i managed to sit down in a small chair next to him the great man inspected me with the eye of a bored entomologist to whom someone brings a specimen that he already knows inside out a harmless spider he questioned me vaguely about my projects after my spill i was even more timid and less eloquent than ever i don't know what i told him at the end of 20 minutes he put out a tiny hand toward me as a sign of dismissal i thought i heard him promise in a very soft voice that i would hear from him then he picked up his newspaper again and i started back across the dangerous parquet taking all the precautions i should have taken when first stepping onto it of course the senator my friend's father never let me hear from him on the other hand sometime later a military revolt which was actually stupid and reactionary got him to jump out of his chair with his everlasting paper i confess that this made me happy the student federation In Temuco I had been a correspondent for the Review Claridad the student federation's organ and I used to sell 20 or 30 copies to my schoolmates One piece of news that reached Temuco in 1920 left bloody scars on my generation The Golden Youth offspring of the oligarchy had attacked and destroyed the student federation's headquarters The authorities who from colonial times to the present have been at the service of the rich did not jail the assaulters but the assaulted Domingo G6 Mays Rojas the young hope of Chilean poetry was tortured and went mad and died in a dungeon Within the national context of a small country the repercussions of this crime were as profound and far reaching as those of Federico Gagfa Lorca's assassination in Granada later When I arrived in Santiago in March 1921 to enter the university the capital of Chile had only 500,000 inhabitants it smelled of gas fumes and coffee thousands of buildings housed strangers and bedbugs public transportation was handled by small rickety street cars that struggled along with a loud clanking of iron and bells the ride from Independencia Avenue to the other end of town near the central station where my college was located took forever the student federation's headquarters was frequented by the most famous figures of the student rebellion ideologically linked to the powerful anarchist movement of the day alfredo demrafa daniel schwetzer santiago labarca juan gandolfo were the best known leaders the most formidable was undoubtedly juan gandolfo who was feared for his bold political thinking and his unflagging courage he treated me as if i was just a boy which of course i was on one occasion when i arrived at his office late for a medical appointment he frowned at me and said why didn't you get here on time there are other patients waiting i didn't know what time it was i replied take this so you'll know next time he said pulling his watch from his vest pocket and giving it to me one gandolfo was short moon-faced and prematurely bald yet he always made his presence felt once a troublemaking army man who was well known as a bully and a good swordsman challenged him to a duel gandolfo took him up on it learned fencing in two weeks and left his rival battered and scared witless around that same time He engraved in wood the cover and all the illustrations for my first book 
Crepusculario, impressive woodcuts done by a man no one ever associated with art. The most important figure in the revolutionist literary world was Roberto Meja Fuins, editor of the magazine Juventud, owned also by the Student Federation, but with more contributors and more carefully prepared than Claridad. Outstanding in it was the work of Gonzalez Vera and Manuel Rojas, who were, for me, from a much older generation. Manuel Rojas had recently come back from Argentina after many years there, and he astonished us with his impressive size and his words, dropped with a kind of condescension, pride, or dignity. He was a linotypist. I had known Gonzalez Vera in Temuco, where he had fled after the police assault on the student federation. He came to see me straight from the railroad station, which was a short distance from my house. His sudden appearance had to impress a 16-year-old poet. I had never seen such a pale man. His fleshless face seemed to be carved in bone or ivory. He wore black, a black frayed at the extremities of trouser legs and sleeves, which, however, did not make him look less elegant. His words sounded ironical and sharp from the very first. On the rainy night that brought him to my house, I had not even known that he existed, I was moved by his presence, just as Sacha Yegulev is moved by the revolutionary nihilists coming to his home, Andreev's fictional character, Yegulev, was looked on by young Latin American rebels as their model. Alberto Rojas Gimenez the review Claridad, which I joined as a political and literary militant, was run almost single-handedly by Alberto Rojas Gimenez, who was to become one of the closest friends I would have among my own generation. He wore a cordovan hat and the long mutton chop whiskers of a grandee. Well-groomed and elegant despite his poverty, in the midst of which he seemed to preen like a golden bird, he embodied all the qualities of the new dandy, an attitude of contempt, a quick grasp of our numerous conflicts, as well as a cheerful sophistication and an appetite for everything in life. He knew all about everything, books and girls, bottles and ships, itineraries and archipelagos, and he flaunted this knowledge even in his slightest gestures. He moved about in the literary world with the condescending air of a perpetual idler, someone in the habit of wasting all his talent and charm. His neckties were always magnificent displays of prosperity in the midst of general poverty. He was constantly moving into a new home or to a new city, and thus for a few weeks his natural good humor, his persistent and spontaneous bohemian ways, delighted incredulous people in Rancagua, Curic 6, Valdivia, Concepci 6 Sen, Valparaiso. He always went away as he had come, leaving poems, drawings, neckties, loves, and friendships wherever he had been. Since he was as unpredictable as a storybook prince and unbelievably Jean heiress, he gave away everything, his hat, his shirt, his jacket, and even his shoes. When he had no material belongings left, he would jot down a phrase on a scrap of paper, a line from a poem or something amusing that came into his head, and he would offer it to you as he went, with a magnanimous look on his face, as if he were putting a priceless jewel in your hand. His poems were written in the latest fashion, according to the doctrines of Apollinaire and Spain's altruist group. He had founded a new school of poetry and called it Agu, which, he said, was man's first cry, the newborn infant's first poem. Roja's Gijeminis set off new fads in the way we dressed, in the way we smoked, in our handwriting. Mimicking me, in gentle fun, he helped me get rid of my melancholy tone. Neither his skeptical attitude nor his wild drinking sprees ever infected me, but I am still deeply moved when I remember his face that made everything light up, that made beauty fly out from every corner, as if he had set a hidden butterfly in motion. From Don Miguel de Unamuno he had learned how to make little paper birds. He would make one with a long neck and outspread wings, which he would then blow out into the air. He called that giving them their vital push. He discovered French poets, dark bottles buried away in wine cellars, 
and wrote love letters to France's jams heroines. His lovely poems went around all wrinkled in his pockets without ever, to this day, getting published. Being generous to a fault, he attracted so much attention that one day, in a cafe, a stranger came up to him and said, Sir, I have been listening to you talk and I have taken a great liking to you. May I ask you for something? What is it? Rojas Gimenez asked, looking put out. Let me leap over you, the stranger said. What? the poet asked. Are you so powerful that you can leap over me here, sitting at this table? No, sir, the stranger said meekly. I'll want to leap over you later, when you are resting in your coffin. It's my way of paying tribute to the interesting people I've met in my life, leaping over them, if they let me, after they're dead. I'm a lonely man and this is my only hobby. And taking out his notebook, he said, here's the list of people I've leaped over. Wild with joy, Rojas Gimenez accepted the strange proposition. Several years later, during the rainiest winter anyone in Chile can remember, Rojas Gimenez died. As usual, he had left his jacket in some bar in downtown Santiago. In the middle of the Antarctic winter, he had walked across the city, in his shirt sleeves, to his sister Rojita's house over in the Quinta Normal neighborhood. Two days later, bronchial pneumonia carried off from this world one of the most fascinating human beings I have ever known. The poet flew away with his little paper birds into the sky, in the rain. But friends present at his wake that night had an unusual visitor. A torrential rain was falling on the rooftops, with lightning and the wind together illuminating and shaking the huge plantain trees on Quinta Normal, when the door opened and a man all in black, drenched by the rain, walked in. No one knew who he was. Before the curious eyes of the friends keeping vigil, the stranger braced himself and leaped over the coffin. And he left immediately, as suddenly as he had arrived, without uttering a word, vanishing into the night and the rain. And so Alberto Rojas Gimenez's amazing life was sealed with a mysterious rite nobody has yet been able to puzzle out. I had just arrived in Spain when I received the news of his death. Seldom have I felt such intense grief. This was in Barcelona. I immediately began writing my elegy, Alberto Rojas Gimenez Wien Volando, Alberto Rojas Gimenez Comes Flying, which Revista de Occident later published. But I also had to say farewell to him with some kind of ceremony. He had died so far away, in Chile, when days of heavy rain were flooding the cemetery. I could not be near his mortal remains or be with him on his final voyage, so I had an idea for a ceremony. I went to my friend Isafas Cabez Sixen, the painter, and together we headed for the marvelous Basilica of Santa Marfa del March. We bought two huge candles, each almost as tall as a man, and with them we entered the shadows of that strange temple. Santa Marfa del Mar was the cathedral of seafarers. Fishermen and sailors built it stone by stone many centuries ago. Then it was embellished with thousands of votive offerings, miniature boats of all sizes and shapes, sailing through eternity, formed a tapestry over the walls and ceilings of the beautiful basilica. It occurred to me that this was the perfect setting for the late poet, this would have been his favorite spot if he had come to know it. My friend the painter and I lit the huge candles in the center of the basilica, near the clouds of the coffered ceiling, and sat in the empty church, each of us with a bottle of white wine, feeling that, despite our agnosticism, the silent ceremony brought us closer to our dead friend in some mysterious way. Burning in the highest part of the empty basilica, the candles were alive and radiant and might have been the two eyes of the mad poet, whose heart had been extinguished forever, looking at us from the shadows, among the votive offerings. Madmen in Winter Apropos of Rojas Gimenez, I'll say that madness, a certain kind of madness, often goes hand in hand with poetry. It would be very difficult for predominantly rational people to be poets, 
and perhaps it is just as difficult for poets to be rational. Yet reason gets the upper hand, and it is reason, the mainstay of justice, that must govern the world. Miguel de Unamuno, who loved Chile very much, once said, The thing I don't like is that motto. What is it all about, through reason or force? Through reason and always through reason. I'll talk about Alberto Valdivia, one of the mad poets I knew in the old days. Alberto Valdivia was one of the skinniest men in the world and so sallow complexioned that he seemed to be made entirely of bone, with a wild shock of grey hair and a pair of glasses covering his myopic eyes, which always had a faraway look. We called him Valdivia the Corpse. He went in and out of bars and eating places, cafes and concerts, without ever making a sound and with a mysterious little bundle of newspapers under his arm. Dear corpse, his friends used to say, embracing his incorporeal body, with the sensation that we were embracing a gust of air. He wrote some lovely lines packed with subtle feeling, with intense sweetness. Here are a few. Everything will go, the afternoon, the sun, life. Evil, which cannot be undone, will prevail. Only you will stay, inseparable sister of the twilight of my life. This poet whom we fondly knew as Valdivia the corpse was a true poet. We often said to him, stay and have dinner with us, corpse. Our nickname never upset him. Sometimes a smile played on his very thin lips. His phrases were few and far between, but they were always to the point. We made a right of taking him to the cemetery every year. On the eve of 1st November, we used to give a dinner for him as sumptuous as the miserable pockets of young students and writers would permit. Our corps occupied the seat of honor. At twelve on the dot, we cleared the table and headed for the cemetery in a light-hearted procession. Someone would make a speech honoring the late poet in the stillness of the night. Then each of us said goodbye solemnly and we marched off, leaving him all alone at the graveyard gate. The corpse had long accepted this traditional rite, and there was no cruelty in it, since he took an active role in the farce all the way to the end. Before leaving, we would hand him some pesos, so he could eat a sandwich in his grave. Two or three days later, no one was surprised to see the poet corpse quietly slip back into our small knot of friends and into the cafes. He could count on being left in peace until the following 1st November. In Buenos Aires I met a very eccentric Argentine writer whose name was, or is, Omar Vignole, I don't know if he is still living. He was a giant of a man and carried a heavy walking stick. Once, in a midtown restaurant where he had invited me to dinner, he turned to Ine at the table, motioning me to a seat, and said in a booming voice that could be heard throughout the room, which was filled with regular customers, sit down. Omar Vignale. I sat down a bit uneasily and promptly asked, Why do you call me Omar Vignale? You know that you are Omar Vignale and I am Pablo Neruda. Yes, he replied, but there are lots of people in this restaurant who only know me by name. And several of them want to thrash the daylights out of me, I'd rather have them do it to you. Vignole had been an agronomist in an Argentine province and had brought back a cow that became his inseparable friend. He used to walk all over Buenos Aires with his cow, leading her by a rope. Around that time, he published some books, all with intriguing titles. What the Cow Thinks, My Cow and L, etc. When the P.E.N. Club had its first World Congress in Buenos Aires, the writers, who were headed by Victoria Ocampo, trembled at the thought that Vignole would turn up with his cow. They explained this imminent threat to the authorities, and the police cordoned off the streets around the Plaza Hotel to prevent my eccentric friend from showing up with his ruminant at the luxurious place where the Congress was being held. It was all in vain. The festivities were in full swing and the writers were discussing the classical world of the Greeks and its relation to the modern meaning of history, 
when great Vignole burst in upon the conference hall with his inseparable cow, which, to top things off, started to moo as if she wanted to join the debate. He had brought her into the heart of the city in an enormous closed van that had somehow eluded the vigilance of the police. Something else I want to tell about the same Vignole is that he once challenged a wrestler. The pro called his bluff, and on the night of the match my friend showed up at a packed Luna Park right on time with his cow, hitched her to a corner of the ring, shed his super elegant robe, and faced the Calcutta Strangler. Well, neither the cow nor the wrestling poet's gorgeous apparel could help him here. The Calcutta Strangler pounced on Vignole and tied him into a helpless knot in double quick time. What's more, adding insult to injury, he placed one foot on the literary bull's throat, amid tremendous whistles and catcalls from an audience that demanded that the fight continue. A few months later Vignole brought out a new book, Conversations with the Cow. I'll never forget the unique dedication that appeared on the first page. If memory serves me, it read, I dedicate this philosophical work to the 40,000 sons of bitches who hissed and called for my blood in Luna Park on the night of 24th February. In Paris, before the last war, I met Alvaro Guevara, the painter who was known in Europe as Chili Guevara. One day he called me on the telephone, with an urgent tone in his voice. It's something very important, he said. I had come up from Spain, and our struggle then was against Hitler, the Nixon of that era. My house in Madrid had been bombed and I had seen men, women, and children wiped out by the bombings. The world war was in the offing. Other writers and I had started to fight fascism in our own way, with books urging people to open their eyes to this grave threat. My countryman had stayed out of the struggle. He was an uncommunicative man, a hard-working painter, and always kept busy. We were sitting on a keg of gunpowder. When the great powers blocked the delivery of arms for the defense of the Spanish Republic, and later, in Munich, when they threw the doors wide open for Hitler's army, the war had arrived. I complied with Chili Gavara's plea that I go see him. What he wanted to tell me was very important. What's it all about? I asked him. There's no time to lose, he answered. There's no reason for you to be anti-fascist. No one has to be anti-anything. We must get down to brass tacks, and I have found those brass tacks. I want to tell you about it right away so that you'll drop your anti-Nazi congresses and settle down to serious work. There's no time to lose. Well, tell me what it's all about. Alvaro, I really have very little time. Pablo, my idea is really expressed in a three-act play. I've brought it along to read to you. And he stared at me hard, his face, with its bushy eyebrows, like an ex-boxer's, as he pulled out a voluminous manuscript. Panicky, and stressing my lack of time as an excuse, I convinced him to give me a quick rundown of the ideas that he planned to use to save the human race. It's like Columbus said, easier to crack than it looks, he said. I'll explain. If you plant one potato, how many potatoes will it, well, maybe four or five, I answered, just to say something. Lots more, he answered. Sometimes as many as forty sometimes more than 100 potatoes. Imagine everybody planting one potato in the garden, on the balcony, anywhere. How many people are there in Chile? 8 million. 8 million planted potatoes. Pablo, multiply this by 4, by 100. That's the end of hunger, the end of war. How many people are there in China? 500 million, right? Each Chinese plants one potato. Forty potatoes come from each potato that's been planted. Five hundred million by forty potatoes. Humanity is saved. When the Nazis marched into Paris, they did not take into account that world-saving idea, Columbus' egg, or rather, 
Columbus Potato Alvaro Guevara was arrested at his home in Paris on a cold, foggy night. They dragged him off to a concentration camp and held him prisoner there, marked with a tattoo on his arm, until the end of the war. He came out of that hell a human skeleton, and he never recovered. He came to Chile for the last time, as if to bid his country goodbye, giving it a final kiss, a sleepwalker's kiss, and returned to France, where death completed its work. Great painter, dear friend, Chili Gavara, I want to tell you one thing. I know you are dead, that your non-aligned potato politics did not help you at all. I know that the Nazis killed you. And yet, last June I went into the National Gallery. I was only going to look at the Turners, but I hadn't reached the main room when I discovered an impressive painting, a painting as lovely to me as the Turners, a resplendently beautiful work. It was the portrait of a lady, a famous lady, her name, Edith Sitwell. And this painting was your work, the only work by a Latin American painter ever privileged to hang among the masterpieces of the Great London Museum. I don't care about the place or the honor and, at heart, I also care very little about that lovely canvas. What matters to me is that we did not get to know each other better, to understand each other more, and that we let our lives cross without understanding, all because of a potato. I have been too simple a man, this has been my honor and my shame. I went along with my friends' shenanigans and envied their brilliant plumage, their satanic poses, their little paper birds, and even their cows, which, in some unexplained way, may have something to do with literature. Anyway, I believe I was born not to pass judgment but to love. Even the divisionists who attack me, ganging up to gouge out my eyes, after having first nourished themselves on my poetry, deserve my silence if nothing else. I was never afraid I'd contaminate myself circulating among my enemies, because the only enemies I have are the enemies of the people. A Polinaire said, Mercy on us who explore the frontiers of the unreal. I quote from memory, thinking of the stories I have just told, stories about people who are no less dear to me because they were eccentric, and no less valorous because I did not know what to make of them. Big Business we poets have always believed we could come up with brilliant ideas that would make us rich, that we are geniuses at planning business deals, but geniuses no one understands. I recall that in 1924 one was prompted by one of those money-making brainstorms to sell my Chilean publisher the rights to my book Crepusculario, not for one edition, but for eternity. I thought this sale would make me rich, and sign the contract before a notary. The fellow paid me 500 pesos, a little under $5 in those days. Rojas Gimenez, Alvaro Hinojosa, Homero Az were waiting for me outside the notary public's door to celebrate this commercial success with a big banquet. And in fact, we ate in what was then the best restaurant, La Bahia, with exquisite wines, cigars, and liqueurs. But first we had our shoes shined until they glittered like mirrors. The restaurant, four shoeshine boys, and a publisher profited from this business deal. Prosperity stopped short of the poet. Alvaro Hinojosa claimed he had an eagle's eye for all kinds of business. We were impressed by those grandiose schemes of his that, put into practice, would make money rain down on our heads, for us down at the heels bohemians, his command of English, his virgin blend cigarettes, his years of study at a university in New York, spoke volumes for the pragmatism of his great business brain. One day he called me aside, very confidentially, to let me in on a fantastic plan aimed at making us rich quick. I could go in 50-50 with him simply by contributing a few pesos I would get somewhere. He would put up the rest. That day we felt like capitalists beyond God and the law, capable of anything. What kind of merchandise is it? I asked the unappreciated king of finance timidly. Alvaro closed his eyes, expelled a mouthful of smoke that broke up into small rings, 
and finally answered in a hushed voice, Pelts? I echoed in amazement. From seals. To be precise, from hair seals all the same color. I couldn't bring myself to ask for more details. I didn't know that seals or sea lions had hair of any color. When I had watched them on a rock, on southern beaches, I had seen a shiny skin that glistened in the sun, had never noticed the slightest hint of hair on their lazy bellies. I converted everything I owned into ready cash with lightning speed, without paying my rent, or my tailor's installment, or the shoemaker's bill, and I placed my share of the money in my business associate's hands. We went to look at the pelts. Alvaro had bought them from an aunt of his, a southerner who owned several uninhabited islands. On those desolate rookeries, the sea lions carried out their erotic ceremonies. And they were here now, before my eyes, as huge bundles of yellow pelts riddled by the carbines of the wicked aunt's hirelings. The packs of skins were stacked all the way up to the ceiling in the storehouse rented by Alvaro to impress prospective buyers. And what are we going to do with this enormous mass, this mountain of pelts? I asked sheepishly. Everybody needs this kind of pelt. You'll see. And we left the storehouse, Alvaro shooting off sparks of energy, I with lowered head, wordlessly. Alvaro made the rounds with a portfolio made of our genuine pelts from hair seals all the same color, a portfolio filled with blank forms to make it look businesslike. Our last money went for newspaper ads. Just let one interested and appreciative magnet read them, and that was it. We'd be rich. Alvaro, a very elegant dresser, wanted to have a half dozen suits made out of English cloth. Much more modest, I harbored among my unfulfilled dreams the dream of buying a good shaving brush, now that the one I had was well on its way to turning unacceptably bold. A buyer showed up at last. He worked in leather goods, a short, robust man with fearless eaves, sparing with words, and with an air of candor which, I thought, verged on rudeness. Alvaro received him with guarded indifference and set a suitable time three days later, for showing him a fabulous merchandise. During those three days Alvaro bought some superb English cigarettes and some, Romeo Y. Julieta, Havana cigars, which he stuck in his breast pocket, in plain sight, just before the client was expected to arrive. We had laid out the better-looking skins on the floor. The man showed up for our appointment right on time. He did not take off his hat and barely greeted us with a grunt. He glanced scornfully and quickly at the skins spread out on the floor. Then he ran his sharp, stern eyes over the cramped shells. He raised a pudgy hand, and a suspicious fingernail pointed out a bundle of skins, one of those highest and farthest away. Exactly where I had jammed the worst once into a corner. Alvaro made the most of this crucial moment to offer him one of his genuine havanins. The small-time merchant grabbed it, bit off the end, rammed the cigar into his mouth, and went on calmly pointing to the bundle he wanted to inspect. There was nothing to do but show it to him. My partner climbed up the ladder and came back down with the thick bundle, smiling like a man sentenced to death. Pausing now and then to draw more and more smoke from Alvaro's cigar, the buyer examined all the skins in the package, one by one. The man picked up a pelt, rubbed it together, bent it double, tossed it aside scornfully, and immediately went on to the next, which in turn was scratched, rubbed, sniffed, and dropped. When he was finally through with his inspection, he once more ran his vulture's eyes over the shelves brimming with appels from hair seals all the same color, and at last halted his gaze on the forehead of my partner, the business expert. Then, in a hard, dry voice, he uttered words that, for us at least, became immortal, my dear sirs, I'm not getting hitched to these skins. And he walked out forever, with his hat still on, smoking Alvaro's superb cigar, without saying goodbye, implacable slayer of our millionaire's dreams.
My first books he sought refuge in poetry with the intensity of someone timid. The new literary movements hovered over Santiago. I finished writing my first book at 513 Maruri Street. I used to write two, three, four, five poems each day. In the late afternoon, outside my balcony, there unfolded a spectacle I never missed for anything in the world. It was the sunset with its glorious sheaves of colors, scattered arrays of light, enormous orange and scarlet fans. The middle section of my book is called Maruri Twilights. No one ever asked me what Maruri is supposed to mean. Maybe a very small number of people know it's only a modest street frequented by the most extraordinary twilights. In 1923, my first book, Crepuscularium, appeared. I had setbacks and successes every day, trying to pay for the first printing. I sold the few pieces of furniture I owned. The watch my father had solemnly given me, on which he had had to little crossed flags enameled, soon went off to the pawnbroker's. My black poet's suit followed the watch. The printer was adamant, and in the end, when the edition was all ready and the covers had been pasted on, he said to me, with an evil look, No. You are not taking a single copy until you pay me for the entire thing. The critic alone generously contributed the last pesos, which were gobbled up by my printer, and off I went into the street carrying my books on my shoulder, with holes in my shoes, but beside myself with joy. My first book I have always maintained that the writer's task has nothing to do with mystery or magic, md that the poets, at least, must be a personal effort for the benefit of all. The closest thing to poetry is a loaf of bread or a ceramic dish or a piece of you'd lovingly carved, even if by clumsy hands. And yet I don't believe any craftsman except the poet, still shaken by the confusion of his dreams, ever experiences the ecstasy produced only once in his life, by the first object his hands have created. It's a moment that will never come back. There will be many editions, more elaborate, more beautiful. His words will be poured into the glasses of other languages like a wine, to sing and spread its aroma to other places on this earth. But that moment when the first book appears with its ink fresh and its paper still crisp, that enchanted and ecstatic moment, with the sound of wings beating or the first flower opening on the conquered height, that moment comes only once in the poet's lifetime. One of my poems seemed to break away from that immature book and go off on its own, Farewell, which many people, wherever I go, still know by heart. They would recite it to me in the most unlikely places or ask me to do it. I might find it annoying, but the minute I was introduced at a gathering, some girl would raise her voice with those obsessive lines, and sometimes ministers of state would receive me with a military salute while reciting the first stanza. Years later in Spain, Federico Garcia Lorca told me how the same thing kept happening to him with his poem, La Casada in Feel, The Faithless Wife. The greatest proof of friendship Federico could offer anyone was to repeat for him his enormously popular and lovely poem. We become allergic to the unshakable success of just one of our poems. This is a healthy and natural feeling. Such an imposition by readers tends to transfix the poet in a single moment of time, whereas creation is really a steady wheel spinning along with more and more facility and self-confidence, though perhaps with less freshness and spontaneity. I was now leaving Crepuscularium behind me. Deep anxiety stirred my poetry. Short trips to the South renewed my powers. In 1923, I had a strange experience. I had returned home to Temuco. It was past midnight. Before going to bed, I opened the windows in my room. The sky dazzled me. The entire sky was alive, swarming with a lively multitude of stars. The night looked freshly washed and the Antarctic stars were spreading out in formation over my head. I became star-drunk, celestially, cosmically drunk. 
I rushed to my table and wrote, with heart beating high, as if I were taking dictation, the first poem of a book that would have many titles and would end up as El Hondero Enthusiasta. It was smooth going, as if I were swimming in my very own waters. The following day, filled with happiness, I read my poem. Later, when I got to Santiago, the wizard Aliro Oyarjan listened with admiration to those lines of mine. Then he asked in his deep voice, Are you sure those lines haven't been influenced by Sabat Akasti? I'm pretty sure. I wrote them in a fit of inspiration. Then I decided to send my poem to Sabat Akasti himself, a great Uruguayan poet unjustly neglected today. In him I had seen realized my ambition to write poetry that would embrace not only man but nature, its hidden forces, an epic poetry that would deal with the great mystery of the universe and with man's potential as well. I started an exchange of letters with him. While I continued my work and mellowed it, I read with great care the letters Sabat Akasti addressed to me, an unknown young poet. I sent Sabat Akasti, in Montevideo, the poem I had written that night and I asked him if it showed any influence from his poetry. A kind letter from him promptly answered my question, I have seldom seen such a successful, such a magnificent poem, but I have to tell you, yes, there are echoes of Sabat Akasti in your lines. It was a flash of light in the darkness, of clarity, and I am still grateful for it. The letter spent a good many days in my pocket, wrinkling until it fell apart. Many things were at stake. I was particularly obsessed with the fruitless rush of feelings that night. I had fallen into that well of stars in vain, that storm of stars had struck my senses in vain. One had made an error. I must be wary of inspiration. Reason must guide me step by step down the narrow paths. I had to learn humility. I ripped up many manuscripts, I misplaced others. It would be ten years before these last poems would reappear and be published. Sabat Akasti's letter ended my recurrent ambition for an expansive poetry. I locked the door on a rhetoric that I could never go on with and deliberately toned down my style and my expression. Looking for more unpretentious qualities, for the harmony of my own world, I began to write another book. Vent Poemas was the result. Those Vent Poemas de Amor y Una Canción Desesperada make a painful book of pastoral poems filled with my most tormented adolescent passions, mingled with the devastating nature of the southern part of my country. It is a book I love because, in spite of its acute melancholy, the joyfulness of being alive is present in it. A river and its mouth helped me to write it, the Imperial River. Vent Poemas is my love affair with Santiago, with its student-crowded streets, the university, and the honeysuckle fragrance of requited love. The Santiago sections were written between Ecoran Street and Espafia Avenue and inside the old building of the Teachers Institute, but the landscape is always the waters and the trees of the south. The docks in the Cansi Six and Desesperada, Song of Despair, are the old docks of Carahue and Bajo Imperial, the broken planks and the beams like stumps battered by the wide river, the wingbeat of the girls was heard and can still be heard at that river's mouth. In the long, slender-bodied, abandoned lifeboat left over from some shipwreck, I read the whole of Jean Christophe, and I wrote the Cansi Six and Desesperada. The sky overhead was the most violent blue I have ever seen. I used to write inside the boat, hidden in the earth. I don't think I have ever again been so exalted or so profound as during those days. Overhead, the impenetrable blue sky. In my hands, Jean Christophe or the nascent lines of my poem. Beside me, everything that existed and continued always to exist in my poetry, the distant sound of the sea, the cries of the wild birds, and love burning, without consuming itself, like an immortal bush. I am always being asked who the woman in Vent Poemas is, a difficult question to answer. 
The two women who weave in and out of these melancholy and passionate poems correspond, let's say, to Marisol and Marisombra, Sea and Sun, Sea and Shadow. Marisol is love in the enchanted countryside, with stars in bold relief at night, and dark eyes like the wet sky of Temuco. She appears with all her joyfulness and her lively beauty on almost every page, surrounded by the waters of the port and by a half moon over the mountains. Marisombra is the student in the city. Grey Berret, very gentle eyes, the ever-present honeysuckle fragrance of my footloose and fancy-free student days, the physical peace of the passionate meetings in the city's hideaways. Meanwhile, life was changing in Chile. The Chilean people's movement was starting up, clamoring, looking for stronger support among students and writers. On the one hand, the great leader of the petite bourgeoisie, Arturo Alessandri Palma, a dynamic and demagogic man, became president of the republic, but not before he had rocked the country with his fiery and threatening speeches. In spite of his extraordinary personality, once in power he quickly turned into the classic ruler of our Americas, the dominant sector of the oligarchy, whom he had fought, opened its mouth and swallowed him and his revolutionary speeches. The country continued to be torn apart by bitter strife. At the same time, a working-class leader, Luis Emilio Ricabrin, was extraordinarily active organizing the proletariat, setting up union centers, establishing nine or ten workers' newspapers throughout the country. An avalanche of unemployment sent the country's institutions staggering. I contributed weekly articles to Claridad. We students supported the rights of the people and were beaten up by the police in the streets of Santiago. Thousands of jobless nitrate and copper workers flocked to the capital. The demonstrations and the subsequent repression left a tragic stain on the life of the country. From that time on, with interruptions now and then, politics became part of my poetry and my life. In my poems I could not shut the door to the street, just as I could not shut the door to love, life, joy, or sadness in my young poet's heart. The Word You can say anything you want, yes sir, but it's the words that sing, they soar and descend. I bow to them. I love them, I cling to them, I run them down, I bite into them, I melt them down. I love words so much the unexpected ones. The ones I wait for greedily or stalk until, suddenly, they drop. Vowels I love. They glitter like colored stones, they leap like silver fish, they are foam, thread, metal, dew. I run after certain words. They are so beautiful that I want to fit them all into my poem. I catch them in mid-flight, as they buzz past, I trap them, clean them, peel them, I set myself in front of the dish, they have a crystalline texture to me, vibrant, ivory, vegetable, oily, like fruit, like algae, like agates, like olives. And then I stir them, I shake them, I drink them, I gulp them down, I mash them, I garnish them, I let them go. I leave them in my poem like stalactites, like slivers of polished wood, like coals, pickings from a shipwreck, gifts from the waves. Everything exists in the word. An idea goes through a complete change because one word shifted its place, or because another settled down like a spoiled little thing inside a phrase that was not expecting her but obeys her. They have shadow, transparency, weight, feathers, hair, and everything they gathered from so much rolling down the river, from so much wandering from country to country, from being roots so long. They are very ancient and very new they live in the bear, hidden away, and in the budding flower. What a great language I have, it's a fine language we inherited from the fierce conquistadors. They strode over the giant cordilleras, over the rugged Americas, hunting for potatoes, sausages, beans, black tobacco, gold, corn, fried eggs, with a voracious appetite not found in the world since then they swallowed up everything, religions, pyramids, tribes, idolatries just like the ones they brought along in their huge sacks wherever they went, 
they raised the land. But words fell like pebbles out of the boots of the barbarians, out of their beards, their helmets, their horseshoes, luminous words that were left glittering here our language. We came up losers. We came up winners. They carried off the gold and left us the gold. Carried everything off and left us everything. They left us the words. Memoirs By Pablo Neruda The Roads of the World Roaming in Valparaiso Valparaiso is very close to Santiago. They are separated only by the shaggy mountains on whose peaks tall cacti, hostile but flowering, rise like obelisks. And yet something impossible to define keeps Valparaiso apart from Santiago. Santiago is a captive city behind walls of snow. Valparaiso, on the other hand, throws its doors wide to the infinite sea, to its street cries, to the eyes of children. At the wildest stage of our young manhood, we would suddenly, always at daybreak, always without having slept, always without a penny in our pockets, board a third-class coach. We were poets and painters, all of us about twenty years old, brimming over with a precious store of impulsive madness that was dying to be used, to expand, to burst out. The star of Valparaiso beckoned to us with its magnetic pulse beat. It wasn't until many years later that I felt the same inexplicable call again. It was during my years in Madrid. In a tavern, coming out of the theatre in the small hours, or simply walking the streets, I would suddenly hear the voice of Toledo calling me, the soundless voice of its ghosts and its silence. And at that late hour, with friends as crazy as those of my younger days, I took off for the ancient, ashen, twisted citadel. To sleep in our clothes on the sands of the Tagus, under stone bridges, I don't know why, but of all the trips to Valparaiso I can picture to myself, one remains fixed in my mind, permeated by an aroma of herbs uprooted from the intimacy of the fields. We were going to see a poet and a painter off, they would be travelling to France third class. We did not have enough money between all of us to pay for even the dingiest hotel, so we looked up Novoa, one of our favourite lunatics in wonderful Valparaiso. It wasn't easy to get to his house. Scrambling and slipping up and down endless hills, we followed Novoa's undaunted silhouette as he guided us along. He was an impressive man, with a bushy beard and a thick moustache. His dark coattails flapped like wings on the mysterious slopes of the ridge we were climbing, blindly, worn out. He never stopped talking. He was a mad saint, personally canonized by us poets. And he was, naturally, a naturalist, a vegetarian's vegetarian. He praised the secret ties, known only to him, between bodily health and the natural gifts of the earth. He preached to us as he walked along, he threw his thundering voice back at us, as if we were his disciples. His huge figure advanced like a street. Christopher native to these dark, forsaken suburbs. At last, we reached his house, which turned out to be a cabin with two rooms. Our street. Christopher's bed occupied one of them. The other was mostly taken up by an enormous wicker armchair, lavishly crisscrossed by superfluous rosettes and with quaint little drawers built into its arms. A Victorian masterpiece. The huge armchair was assigned to me for sleeping that night. My friends spread the evening papers over the floor and stretched out carefully on news items and editorial columns. Their breathing and their snores soon told me that they were all sound asleep. Sitting in that monumental piece of furniture, my weary bones found it difficult to coax sleep. I could hear a silence coming from the heights, the lonely peaks. Only the occasional barking of the dog stars in the darkness, only the faraway whistle of an arriving or departing ship made this night in Valparaiso real for me. Suddenly I felt a strange, irresistible force flooding through me. It was a mountain fragrance, a smell of the prairie, 
of vegetation that had grown up with me during my childhood and which I had forgotten in the noisy hubbub of city life. I started to feel drowsy, cradled in the lullaby of the mother soil. Where could this wild breath of the earth, this purest of aromas, be coming from? My fingers probed into the nooks and crannies of the huge wicker chair and discovered the innumerable little drawers, and in them I could feel dry, smooth plants, cores, rounded sheaves, spear-like, soft or metallic leaves. The entire health-giving arsenal of our vegetarian preacher, the complete record of a life spent by our exuberant wandering street. Christopher gathering wild plants with his huge hands. Once this enigma had been cleared up, I fell asleep peacefully, protected by the fragrance of those guardian herbs. For several weeks I lived across from Don Zolo Escobar's house on a narrow street in Valparaiso. Our balconies almost touched. My neighbor would come out on his balcony early in the morning to do exercises like a hermit, exposing the harp of his ribs. Invariably dressed in a poor man's overalls or a frayed overcoat, half sailor, half archangel, he had retired long ago from his sea voyages, from the customs house, from the ship's cruise. He brushed his Sunday suit every day with the meticulous thoroughness of a perfectionist. It was a distinguished-looking black flannel suit that, over the years, I never saw him wear, an outfit he kept among his treasures in a decrepit old wardrobe. But his most precious and heart-rending treasure was a Stradivarius which he watched over with devotion all his life, never playing it or allowing anyone else to. Don Zolo was thinking of selling it in New York, where he would be given a fortune for the famed instrument. Sometimes he brought it out of the dilapidated wardrobe and let us look at it, reverently. Someday Don Zolo would go north and return without a violin but loaded with flashy rings and with gold teeth filling the gaps the slow passing of the years had gradually left in his mouth. One morning he did not come out to his gymnasium balcony. We buried him in the cemetery up on the hill, in his black flannel suit, which covered his small hermit's bones for the first time. The strings of the Stradivarius could not weep over his departure. Nobody knew how to play it. Moreover, the violin was not in the wardrobe when it was opened. Perhaps it had flown out to sea or to New York to crown Don Zolo's dreams. Valparaiso is secretive, sinuous, winding. Poverty spills over its hills like a waterfall. Everyone knows how much the infinite number of people on the hills eat and how they dress and also how much they do not eat and how they do not dress. The wash hanging out to dry decks each house with flags and the swarm of bare feet constantly multiplying betrays unquenchable love. Near the sea, however, on flat ground, there are balconied houses with closed windows where hardly any footsteps ever enter. The explorer's mansion was one of those houses. I knocked repeatedly with the bronze knocker to make sure I would be heard. At last, soft footfalls approached and a quizzical face suspiciously opened the portal just a crack, wanting to keep me out. It was the old serving woman of the house, a shadow in a square shawl and an apron, whose footsteps were barely a whisper. The explorer, who was also quite old, and the servant lived all alone in the spacious house with its windows closed. I had come there to see what his collection of idols was like. Corridors and walls were filled with bright red creatures, masks with white and ash-colored stripes, statues representing the vanished anatomies of sea gods, wigs of dried-up pollination hair, hostile wooden shields covered with leopard skin, necklaces of fierce-looking teeth, the oars of skiffs that may have cut through the foam of favorable waters. Menacing knives made the walls shudder with silver blades that gleamed through the shadows. I noticed that the virile wooden gods had been emasculated. Their phalluses had been carefully covered with loincloths, obviously the same cloth used by the servant for her shawl and her apron. The old explorer moved among his trophies stealthily. In room after room, he supplied me with the explanations, 
half peremptory and half ironic, of someone who had lived a good deal and continued to live in the afterglow of his images. His white goatee resembled a salmon idol's. He showed me the muskets and huge pistols he had used to hunt the enemy and make antelopes and tigers bite the dust. He told his adventures without varying his hushed tone. It was as if the sunlight had come in through the closed windows to leave just one tiny ray, a tiny butterfly, alive, flitting among the idols. On my way out, I mentioned a trip I planned to the islands, my eagerness to leave very soon for the golden sands. Then, peering all around him, he put his frazzled moustache to my ear and shakily let slip, don't let her find out, she mustn't know about it, but I am getting ready for a trip, too. He stood that way for an instant, one finger on his lips, listening for the possible tread of a tiger in the jungle. And then the door closed on him, dark and abrupt, like night falling over Africa. I questioned the neighbors, are there any new eccentrics around? Is there anything worth coming back to Valparaf so far? They answered, there's almost nothing to speak of. But if you go down that street, you'll run into Don Bartolom. And how am I going to know him? There's no way you can make a mistake. He always travels in a grand coach. A few hours later I was buying some apples in a fruit store when a horse-drawn carriage halted at the door. A tall, ungainly character dressed in black got out of it. He, too, was going to buy apples. On his shoulder he carried an all-green parrot, which immediately flew over to me and perched on my head without even looking where it was going. Are you Don Bartolom? I asked the gentleman. That's right. My name is Bartolom. And pulling out a long sword he carried under his cape, he handed it to me while he filled his basket with the apples and grapes he was buying. It was an ancient sword, long and sharp, with a hilt worked by fancy silversmiths, a hilt like a blown rose. I didn't know him, and I never saw him again. But I accompanied him into the street with due respect, silently opened the carriage door for him and his basket of fruit to get in, and solemnly placed the bird and the sword in his hands. Small worlds of Valparaiso, unjustly neglected, left behind by time, like crates abandoned in the back of a warehouse, nobody knows when, never claimed, come from nobody knows where, crates that will never go anywhere. Perhaps in these secret realms, in these souls of Valparaiso, was stored forever the lost power of a wave, the storm, the salt, the sea that flickers and hums. The menacing sea locked inside each person, an uncommunicable sound, an isolated movement that turned into the flower and the foam of dreams. I was amazed that those eccentric lives I discovered were such an inseparable part of the heartbreaking life of the port. Above, on the hills, poverty flourishes in wild spurts of tar and joy. The derricks, the piers, the works of man cover the waste of the coast with a mask painted on by happiness that comes and goes. But others never made it to the hilltops, or down below, to the jobs. They put away their own infinite world, their fragment of the sea, each in his own box. And they watched over it with whatever they had, while oblivion closed in on them like a mist. Sometimes Valparaiso twitches like a wounded whale. It flounders in the air, is in agony, dies, and comes back to life. Every native of the city carries in him the memory of an earthquake. He is a petal of fear clinging all his life to the city's heart. Every native is a hero even before he is born. Because in the memory of the port itself there is defeat, the shudder of the earth as it quakes and the rumble that surfaces from deep down as if a city under the sea, under the land, were tolling the bells in its buried towers to tell man that it's all over. Sometimes when the walls and the roofs have come crashing down in dust and flames, down into the screams and the silence, when everything seems to have been silenced by death once and for all, there rises out of the sea, like the final apparition, the mountainous wave, the immense green arm that surges, 
tall and menacing, like a tower of vengeance, to sweep away whatever life remains within its reach. Sometimes it all begins with a wake stirring, and those who are sleeping wake up. Sleeping fitfully, the soul reaches down to profound roots, to their very depth under the earth. It has always wanted to know it, and knows it now. And then, during the great tremor, there is nowhere to run, because the gods have gone away, the winglorious churches have been ground up into heaps of rubble. This is not the terror felt by someone running from a furious bull, a threatening knife, or water that swallows everything. This is a cosmic terror, an instant danger, the universe caving in and crumbling away. And, meanwhile, the earth lets out a muffed sound of thunder, in a voice no one knew it had. The dust raised by the houses as they came crashing down settles little by little. And we are left alone with our dead, with all the dead, not knowing how we happen to be still alive. The stairs start out from the bottom and from the top, winding as they climb. They taper off like strands of hair, give you a slight respite, and then go straight up. They become dizzy. Plunge down. Drag out. Turn back. They never end. How many stairs? How many steps to the stairs? How many feet on the steps? How many centuries of footsteps, of going down and back up with a book, tomatoes, fish, bottles, bread? How many thousands of hours have worn away the steps, making them into little drains where the rain runs down, playing and crying? Stairways. No other city has spilled them, shed them like petals into its history, down its own face, fanned them into the air and put them together again, as Valparaiso has. No city has had on its face these furrows where lives come and go, as if they were always going up to heaven or down into the earth. Stairs that have given birth, in the middle of their climb, to a thistle with purple flowers. Stairs the sailor, back from Asia, went up only to find a new smile or a terrifying absence in his house. Stairs down which a staggering drunk dived like a black meteor. Stairs the sun climbs to go make love to the hills. If we walk up and down all of Valparaiso's stairs, we will have made a trip around the world. Valparaiso of my sorrows. What happened in the solitudes of the South Pacific? Wandering star or battle of glowworms whose phosphorescence survived the disaster? Night in Valparaiso. A speck on the planet lit up, ever so tiny in the empty universe. Fireflies flickered and a golden horseshoe started burning in the mountains. What happened then is that the immense deserted night set up its formation of colossal figures that seeded light far and wide. Aldebaran trembled, throbbing far above, Cassiopeia hung her dress on heaven's doors, while the noiseless chariot of the Southern Cross rolled over the night sperm of the Milky Way. Then the rearing, hairy Sagittarius dropped something, a diamond from his hidden hoofs, a flea from his hide, very far above. Valparaiso was born, bright with lights, and humming, edged with foam and meretricious. Night in its narrow streets filled up with black water nymphs. Doors lurked in the darkness, hands pulled you in, the bedsheets in the south led the sailor astray. Polenta, Tritonga, Carmela, Flor de Dios, Multicula, Berenus, Baby Sweet packed the bear taverns, they cared for those who had survived the shipwreck of delirium, relieved one another and were replaced, they danced listlessly, with the melancholy of my rain-haunted people. The sturdiest whaling vessels left port to subdue Leviathan. Other ships sailed for the Californias and their gold. The last of them crossed the seven seas later to pick up from the Chilean desert cargoes of the nitrate that lies like the limitless dust of a statue crushed under the driest stretches of land in the world. These were the great adventures. Valparaiso shimmered across the night of the world. In from the world and out into the world, ships surged, dressed up like fantastic pigeons, sweet-smelling vessels, starved frigates held up overlong by Cape Horn in many instances, 
Men who had just hit port threw themselves down on the grass fears and fantastic days when the oceans opened into each other only at the far off Patagonian Strait. Times when Valparaiso paid good money to the crews that spit on her and loved her. A grand piano arrived on some ship, on another, Flora Tristan, Gogwin's Peruvian grandmother, passed through, and on yet another, on the wager, the original Robinson Crusoe came in, in the flesh, recently picked up at the Juan Fernandez Islands. Other ships brought pineapples, coffee, black pepper from Sumatra, bananas from Guayaquil, jasmine tea from Assam, anise from Spain. The remote bay, the centaur's rusty horseshoe, filled with intermittent gusts of fragrance, in one street you were overwhelmed by a sweetness of cinnamon, in another, the smell of custard apples shot right through your being like a white arrow, the detritus of seaweed from all over the Chilean sea came out to challenge you. Valparaiso then would light up and tum a deep gold, it was gradually transformed into an orange tree by the sea, it had leaves, it had coolness and shade, it was resplendent with fruit. The hills of Valparaiso decided to dislodge their inhabitants, to let go of the houses on top, to let them dangle from cliffs that are red with clay, yellow with gold thimble flowers, and a fleeting green with wild vegetation. But houses and people clung to the heights, writhing, digging in, worrying, their hearts set on staying up there, hanging on, tooth and nail, to each cliff. The port is a tug of war between the sea and nature, untamed on the Cordilleras. But it was man who won the battle little by little. The hills and the sea's abundance gave the city a pattern, making it uniform, not like a barracks, but with the variety of spring, its clashing colors, its resonant bustle. The houses became colors, a blend of amaranth and yellow, crimson and cobalt, green and purple. And Valparaiso carried out its mission as a true port, a great sailing vessel that has run aground but is still alive, a fleet of ships with their flags to the wind. The wind of the Pacific Ocean deserved a city covered with flags. I have lived among these fragrant, wounded hills. They are abundant hills, where life touches one's heart with numberless shanties, with unfathomable snaking spirals and the twisting loops of a trumpet. Waiting for you at one of these turns are an orange-colored merry-go-round, a friar walking down, a barefoot girl with her face buried in a watermelon, an eddy of sailors and women, a store in a very rusty tin shack, a tiny circus with a tent just large enough for the animal tamer's moustaches, a ladder rising to the clouds, an elevator going up with a full load of onions, seven donkeys carrying water up, a fire truck on the way back from a fire a store window and in it a collection of bottles containing life or death. But these hills have profound names. Travelling through these names is a voyage that never ends because the voyage through Valparaiso ends neither on earth nor in the word. Merry Hill, Butterfly Hill, Polanco's Hill, Hospital, Little Table, Corner, Sea Lion, Hauling Tackle, Potters, Chaprose, Fern, Liter, Windmill, Almond Grove, Pequeens, Cherkanes, Acevedos, Straw, Prison, Vixens, Dona Elvira's, Street, Stephens, Astorga, Emerald, Almond Tree, Rodriguez, Artillery, Milkman's, Immaculate Conception, Cemetery, Thistle, Leafy Tree, English Hospital, Palm Tree, Queen Victoria's, Carvalho's, Street, John of God, Pocure Rose, Cove, Goat, Biscayne, Don Elias, Cape, Sugar Cane, Lookout, Paresia, Quince, Ox, Flower. I can't go to so many places. Valparaiso needs a new sea monster, an eight-legged one that will manage to cover all of it. I make the most of its immensity, its familiar immensity, but I can't take in all of its multicolored right flank, the green vegetation on its left, its cliffs or its abyss. I can only follow it through its bells, its undulations, and its names. Above all, through its names, because they are taproots and rootlets, they are air and oil, they are history and opera, red blood runs in their syllables. Chilean consul in a hole. A literary prize at school, 
some popularity my new books enjoyed and my notorious cape had given me a small aura of respectability beyond artistic circles but in the 20s cultural life in our countries depended exclusively on europe with a few rare and heroic exceptions a cosmopolitan elite was active in each of our republics and the writers who belonged to the ruling class lived in paris our great poet vincent hudobro not only wrote in french but even changed his name making it vincent instead of vincent in fact as soon as i had the first little bit of youthful fame people in the street started asking me well what are you doing here you must go to paris a friend spoke to the head of a department in the foreign ministry on my behalf and he saw me right away he knew my poems i also know your aspirations sit down in that comfortable armchair from here you have a good view of the square of the carnival in the square look at those cars all is vanity you are a fortunate young poet do you see that palace it belonged to my family once and here i am now in this cubby hole up to my neck in bureaucracy when the things of the spirit are all that matter do you like tchaikovsky giving me a parting handshake after an hour long conversation about the arts he told me not to worry about a thing he was the head of the consular service you may now consider yourself virtually appointed to a post abroad for 2 years i visited from time to time the office of the diplomatic department head who was more obsequious each time the moment he saw me appear he would glumly call one of his secretaries and arching his brows would say i'm not in for anyone i want to forget everyday prose the only spiritual thing about this ministry is this poet's visit i hope he never forsakes us i am sure he spoke with sincerity right after that he would talk without respite about thoroughbred dogs anyone who doesn't love dogs doesn't love children he would go on to the english novel then jump to anthropology and spiritism and end up with questions of heraldry and genealogy when i took leave of him he would repeat once more as if it were a terrifying little secret between the two of us that my post abroad was guaranteed although i didn't have enough money to eat i would leave in the evening breathing like a diplomat and when my friends asked me what i was up to i put on important airs and said i'm working on my trip to europe this lasted until i ran into my friend bianchi the bianchi family of chile is a noble clan painters and popular musicians jurists and writers Explorers and climbers of the Andes give all those with the Bianchi name an aura of restlessness and sharp intelligence. My friend, who had been an ambassador and knew the ins and outs of the ministries, asked me, "Hasn't your appointment come through yet?" "I'll get it any moment now. I've been assured of it by a high patron of the arts in the ministry." He grinned and said, "Let's go see the minister." He took me by the arm and we went up the marble steps. Orderlies and employees scurried out of our way. I was dumbstruck. I was about to see my first foreign minister. He was quite short and to disguise this, he swung himself up and sat on his desk. My friend mentioned how much I wanted to leave Chile. The minister pressed one of his many buzzers and to top off my confusion, my spiritual protector suddenly appeared what posts are available in the service the minister asked him the elegant functionary who could not bring up tchaikovsky now listed various countries scattered over the world but i managed to catch only one name which i had never heard or read before rangoon where do you want to go pablo the minister said to me to rangoon I answered without hesitating. Give him the appointment, the minister ordered my protector, who hustled out and came back in nothing flat with the official order. There was a globe in the minister's office. My friend Bianchi and I looked for the unknown city of Rangoon. 
The old map had a deep dent in a region of Asia and it was in this depression that we discovered it. Rangoon Here's Rangoon. But when I met my poet friends some hours later and they decided to celebrate my appointment, I had completely forgotten the city's name. Bubbling over with joy, I could only explain that I had been named consul to the fabulous Orient and that the place I was being sent to was in a little hole in the map. Montparnasse One day in June 1927 we set out for faraway regions. In Buenos Aires we turned in my first class for two third class fares and sailed on the Baden. This German ship supposedly had just one class, but that must have been fifth class. There were two sittings for meals, one to serve the Portuguese and Spanish immigrants as fast as possible, and another for the remaining sundry passengers, particularly the Germans, who were returning from the mines and factories of Latin America. Alvaro, my companion, immediately classified the female passengers. He was a very active lady killer. He divided women into two groups, those who prey on man and those who obey the whip. These distinctions did not always apply. He had a whole bag of tricks for winning the affection of the ladies. Whenever a pair of these interesting passengers appeared on deck, he would quickly grab one of my hands and pretend to read my palm, with mysterious looks and gestures. The second time around, the strollers would stop and beg him to read their future. He would take their hands at once, stroking them far too much, and the future he read always indicated a visit to our cabin. But the voyage soon took a different turn for me and I stopped seeing the passengers, who grumbled noisily about the eternal fare of Kartoffeln, I stopped seeing the world and the monotonous Atlantic to feast my eyes only on the enormous dark eyes of a Brazilian, an ever so Brazilian girl, who boarded the ship in Rio de Janeiro with her parents and two brothers. The carefree Lisbon of those years, with fishermen in the streets and without Salazar on the throne, filled me with wonder. The food at our small hotel was delicious. Huge trays of fruit crowned the table. Houses of various colors, old palaces with arched doorways, cathedrals like monstrous walls, which God would have abandoned centuries ago to go live elsewhere, gambling casinos in former palaces, the crowds on the avenues with their childlike curiosity, the Duchess of Braganza, out of her mind, walking solemnly down a cobbled street, trailed by a hundred awestruck street urchins, this was my entry into Europe. And then Madrid with its crowded cafes, Hail fellow Primo de Rivera teaching the first lesson in tyranny to a country that would later learn all the rest. The first poems of my residencia en la tierra, which the Spaniards were slow to understand and would only understand later, when the generation of Alberti, Lorca, Alexander, and Diego appeared. And for me Spain was also the interminable train and the sorious third-class coach in the world, taking us to Paris. We disappeared into Montpama's swarming crowds, among Argentinians, Brazilians, Chileans. Venezuelans, still buried away under G6 Mesrain, did not yet dream of coming. And, over there, the first Hindus in their fullant robes. And my neighbor at the next table, with her tiny snake called around her neck, drinking a cafe kiabieni with melancholy languor. Our South American colony drank cognac and danced the tango, waiting for the slightest chance to start a battle royal and take on half the world. Paris, France, Europe, for us small-town Bohemians from South America, consisted of a stretch of 200 meters and a couple of streetcomers, Montparnasse, La Rotonde, Les Dômes, La Coupole, and three or four other cafes. Boards with black singers and musicians were just beginning to become popular. The Argentinians were the most numerous of the South Americans, the first to pick a fight, and the richest. Hell could break loose at any time and an Argentine would be lifted up by four waiters and would pass, in the air, over the tables, to be summarily deposited right out in the street. Our cousins from Buenos Aires did not care at all for this rough handling that wrinkled their trousers and, worse still, must up their hair. 
In those days, pomade was an essential part of Argentine culture. Actually, in those first days in Paris, whose hours flitted past, I did not meet a single Frenchman, a single European, a single Asian, much less anyone from Africa or Oceania. Spanish-speaking Americans, from the Mexicans down to the Patagonians, went about in cliques, picking on one another, disparaging one another, but unable to live without one another. A Guatemalan proffers the company of a Perguin bum, with whom he can idle the time away exquisitely, to that of a pasture. Around this time, I met Caesar Vallejo, the great Cholo, a poet whose poetry had a rough surface, as rugged to the touch as a wild animal's skin, but it was magnificent poetry with extraordinary power. Incidentally, we had a little run and write after we met. It was in La Rotonde. We were introduced, and in his precise Peruvian accent, he greeted me with, You are the greatest of all our poets. Only Rubain Darfo can compare with you. Vallejo, I said, if you want us to be friends, don't ever say anything like that to me again. I don't know where we'd end up if we started treating each other like writers. My words appeared to unsettle him. My anti-literary education prompted me to be bad-mannered. On the other hand, he belonged to a race that was older than mine, with viceroyalty and curtsy behind it. When I saw that he was offended, I felt like an unwelcome boar. But this blew over like a small cloud. We became true friends from that moment on. Years later, when I spent more time in Paris, we saw each other daily. Then I got to know him really well. Vallejo was shorter than I, thinner, more heavy-boned. He was also more Indian than I, with very dark eyes and a very tall, domed forehead. He had a handsome Inca face, saddened by an air of unmistakable majesty. Wayne like all poets, he loved it when people talked to him this way about his Indian features. He would hold his head high to let me admire it and say, I've got something, haven't I? And then laugh at himself quietly. His self-regard was nothing like that sometimes expressed by Vicent Hudobro a poet who was Vallejo's opposite in so many ways. Hudobro would let a lock of hair hang over his forehead, insert his fingers in his vest, push out his chest, and ask, Have you noticed how much I look like Napoleon Bonaparte? Vallejo was moody but only on the outside, like a man who had been huddling in the shadows a long time. He had a solemn nature and his face resembled a rigid, quasi hieratic mask. But his inner self was something else again. I often saw him, especially when we managed to pry him away from his domineering wife, a tyrannical, proud Frenchwoman who was a concierge's daughter. Yes, I saw him jumping up and down happily, like a schoolboy. Later he would slip back into his moroseness and his submission. The Messinas we had been waiting for but who never showed up rose suddenly out of the Paris shadows. He was a Chilean writer, a friend of Rafael Alberti's, of the French, in fact almost everybody's friend. Also, and far more important, he was the son of Chile's biggest shipping magnate. And well known as a big spender. This messiah who had just fallen out of the sky wanted to fate me, so he took all of us to a white Russian boy called the Caucasian wine cellar. Its walls were decorated with Caucasian costumes and landscapes. We were soon surrounded by Russian or phony Russian girls dressed as peasants from the mountains. C6 Don, for that was a host's name, looked like the last of the Russian decadents. A frey-looking blonde, he ordered bottle after bottle of champagne and did mad leaps in the air, imitating Cossack dances he had never seen. Champagne, more champagne. And, all of a sudden, our pale millionaire host collapsed on the ground. He lay there under the table fast asleep, like the bloodless corpse of a Caucasian done in by a bear. A shiver ran through us. The man would not come to even with ice compresses or bottles of ammonia uncorked under his nose. 
Seeing our helplessness and confusion, all the dancing girls deserted us, except one. In our host's pockets we found an impressive checkbook that, in his corpse-like condition, he could not use. The head Cossack demanded immediate payment and closed the exit door to stop us from getting out. We escaped from his custody only by leaving my brand new diplomatic passport as security. We departed with our lifeless millionaire on our shoulders. It took a Herculean effort to carry him to a taxi, settle him in it, and then unload him at his deluxe hotel. We left him in the arms of two huge doormen in red livery, who carried him off like an admiral fallen on the bridge of his ship. The one girl from the boyt who had not deserted us in our misfortune was waiting for us in the cab. Alvaro and I invited her to Les Halles to enjoy the early morning onion soup. We bought her flowers in the market, thanked her with a kiss for being a good Samaritan, and noticed that she was rather attractive. She was neither pretty nor homely, but her turned-up nose, so typical of Paris girls, made up for that. Then we invited her to our seedy hotel. She had no objection to coming with us. She went with Alvaro to his room. I dropped into bed exhausted, but all at once I felt someone shaking me roughly. It was Alvaro. His harmless maniac's face seemed a little odd. Listen, he said. This woman is something special, fantastic, I can't explain to you. You've got to try her right away. A few minutes later the stranger got into my bed, sleepily but obligingly. Making love to her, I received proof of her mysterious gift. It was something I can't pin down with words, something that rushed up from deep within her, something that went back to the very origins of pleasure, to the first upsurge of a wave, to the erotic secrets of Venus. Alvaro was right. At breakfast the next morning, Alvaro warned me, on the side, in Spanish, if we don't leave this woman right away, our trip will be doomed. We will be sunk, not at sea but in the unfathomable sacrament of sex. We decided to shower her with little gifts, flowers, chocolate, and half the francs we had left. She confessed that she didn't work in the Caucasian nightclub. She had gone there the night before for the first and only time. Then we got into a taxi with her. The driver was passing through an unfamiliar neighborhood when we told him to stop. We said goodbye to her with big kisses and left her there, confused but smiling. We never saw her again. Voyage to the East Nor will I ever forget the train that took us to Marseilles, loaded, like a basket of exotic fruit, with a motley crowd of people, country girls, and sailors, with accordions and songs chorused by everyone in the coach. We were heading for the Mediterranean Sea, toward the doors of light this was 1927. I was fascinated by Marseilles, with its commercial romanticism and the Wyke's port winged with sails seething in their own ominous turbulence. But the Messageries Maritimes ship on which we sailed for Singapore was a piece of France at sea, with its petite bourgeoisie emigrating to occupy posts in the remote colonies. During the trip, when the crew noticed our typewriters and our writers' manuscripts and papers, they asked us to pound out their letters on our machines. We took down the most incredible letters, dictated by the crew for their girls in Marseilles, in Bordeaux, in the provinces. Deep down, they were more interested in their letters being typewritten than in the message. Still, the things they said in them sounded like poems by Tristan Corbier, artless, tender messages, all of them. The Mediterranean with its ports, its carpets, its traders, its markets, slowly opened before our prow. In the Red Sea I was impressed by the port of Djibouti. The calcined sand, tracked so often by Arthur Rimbaud's comings and goings, negresses like statues with their baskets of fruit, the miserable huts of the native population, and the ramshackle look of cafes lit by spectral overhead lights. They served iced tea with lemon there. The thing to do was to see what went on at night in Shanghai. 
Cities with a bad reputation draw you like deadly women. Shanghai opened its night mouth for us to country boys set adrift in the world, third class passengers with little money and a joyless curiosity. We went to the big night clubs one after the other. It was a weekday night and they were empty. It was depressing to look at those enormous dance floors, big enough for hundreds of elephants to dance on, and nobody dancing there. Women from the Tsar's Russia, thin as skeletons, came out of dark corners, yawning and asking us to invite them to drink champagne. So we did the rounds of six or seven dens of sin and lost souls, where all we were losing was our time. It was late to be getting back to the ship we had left a long way behind, beyond the crisscrossing, narrow streets of the waterfront. We each took a rickshaw. We weren't used to this kind of transportation provided by human horses. In 1927, those Chinese trotted for long distances, pulling the little cart without ever stopping to rest. Since it had started raining and the rain was coming down harder now, our rickshaw men thoughtfully halted their carriages and carefully covered the fronts of the rickshaws with rainproof cloth so that not one drop should spatter our foreign noses. They're such a refined and considerate people. Two thousand years of culture have not gone for nothing, Alvaro and I thought, in our mobile seats. And yet something began to make me feel uneasy. I couldn't see a thing, shut in under the hood considerately put up for our protection, but through the all skin I could hear my driver's voice sending out a kind of bus. The sound of his bare feet was soon joined by the rhythmic sounds of other bare feet trotting alongside on the wet pavement. The sounds finally became muffed, it was a sign that the pavement had ended. Apparently, we were now travelling over open ground, outside the city. All at once my rickshaw halted. The driver skillfully undid the cloth that protected me from the rain. There wasn't the shadow of a ship in those deserted outskirts. The other rickshaw was standing beside mine, and Alvaro climbed down from his seat, obviously alarmed. Money! Money! Seven or eight Chinese who circled us kept repeating steadily. My friend moved as if to reach for a weapon in his trousers pocket, and it was enough to earn each of us a rabbit punch. I fell back, but the Chinese caught my head in midair, keeping me from crashing down, and gently laid me out on the wet ground. With lightning speed, they went through my pockets, shirt, hat, shoes and socks, and my necktie, like slate of an artist's putting on an extravagant display of skill. Not one inch of clothing remained unaccounted for, not a penny of the little money we had. But one thing, with the traditional consideration of Shanghai thieves, they scrupulously respected our papers and our passports. Once we were alone, we walked toward the lights we could make out far off. Before long, we ran into hundreds of Chinese who were out at this hour and yet were honest. None of them knew French, or English, or Spanish, but all wanted to help us in our predicament, and somehow, we were guided to the yearned for paradise of our third class cabin. We got to Japan. The money we were expecting from Chile was supposed to be at the consulate. In the interim, we had to put up at a seaman's shelter in Yokohama. We slept on dreadful straw mattresses. A glass pane had been knocked out, it was snowing, and the cold went right through our bones. No one noticed us. One morning, at daybreak, an oil tanker split in two off the Japanese coast and the refuge was filled with stranded seamen. Among them was a Basque who could only speak Spanish and his own language. He told us his adventure, for four days and nights he had stayed afloat on a piece of the wreck, surrounded by waves of burning oil. The survivors were supplied with blankets and rations, and the Basque, a big-hearted fellow, became our benefactor. The Consul General of Chile, on the other hand, I think his name was De La Marina or De La Rivera, received us in a high-handed manner, letting us know our place as lowly castaways. He had no time to spare. He was dining with Countess Yufu San that evening. 
the imperial court had invited him to tea or else he was immersed in profound studies of the reigning dynasty the emperor is such a refined man and so on no he didn't have a telephone why have a telephone in yokohama they would only call him up in japanese as for news about our money the manager of the bank a close friend of his hadn't mentioned it he was very sorry but he must leave he was expected at a gala reception see you tomorrow the same story day after day we would leave the consulate shivering since the robbery had reduced our wardrobe and all we had were some bedraggled sweaters given to us castaways on the last day we found out that our funds had arrived in yokohama ahead of us the bank had sent the consul three notices and the pompous mannequin the high and mighty functionary had overlooked this minor point so far beneath his station whenever i read in the papers about consuls murdered by their crazed countrymen i think longingly of that distinguished bemedaled official that night we went to the best cafe in tokyo the koroku on the ginza there was excellent food in tokyo in those days besides our week of hunger gave the delicacies an added flavor in the pleasant company of lovely japanese girls we drank toasts to all the unfortunate travelers neglected by perverse consuls all over the world singapore we thought we were next door to rangoon what a bitter let down what had only been a few millimeters on the map had become a gaping abyss ahead of us we had several days on board a ship and what's more the one making the regular run had left for rangoon the previous day we had no money to pay the hotel or our fares more funds were waiting for us in rangoon ah but my colleague the chilean consul in singapore was there for a purpose sir mansilla hurried in his smile dwindled little by little until it disappeared completely giving way to a worried grimace i can't do a thing for you get in touch with the ministry i suggested that we consuls must stick together but it was no use the man had the face of a heartless jailer he grabbed his hat and was already making a dash for the door when a machiavellian thought struck me sefia mansilla i'll be forced to give some lectures on our country with paid attendance to put together enough money for our fares please get me a hall an interpreter and the necessary permit the man went white lectures on chili in singapore i won't allow it i am in charge and i am the only one who can give lectures on chili here calm down sefia mansilla i said the more people like us there are talking about a remote country the better i don't see why you are so upset in the end this crazy proposition that boiled down to patriotic blackmail led to a compromise shaking with anger he made us sign receipts and handed us the money when we counted it we remarked that the receipts were made out for a larger amount that's the interest he explained 10 days later i sent him a check from rangoon but without the interest of course from the deck as the ship drew into rangoon i saw looming ahead the gold funnel of the great pagoda shwe dago a multitude of strange costumes clashed their vibrant colors on the pier a broad dirty river's mouth emptied there into the gulf of martaban this river has the most beautiful name of all the rivers in the world iravadi beside its waters my new life was about to begin alvaro a hell of a guy alvaro his name is no alvaro de silva he lives in new york he has spent most of his life in the new york jungle i imagine him eating oranges at outlandish hours burning cigarette paper with a match asking a lot of people annoying questions he was always an undisciplined teacher had a brilliant intelligence an inquisitive intelligence that seemed to lead nowhere but to new york it was 1925 
between the violets that almost slipped from his hands as he rushed them to some passing stranger he wanted to go to bed with right away, without even finding out her name or where she came from, between this and his interminable lectures on Joyce, he revealed to me, and too many others, unsuspected opinions, viewpoints of the man of the world who lives in the city, in his lair, and goes out to investigate the latest in music, painting, books, the dance. Forever eating oranges, pairing apples, impossible in his eating habits, amazingly upon everything, in him we finally saw the urbane model of our dreams, what all of us provincials wanted to be, no labels pasted on suitcases, but carried within, an assortment of countries and concerts, cafes in the small hours, universities with snow-covered roofs. He reached a point where he made life impossible for me. Wherever I go, I settle into a vegetable dream, I set my mind on one spot and try to put down roots, so as to think, to go on existing. Alvaro was always jumping from one wild enthusiasm to another, fascinated by any film you could work in, immediately dressing up as Muslims to go to the studio. There are pictures around somewhere of me in a Bengalese costume, L went into a cigarette shop in Calcutta and did not speak, and they took me for a member of Tagore's family, when we used to go to the Dum Dum Studios to see if they would hire us. And then we'd have to leave the Y, M, C, A. On the sly because we hadn't paid our bill and the nurses who loved us. Alvaro got tangled up in fabulous business ventures. He wanted us to sell tea from Assam, cloth from Kashmir, clocks, ancient treasures. Everything fizzled out quickly he left samples from Kashmir, his little tea bags, on the tables, on the beds. He had already grabbed another suitcase and was somewhere else in Munich. In New York. I have seen many writers, steady, inexhaustible, and prolific, but B is the greatest. He almost never publishes anything. Don't understand in the morning, without getting out of bed, with glasses mounted on the little bump of his nose, he's already at it, banging away at the typewriter, consuming reams of every kind of paper, of all the paper he can get his hands on. And yet his mobility, his criticism, his oranges, his periodic communications, his lair in New York, his violets, his muddle that appears to be so clear, his lucidity that is so muddled up. He never turns out the work everyone's always expected of him. Maybe it's because he doesn't feel like it. Maybe it's because he can't do it. Because he's doing too many things at once. Or because he's not doing anything. But B knocks everything, he sees everything across continents with those impulsive blue eyes, with that fine sensibility, nevertheless letting the sands of time sift through his fingers. Memoirs By Pablo Neruda Luminous Solitude Forest Images Immersed in these memories, I suddenly have to wake up. It's the sound of the sea. I am writing in Isla Negra, on the coast, near Valparaiso. The powerful winds that whip the shore have just blown themselves out. The ocean, rather than my watching it from my window, it watches me with a thousand eyes of foam, still shows signs, in its surf, of the terrible persistence of the storm. Years that are so far away. Reconstructing them, it's as if the sound of the waves I hear now touched something inside me again and again, sometimes lulling me to sleep, then with the abrupt flash of a sword. I shall take up those images without attention to chronological order, just like these waves that come and go. 1929 Night I see the crowd pressing together. It's a Muslim holiday. They have made a long trough in the middle of the street and filled it with burning coals. I move closer. My face is flushed by the powerful heat of the coals heaped under a thin sheet of ashes on the scarlet ribbon of living fire. All at once, a fantastic personage appears. With his face smeared red and white, he comes on the shoulders of four men dressed in red. They set him down, 
he starts to walk drunkenly over the coals, shrieking as he walks, Allah! Allah! The huge crowd devours the scene, stunned. The magician has now walked unharmed over the long ribbon of coals. Then one man breaks away from the multitude, kicks his sandals off, and goes over the same span on naked feet. Volunteers keep coming forward interminably. Some pause midway along the trough to stomp on the fire, crying out, Allah! Allah! Howling, with hair-raising grimaces, rolling their eyes to heaven. Others pass over with children in their arms. No one is burned, or maybe they are, but I'm not sure. Beside the sacred river looms the temple of Kali, goddess of death. We enter, mingling with hundreds of pilgrims who have come from deep in Hindu country to win her grace. Terrified, in rags, they are shoved along by the Brahmins who demand money for something or other, every step of the way. The Brahmins lift one of the accessible goddess seven whales, and as they lift it, there is the blast of a gong loud enough to wake up the dead. The pilgrims fall to their knees, make their obeisance with joined hands, touch their foreheads to the ground, and move on to the next whale. The priests drive them into a courtyard, where they chop off the heads of goats with one blow from an ax and collect new tributes. The bleating of wounded animals is drowned out by the blasts of the gong. The filthy whitewashed walls are splashed right up to the roof with blood. The goddess is a statue with a swarthy face and white eyes. A scarlet tongue to meters long hangs from her mouth to the ground. Necklaces of skulls and emblems of death weigh down her ears and her neck. The pilgrims contribute their last coins before being swept out into the street. The poets who surrounded me to chant their songs and their poems were nothing like these abject pilgrims. Dressed in their trailing white garments, squatting on the grass, accompanying themselves with their tambourines, each let out a low-pitched, broken cry, and from his lips rose up a song he had composed in the same form and meter as the ancient, millennial songs. But the song's emphasis had changed. These were not sensual or joyful songs but songs of protest, songs against hunger, songs written in prison. Many of these young poets I met all over India, whose brooding eyes I'll never be able to drive out of my mind, had just come out of jail and would perhaps return to their cells tomorrow. For they sought to rise up against misery and against the gods as well. This is the time we have been destined to live in. And this is the golden age of world poetry. While the new songs are hunted down, a million men sleep by the roadside, on the outskirts of Bombay, night after night. They sleep. They are born and they die. There is no housing, no bread, no medicines. Civilized, proud England left her colonial empire like this. She parted from her former subjects without leaving them schools, or industries, or housing, or hospitals, only prisons and mountains of empty whiskey bottles. The memory of Rangothe Orangutan is another tender image that comes back in with the waves. In Maidan, Sumatra, I knocked at the gate of the rundown botanical gardens on more than one occasion. To my amazement, he came to open it for me each time. We used to go down a path hand in hand, to sit down at a table on which he banged with both hands and both feet. A waiter would then appear, and he would serve us a pitcher of beer, not too small, not too large, just right for the orangutan and the poet. In the Singapore Zoo we saw a lyrebird in a cage, glittering, enriched, with the resplendent beauty of a bird who has just flown out of Eden. And farther along, a black female panther, with the smell of the jungle still fresh on her, was pacing in her cage. She was a strange patch of starry night, a magnetic ribbon in constant motion, a lithe black volcano ready to destroy the world, a dynamo of pure, undulating power, and two yellow eyes, two unerring knives, probing with their fire, unable to understand her imprisonment or the human race. We came to the strange snake temple on the outskirts of the city of Penang, in what used to be called Indochina. 
This temple has been described over and over by travelers and journalists. So many wars, such repeated destruction, and so much time and rain have come down on the streets of Penang that I wonder if it is still there. Under the tiled roof, a low, blackish building, eaten away by the tropical rains, in a thick wilderness of huge plantain leaves. A dank smell. A scent of frangipani. When we first enter the temple, we see nothing in the dimness. A strong odor of incense and something moving over there. It's a snake stretching out lazily. Little by little we notice others. Then we see that there may be dozens. Later we realize that there are hundreds or thousands of snakes. There are tiny ones called around the candelabras, there are some that are dark, metallic, and slender, they all look drowsy and sated. Sure enough, fine porcelain bowls can be seen everywhere, some brimming with milk, others filled with eggs. The snakes don't notice us. We pass down the narrow labyrinths of the temple, brushing against them. They are over our heads, hanging from the golden architecture, they are sleeping on the stonework, or curled up on the altars. Over there is the dreaded Russell's viper, it's swallowing an egg, near a dozen lethal coral snakes, whose scarlet rings advertise their instant poison. I made out the Ferdilins, several enormous pythons, the Coluber de Rusi, and the Coluber Noya. Green, grey, blue, black serpents filled the hall. A dead silence everywhere. From time to time, a bonds dressed in saffron robes crosses the shadows. The brilliant color of his tunic makes him look like one more snake, stirring lazily in quest of an egg or a ball of milk. Were these snakes brought here? How did they adjust? Our questions are answered with a smile, we are told that they came on their own, and will go on their own when they feel like it. The doors, in fact, are open and there is no grating or glass or anything forcing them to stay in the temple. The bus was to leave Penang and cross the forest country and villages of Indochina to get to Sagon. No one understood my language, nor did I understand theirs. We made stops along the interminable road at out-of-the-way places in the jungle, and passengers got off, peasants in unusual clothes, slant-eyed and quietly dignified. By now, only three or four remained in the undaunted old rattle-trap that whined and threatened to come apart in the sweltering night. All of a sudden, I was seized with panic. Where was L? Where was I going? Why was I spending this endless night among these strangers? We were crossing from Laos into Cambodia. I took in the inscrutable faces of the last of my fellow travelers. Their eyes were wide open. They looked like robbers. No doubt about it, I was among the sort of bandits usually found in oriental stories. They exchanged knowing glances and watched me out of the comer of their eyes. Just then, the bus came to a dead stop right in the middle of the jungle. I picked the spot where I would die. I wouldn't let them carry me off to be sacrificed under those unfamiliar trees whose dark shadows cut off the sky. I would die here, on this bench in the rickety bus, trapped among baskets full of vegetables and chickens in crates, the only friendly things around at that terrible moment. I looked about me, ready to face the fury of my killers, and I noticed that they, too, had vanished. I waited a long while, alone, with my spirit completely crushed by the intense darkness of the alien night. I was going to die and no one would hear about it. So far from my small, beloved country. So far away from my books and from all those I loved. Suddenly a light appeared, and then another. The road came alive with lights. There was the sound of a drum, an outburst of shrill notes of Cambodian music. Flutes, tambourines, and torches filled the road with music and patches of light. A man got on and told me in English, the bus has broken down. Since there will be a long wait, perhaps till daybreak, 
and there is no place to sleep here the passengers went out to look for a troupe of musicians and dancers to entertain you for us under those trees that were no longer intimidating i watched the lovely ritual dances of a noble and ancient culture and listened till sun up to its delightful music flooding the road the poet cannot be afraid of the people life seemed to be handing me a warning and teaching me a lesson i would never forget the lesson of hidden honor of fraternity we know nothing about of beauty that blossoms in the dark a congress in india this is a glorious day we are present at the congress of the indian national congress party a nation in the thick of its fight for liberation thousands of delegates pack the galleries i meet gandhi and pandit motilal nehru another patriarch of the movement and his son the elegant young jawaharlal recently back from england nehru is all for independence while gandhi favors simple autonomy as a necessary first step gandhi the sharp profile of a very cunning fox a practical man a politician along the lines of our early creel leaders a mastermind at committees a shrewd tactician indefatigable as the multitude passes by in an endless stream touching the hem of his white tunic worshipfully and crying gandhi ji gandhi ji he gives them a perfunctory salute and smiles without taking off his glasses he receives messages and reads them he answers telegrams all this without effort he is a saint who never wears himself out nehru the intelligent promulgator of their revolution one of the great figures at the congress was subhas chandra bose impetuous demagogue violent anti-imperialist fascinating political figure of his country in the war of 914 during the japanese invasion he sided with the invaders against the british empire many years later here in india one of his friends tells me how the fortress of singapore fell our weapons were trained on the japanese besiegers suddenly we began asking ourselves why We had our soldiers do an about face and we pointed our guns at the English troops. It was quite simple. The Japanese invaders were just passing through. The English seemed to be here for all eternity. Subhas Bose was arrested, tried, found guilty of high treason and sentenced to death by the British courts in India. The protests triggered off by the independence movement multiplied. At last After many legal battles his lawyer Nehru himself won amnesty for him he became a popular hero from that moment on the recycling gods statues of buddha everywhere of lord buddha the sevia a bright warm eaten statues with a golden patina like an animal's sheen deteriorating as if the air were wearing them away in their cheeks in the folds of their tunics at elbows and navel and mouth and smile tiny blemishes fungi pock marks traces of jungle excrement or the recumbent the immense recumbent statues 40 meters of stone of sand granite pale stretched out among the rustling fronds emerging suddenly from some corner of the jungle from its surrounding site asleep or not asleep they have been there a hundred years a thousand 1000 times a thousand years yet there is something soft about them and they are known for an otherworldly air of indecision longing to stay or go away and that very soft stone smile that imponderable majesty which is nevertheless made of bard everlasting stone at whom at how many on the blood stained planet are they smiling fleeing peasant women past the men from the fire the wizard warriors the false high priests the tourists who devour everything and the statue remained in place the immense stone with knees with folds in its stone tunic with a look lost in the distance and yet really here thoroughly inhuman and also in some way human in some form or contradiction a statue god and not god stone and not stone under the screeching of black birds surrounded by the wing beats of red birds of the birds of the forest We are reminded of the terrible Spanish Christ's EU inherited wounds and all pustules and all 
scars and all, with that odor given off by churches, of wax candles, of mustiness, of a closed room. Those Christs had second thoughts about being men or gods. To make them human beings, to bring them closer to those who suffer, midwives and beheaded men, cripples and avaricious men, the inner circles of churches and those outside the churches, to make them human, the sculptors gave them the most gruesome wounds, and all this ended up as the religion of suffering, as sin and you'll suffer, don't sin and you'll suffer, live and you'll suffer, lawing you no possible way out. Not here, here the stone found peace. The sculptors rebelled against the canons of pain, and these colossal Buddha, with the feet of giant gods, have a smile on their stone faces that is beatifically human, without all that pain. And they give off an odor, not of a dead room, not of sacristies and cobwebs, but an odor of vegetable space, of sudden gusts of wine swooping down in wild swirls of feathers, leaves, pollen from the infinite forest. Helpless Human Family In several essays on my poetry, I have read that my stay in the Far East influenced it in some ways, especially Residencia en la Tierra. As it happens, the poems of Residencia en la Tierra are the only ones I wrote at that time, but without going so far as to defend my statement categorically, I say that this business of influence is mistaken. All the esoteric philosophy of the Oriental countries, when confronted with real life, turned out to be a byproduct of the anxiety, neurosis, confusion, and opportunism of the West, that is, of the crisis in the guiding principles of capitalism. In the India of those years there was little room for deep contemplation of one's navel. An existence that made brutal physical demands, a colonial position based on the most cold-blooded degradation, thousands dying every day of cholera, smallpox, fever, and hunger a feudal society thrown into chaos by India's immense population and industrial poverty, stamped such great ferocity on life that all semblance of mysticism disappeared. The theosophic centers were generally run by adventurers from the West, including North and South Americans. Of course, there were people among them who acted in good faith, but the majority exploited a cheap market where exotic amulets and fetishes wrapped in metaphysical sales stock were sold wholesale. These people were always spouting dharma and yoga. They reveled in religious acrobatics, all empty show and high-sounding words. For these reasons, the Orient struck me as a large hapless human family, leaving no room in my conscience for its rights and gods. I don't believe, then, that my poetry during this period reflected anything but the loneliness of an outsider transplanted to a violent, alien world. I recall one of those tourists of the occult, a vegetarian and a lecturer. He was a little middle-aged character named Powers, with a shiny bald dome and very light blue eyes, whose cynical look pierced right through you. He came from North America, from California, was a Buddhist, and he always closed his lectures with the following dietetic prescription, as Rockefeller used to say, eat an orange every day. Powers's cheerful openness appealed to me. He spoke Spanish. After his lectures we used to go off together and feast on huge bellyfuls of roast lamb with onions. He was a Buddhist theologian, whether or not he was the real thing, I don't know but his voracious appetite was more authentic than the contents of his lectures he soon fell in love, first with a half-caste who was crazy about his tuxedo and his theories, she was an anemic young lady with long-suffering eyes who believed he was a god, a living Buddha. That's how religions are born. After several months with this woman, he came to see me one day about attending a new marriage of his. On his motorcycle, Provided by the commercial concern for which he was a refrigerator salesman, we quickly left groves, monasteries, and rice paddies behind us, finally coming to a small village with Chinese houses and Chinese inhabitants. Powers was received with fireworks and music, while the young bride, looking like an idol in her white makeup, remained seated on a chair that was higher than any of the others. 
Music was played while we sipped refreshments of all colors. Not once did Powers and his new wife say a word to each other. We returned to the city. Powers explained that only the bride took part in this wedding ritual. The ceremonies would go on without his having to be there. Later he would go back to live with her. You realize you're a polygamist, don't you? My other wife knows about it and will be very happy, he said. This statement had as much truth in it as his story about an orange a day. When we got to his house, his first wife's home, we found her, the long-suffering half-caste, almost dead, with her cup of poison and a farewell note on the night table. Her dark body lay completely naked and motionless under the mosquito net. Her agony lasted several hours. Although I was now beginning to find him repulsive, I stood by powers because his suffering was obviously sincere. The cynic in him had gone to pieces. I went to the funeral with him. We placed the cheap coffin on a pile of firewood on the bank of a river. Powers lit some kindling with a match, muttering ritual phrases in Sanskrit. A few musicians dressed in orange-colored tunics chanted or blew on some very sad-sounding instruments. The pyre kept burning a little, then going out, and the fire had to be revived with matches. The river flowed on between its banks indifferently. The eternal blue sky of the Orient also displayed absolute unconcern, infinite disregard for the pitiful and lonely funeral of a poor forsaken creature. My official duties demanded my attention only once every three months when a ship arrived from Calcutta bound for Chile with hard paraffin and large cases of tea. I had to stamp and sign documents with feverish speed. Then three months of doing nothing followed, of solitary contemplation in markets and temples. This was the most painful period for my poetry. The street became my religion. The Burma Street, the Chinese quarter with its open-air theatres and its paper dragons and its brilliant lanterns. The Hindu Street, the humblest of them, with its temples operated as a business by one caste and the poor people prostrate in the mud outside. Markets where the bitter leaves rose in green pyramids like mountains of malachite. The stalls and pens where they sold wild animals and birds. The winding streets where supple Burmese women walked with long cheroots in their mouths. All this engrossed me and drew me gradually under the spell of real life. The caste system had the Indian people arranged like an amphitheatre of parallelopiped galleries superimposed one above the other, with the gods sitting at the top. The English, in turn, maintained their own caste system, starting with the small shop clerks, going on to professionals and intellectuals, then to exporters, and culminating on the system's garden roof, where the aristocrats of the civil service and the bankers of the empire lounged in comfort. These two worlds never touched. The natives were not allowed in the places reserved for the English, and the English lived away from the throbbing pulse of the country. This situation created problems for me. My British friends saw me in a thurry, a little horse-drawn cab used mainly for ephemeral trysts in transit, and offered me the kindly advice that a consul should never use these vehicles for any purpose. They also suggested that I should not frequent a lively Persian restaurant, where I drank the best tea in the world in little translucent cups. These were final warnings. After that, they stopped greeting me. This boycott couldn't have pleased me more. Those intolerant Europeans were not really interesting, and after all, I had not come to the Orient to spend my life with transient colonizers but with the ancient spirit of that world, with that large hapless human family. I went so deep into the soul and the life of the people that I lost my heart to a native girl. In the street she dressed like an Englishwoman and used the name Josie Bliss, but in the privacy of her home, which I soon shared, she shed those clothes and that name to wear her dazzling sarong and her secret Burmese name. Windows Tango I had a troubled home life. 
Sweet Josie Bliss gradually became so brooding and possessive that her jealous tantrums turned into an illness. Except for this, perhaps I would have stayed at her side forever. I loved her naked feet, the white flowers brightening her dark hair. But her temper drove her to savage paroxysms. The letters I received from abroad made her jealous and furious. She hid my telegrams, opening them. She glowered at the air I breathed. Sometimes a light would wake me up, a ghost moving on the other side of the mosquito net. It was she, dressed in white, brandishing her long, sharpened native knife. It was she, walking around and around my bed for hours at a time, without quite making up her mind to kill me. When you die, she used to say to me, my fears will end. The next day she would carry out mysterious rituals to make me remain faithful. She would have ended up by killing me. Fortunately, I received official notice of my transfer to Ceylon. I made secret preparations for my departure and one day, abandoning my clothes and my books, I left the house as usual and boarded the ship that was to carry me far away. I was leaving Josie Bliss, a kind of Burmese panther, with the deepest sorrow. The ship had barely started pitching and rolling in the Gulf of Bengal, when one started to write Tango del Vayudo, Widower's Tango, a tragic poem dedicated to the woman I lost and who lost me, because a volcano of anger boiled constantly in her blood. The night looked so vast, the earth so lonely. Opium Entire streets were set aside for opium. The smokers stretched out on low benches. They were in the true holy places of India. These contained no signs of luxury, no upholstery, no silk cushions. Nothing but unpainted planks, bamboo pipes, and pillows of Chinese porcelain. An air of decorum and austerity prevailed which was not to be found in the temples. The dreamers never stirred or made any sound, I smoked one pipe. There was nothing to it. Just a hatch of smoke, warm and milky, I smoked four pipes and was sick for five days, with a nausea that rose from my spinal cord, that descended froze my brain and hatred for the sunlight, for life itself. Opium's Revenge there bad to be more to it than this. So much had been said, so much had been written, there had been so much poking into briefcases and bags, in attempts to intercept the poison in customs, the famed, sacred poison. I would have to overcome my queasiness. Become familiar with opium, experience it, before I could pass judgment. I smoked many pipefuls, until I knew. There are no dreams, no images, there is no paroxysm. There is a melodious draining of strength, as if an infinitely soft note lingered in the air. A blacking out, a hollow feeling inside oneself. The slightest movement, an elbow, the neck, any far-off sound of a carriage, a horn, or a street cry, became part of the oneness, a delicious, sleepy sensation. I understood why hired hands from plantations, day laborers, rickshaw men who pull and pull the rickshaw all day long, would lay there dazed, motionless. Opium was not, as painted to me, the paradise of the exotic, but an escape for the exploited. All those in the opium dens were poor devils there was no embroidered cushion, not the slightest hint of luxury. Not a flicker of light in the place, not even in the half-closed eyes of the smokers. Were they resting? Were they sleeping? I was never able to find out. No one spoke. No one ever spoke, no furnishings, no rugs, nothing. On the worn benches, smoothed by so much contact, a few small wooden bolsters could be seen. Nothing else, except silence and the aroma of opium, Strangely repellent yet powerful no doubt, here was a path to destruction. The opium of the magnates, of the colonizers, was reserved for the colonized at the entrance, the smokers found their authorized ration, their number and their permit ready for them. Inside, a vast, smoky silence reigned, an immobility that eased away unhappiness and sweetened fatigue a hazy silence, 
the dregs of many broken dreams, found a placid retreat bare. The drummers with their half-closed eyes were living and are submerged in the sea, an entire night on a hilltop, delighting in a subtle and delicious repose. After that, I did not go back to the smoking dens. Already knew. I bad experienced. I had touched the untouchable. Hidden far back behind the smoke. Ceylon. In 1929, Ceylon, the most beautiful of the world's large islands, had the same colonial structure as Burma and India. The English had entrenched themselves in their neighborhoods and their clubs, hemmed in by a vast multitude of musicians, potters, weavers, plantation slaves, monks in yellow, and immense gods carved into the stone mountains. Caught between the Englishmen dressed every evening in dinner jackets and the Hindus I couldn't hope to reach in their fabulous immensity, I had only solitude open to me, and so that time was the loneliest in my life. Yet I also recall it as the most luminous, as if a lightning flash of extraordinary brightness had stopped at my window to throw light on my destiny inside and out. I went to live in a small bungalow recently built in the suburb of Velawat, near the sea. It was a sparsely populated area, with the surf breaking on the reefs nearby. The music of the sea swelled into the evening. In the morning, the miracle of this newly washed nature was overwhelming. I joined the fishermen very early. Equipped with long floats, the boats looked like sea spiders. The men pulled out fish of vivid colors, fish like birds from the teeming forest, some with the deep blue phosphorescence of intense living velvet, others shaped like prickly balloons that shriveled up into sorry little sacks of thorns. With horror, I watched the massacre of those jewels of the sea. The fish were sold in segments to the poor. The machetes hacked to pieces the godsend sustenance from the deep, turning it into blood-wrenched merchandise. Strolling up the shore, I would come to the elephant's bathing hole. With my dog alongside, I couldn't get lost. Out of the smooth water surged a perfectly still, grey mushroom, Soon it turned into a serpent, then into an enormous head, and finally into a mountain with tusks. No other country in the world had, or has even now, so many elephants doing work on its roads. They were an amazing sight, far from any circus or the bars of any zoo, trudging up and down with their loads of timber, like hard-working giant journeymen. My dog and my mongoose were my sole companions. Fresh from the jungle, the latter grew up at my side, slept in my bed, and ate at my table. No one can imagine the affectionate nature of a mongoose. My little pet was familiar with every minute of my day-to-day -day life, she tramped all over my papers, and raced after me all day long. She curled up between my shoulder and my head at seaster time and slept there the fitful, electric sleep of wild animals. My tame mongoose became famous in the neighborhood. The constant battles mongooses wage so courageously against the deadly cobras have earned them a kind of mythological prestige. I believe in this, having often seen them fight these snakes, whom they defeat through sheer agility and because of their thick salt and pepper coat of hair, which deceives and confuses the reptiles. The country people believe that, after battling its poisonous enemy, the mongoose goes in search of antidotal herbs. Anyway, the fame of my mongoose, who accompanied me every day on my long walks by the seashore, brought all the neighborhood kids to my house one afternoon in an impressive procession. An enormous snake had appeared in the streets, and they had come to ask for Kiria, my celebrated mongoose, whose show victory they were ready to cheer on. Followed by my admirers, entire bands of Tamils and Singhalese youngsters wearing nothing but loincloths, I led the fight-bound parade, with my mongoose in my arms. The Ophidian was the dreaded black polunga, or Russell's viper, which has a deadly bite. It was sunning itself in the weeds on top of a white water main, silhouetted like a whip on snow. My followers dropped behind silently. 
I followed the pipe and released my mongoose about two meters from the viper. Kiria sniffed danger and crawled slowly toward the serpent. My small friends and I held our breaths. The great battle was about to begin. The snake coiled, raised its head, opened its gullet, and fixed its hypnotic eyes on the small animal. The mongoose kept edging forward. Only a few centimeters from the monster's mouth, however, she realized exactly what was about to happen. Then, with a great leap, she streaked wildly in the opposite direction, leaving serpent and spectators behind, and did not stop running until she reached my bedroom. That's how I lost caste, more than 30 years ago, in the suburb of Velawat. The other day, my sister brought me a notebook containing my earliest poems, written in 1918 and 1919. Reading them over, I had to smile at their childish and adolescent melancholy, that literary sense of solitude given off by all my youthful work. The young writer cannot write without that shudder of loneliness, even when it is only imaginary, any more than the mature writer will be able to produce anything without a flavor of human companionship, of society. I learned what true loneliness was in those days and years in Velawat. During all that time I slept on a field cot like a soldier, an explorer. All I had for company were a table and two chairs, my work, my dog, my mongoose, and the boy who did the housework and returned to his village at night. This man was not, properly speaking, a companion, his status as an oriental servant forced him to be quieter than a shadow. His name was, or still is, Brumpy. There was no need to give him any orders, since he always had everything ready, my meal on the table, my freshly ironed clothes, the bottle of whiskey on the veranda. He seemed to have forgotten how to speak. The only thing he knew how to do was smile, with huge equine teeth. Solitude, in this case, was not a formula for building up a writing mood but something as hard as a prison wall, you could smash your head against the wall and nobody came, no matter how you screamed or wept. Across the blue air, across the yellow sand, past the primordial forest, past the vipers and the elephants, I realized, there were hundreds, thousands of human beings who worked and sang by the waterside, who lit fires and mold pitchers, and passionate women also, sleeping naked on thin mats, under the light of the immense stars. But how was I to get close to that throbbing world without being looked upon as an enemy? Step by step, I became familiar with the island. One night I crossed all the dark neighborhoods of Colombo to attend a gala dinner. From a darkened house came the voice of a boy or a woman singing. I had the rickshaw stop. At the humble door, I was overwhelmed by a strong scent, Ceylon's unmistakable odor, a mixture of jasmine, sweat, coconut oil, frangipani, and magnolia. Dark faces, which blended in with the color and the odor of the night, invited me in. I sat down quietly on a mat, while the mysterious human voice that had made me stop sang on in the dark, the voice of a boy or a woman, tremulous and sobbing, rose to an unbelievable pitch, was suddenly cut off, and sunk so low it became as dark as the shadows, clinging to the fragrance of the frangipani, looping itself in arabesques and suddenly dropping with all its crystalline weight, as if its highest jet had touched the sky, only to spill back quickly in among the jasmines. I stayed there a long while, caught in the magic spell of the drums and fascinated by the voice, and then I went on my way, drunk with the enigma of an emotion I can't describe, of a rhythm whose mystery issued from the whole earth. An earth filled with music and wrapped in fragrance and shadows. The English were already seated at the table, dressed in black and white. Forgive me. I stopped along the way to listen to some music, I told them. They, who had lived in Ceylon for 25 years, reacted with elegant disbelief. Music? The natives had musicians? No one had known about it. This was news to them. 
This terrible gap between the British masters and the vast world of the Asians was never closed. And it ensured an inhuman isolation, a total ignorance of the values and the life of the Asians. There were exceptions within this narrow colonialism, I found out later. Suddenly an Englishman from the service club would go off the deep end about some Indian beauty. He was immediately fired and cut off like a leper by his countrymen. Something else happened at about this time, the colonists ordered the burning of a Singhalese peasant's hut to rout him out in order to expropriate his land. The Englishman ordered to burn the hut to the ground was a modest official named Leonard Wolf. He refused and was dismissed from his post. Shipped back to England, he wrote one of the best books ever published about the Orient, A Village in the Jungle. A masterpiece true both to life and to literature, it was virtually eclipsed by the fame of his wife, none other than Virginia Woolf, the great subjective novelist of world renown. Little by little the impenetrable crust began to crack open and I struck up a few good friendships. At the same time, I discovered the younger generation, steeped in colonialist culture, who talked only about books just out in England. I found out that the pianist, photographer, critic, and cinematographer Lionel Went was the central figure of a cultural life torn between the death rattles of the Empire and a human appraisal of the untapped values of Ceylon. Lionel Went, who owned an extensive library and received all the latest books from England, got into the extravagant and generous habit of every week sending to my house, which was a good distance from the city, a cyclist loaded down with a sack of books. Thus, for some time, I read kilometers of English novels, among them the first edition of Lady Chatterley's Lover, published privately in Florence. Lawrence's works impressed me because of their poetic quality and a certain vital magnetism focused on the hidden relationships between human beings. However, it soon became clear to me that, for all his genius, he was frustrated by his passion for instructing the reader, like so many other great English writers. D. H. Lawrence sets up a course in sexual education that has almost nothing to do with what we learn spontaneously from love and life. He ended up boring me stiff, but this did not lessen my admiration for his tortured mystico-sexual search, all the more painful because it was so useless. One of the things I remember from my Ceylon days is a great elephant hunt. The elephants had grown much too numerous in one district, where they made constant raids, damaging houses and farmlands. For over a month, all along the banks of a wide river, the peasants had gradually rounded up the wild herds with grass fires, bonfires and tom-toms and driven them back toward one spot in the jungle. Night and day, the fires and the noise excited the huge beasts, drifting now like a slow river toward the northwestern part of the island. On this particular day, the kraal was all set. A stockade penned off a part of the forest. I saw how the first elephant went in through a narrow passage and sensed itself trapped. It was too late. Hundreds more followed into this dead end passage. Almost 500 strong, the immense herd of elephants could neither advance nor retrace their steps. The most powerful males charged the palisades, trying to knock them down, but innumerable spears surged up on the other side and halted them. Then they regrouped in the center of the enclosure, determined to protect the females and the young. Their organization and their protectiveness made them a touching sight. They let out an anguished call, a kind of neigh or trumpet blast, and in their despair uprooted the weakest trees. Suddenly the tamers went in, mounted onto huge trained elephants. The domesticated pair acted like common policemen. They took their places on either side of the captive animal, pummeled him with their trunks, and helped reduce him to immobility. Next, with thick ropes, the hunters secured one of his hind legs to a strong tree. One by one, the creatures were rendered helpless in this same way. The captive elephant turns down his food for a good many days. 
but the hunters know his weaknesses. They let the animals fast a while and then bring them the sprouts and tender stalks of their favorite plants, those they would forage for on their long forest treks when they were still free to roam at will. At last, the elephant breaks down and eats. He has been tamed and begins to learn his heavy chores. Life in Colombo in Colombo there seemed to be no visible symptoms of revolution. Its political climate was different from India's. Everything was engulfed by an oppressive calm. The country supplied England with the finest tea in the world. The country was split into sectors or compartments. The English, who occupied the tip of the pyramid and lived in large residences with gardens, were followed by a middle class much like that in South American countries. They were and may still be called burghers and were descendants of the former Boers, the Dutch settlers of South Africa exiled to Ceylon during the colonial war of the last century. Below them was the Buddhist and Muslim population of Sivayon, which numbered many millions. And still further down, making up the worst paid working ranks and also running into the millions, were the Indian immigrants, all from the southern part of that country, they spoke Tamil and professed the Hindu religion. In the so-called polite society, which paraded its finest clothes and jewels in Colombo's exclusive clubs, the famous snobs competed for leadership. One was a phony French nobleman, Count de Moni, who had a group of devotees. The other was an elegant and devil-maker pole, my friend Windsor, who dominated the few fashionable salons there were. This man was extremely witty, quite cynical, and a source of knowledge about everything in the world. He had a strange profession, preserver of the cultural and archaeological treasure, and going along with him on one of his official expeditions was an eye-opening experience to me. Excavations had brought to light to magnificent cities the jungle had swallowed up, Anuradhapura and Polo Naruva. Pillars and corridors gleamed once again in the brilliant Singhalese Sun. Naturally, everything that could be shipped was carefully packed and went on its way to the British Museum in London. My friend Windsor was pretty good at his work. He went to remote monasteries and, to the enormous satisfaction of the Buddhist monks, he loaded the official van with marvellous stone sculptures, thousands of years old, that would end up in England's museums. The look of contentment on the faces of the saffron-garbed monks was something to see, when Windsor would leave them, some painted up celluloid Buddhist images, made in Japan, as replacements for their own antics. They would look them over with reverent eyes and set them up on the same altars from which the jasper and granite statues had smiled for centuries. My friend Windsor was an excellent product of the empire, that is, an elegant short-change artist. Something came to throw a cloud over those days literally burned away by the sun. Without warning, my Burmese love, the tempestuous Josie Bliss, pitched camp in front of my house. She had come all the way from her far-off country. Believing that rice was not grown anywhere except in Rangoon, she arrived with a sack of it on her back, with her favorite Paul robes and records, and a long, rolled-up mat. She spent all her time posted at the front door, looking out for anyone who came to visit me, and she would pounce on them and insult them. I can see her now, consumed by her overwhelming jealousy, threatening to burn down my house, and attacking a sweet Eurasian girl who had come to pay a call. The colonial police considered her uncontrollable behavior a focus of disruption in the quiet street, and I was warned that she would be thrown out of the country if I didn't take her in. I felt wretched for days, racked between the tenderness her unhappy love stirred in me and the terror I had of her. I didn't dare let her set foot in my house. She was a love-smitten terrorist, capable of anything. One day, at last, she made up her mind to go away. She begged me to go with her to the ship. When it was time to weigh anchor and I had to go ashore, she wrenched away from the passengers around her, and seized by a gust of grief and love, she covered my face with kisses and bade me with her tears. She kissed my arms, my suit, 
in a kind of ritual and suddenly slipped down to my shoes before I could stop her. When she stood up again, the chalk polish of my white shoes was smeared like flour all over her face. I couldn't ask her to give up her trip to leave the ship with me instead of going away forever. My better judgment prevented me from doing that, but my heart received a great scar which is still part of me. That unrestrained grief, those terrible tears rolling down her chalky face, are still fresh in my memory. I had almost finished writing the first part of Residencia en la Tierra. But my work was progressing very slowly. Distance and a deep silence separated me from my world, and I could not bring myself to enter wholeheartedly the alien world around me. Things that happened in my life, which was suspended in a vacuum, were brought together in my book as if they were natural events, closer to life's blood than to the ink. I tried to purify my style, but relied more and more on a wild melancholy. I insisted on truth and effective rhetoric, because they are the ingredients for the bread of poetry, in a bitter style that worked systematically toward my own destruction. The style is not only the man. It is also everything around him, and if the very air he breathes does not enter into the poem, the poem is dead, dead because it has not had a chance to breathe. I have never read with so much pleasure or so voluminously as I did in that suburb of Colombo where I lived all alone for so long. From time to time, I would return to Rimbaud, Quivido, or Proust. Swan's Way made me experience all over again the torments, the loves and jealousies of my adolescence. And I realized that in the phrase from Wintuel's Sonata, a musical phrase Proust referred to as aerial and fragrant, one savors not only the most exquisite description of sensuous sound but also a desperate measure of passion itself. My problem, in those solitary surroundings, was to find this music so that I might listen to it. With the help of my friend the musician and musicologist, we pursued the matter until we learned that Proust's Wintuel was probably a combination of Schubert and Wagner and Saint Saints and Four and Dean D and Caesar Frank. My shamefully skimpy musical curriculum had omitted almost all those composers. Their works were boxes that were missing or sealed to me. My ear could never recognize any but the most obvious melodies and, even then, with difficulty. Making further headway in the investigation, more literary than musical, I finally got hold of a three-record album of Caesar Frank's sonata for piano and violin. No doubt about it, Wintuel's phrase was there. There was absolutely no room for doubt. For me its attraction had been purely literary. In his sharp-sighted narrative about a dying society, he loved and hated, Proust, the greatest exponent of poetic realism, lingered with passionate indulgence over many works of art, paintings and cathedrals, actresses and books. But although his insight illuminated whatever it touched, he often went back to the enchantment of this sonata and its renascent phrase with an intensity that he probably did not give to any other descriptive passages. His words led me to relive my own life, to recover the hidden sentiments I had almost lost within myself in my long absence. I wanted to see in that musical phrase Proust's magical narrative and I was swept away on music swings. The phrase loses itself in the depths of the shadows, falling in pitch, prolonging, enhancing its agony. It appears to build up in anguish like a gothic structure, volutes repeated on and on, swayed by the rhythm that lifts a slender spire endlessly upward. The element born of pain looks for a triumphal way out that, in its rise, will not deny its origin transmuted by sadness. It curls seemingly into a melancholy spiral, while the dark notes of the piano accompany time and again the death and renaissance of the sound. The heart-rending intimacy of the piano repeats, time and again, the serpentine birth, until love and pain come together in death and victory. There could be no doubt for me that this was the phrase and this the sonata.
Savage darkness came down like a fist on my house lost among the coconut trees of Velawat, but each night the sonata lived with me, leading me on, welling around me, filling me with its everlasting sadness, its victorious melancholy. Until now, the critics who have scrutinized my work have not detected this secret influence I am confessing here. For I wrote a large part of Residencia en la Tierra there, in Velawat. Although my poetry is not fragrant or aerial, but sadly earthbound, I think those qualities, so often clad in mourning, have something to do with my deep feelings for this music that lived within me. Years later, back in Chile once more, I met the big three of Chilean music, young, gathered together at a party. It was 1932, I believe, in Martha Brunet's home. Claudio Arro was chatting in a corner with Domingo Santa Cruz and Armando Carvajal. I sauntered over, but they hardly spared me a glance. They went on talking imperturbably about music and composers. So I tried to show off a little, bringing up that sonata, the only one I knew. They looked at me with a distracted air and spoke down to me. Caesar Frank? Why Caesar Frank? Vardi is what you should get to know. And they went on with their conversation, burying me under my own ignorance, from which I still haven't been able to escape. Singapore's solitude in Colombo was not only dull but indolent. I had a few friends on the street where I lived. Girls of various colorings visited my campaign court, leaving no record but the lightning spasm of the flesh. My body was a lonely bonfire burning night and day on that tropical coast. One friend, Patsy, showed up frequently with some of her friends, Dusky and Golden, girls of Boa, English, Dravidian blood. They went to bed with me sportingly, asking for nothing in return. One of them told me all about her visits to the Chamaris. That's what they called the bungalows where young Englishmen, clerks in shops or firms, lived together in groups to save on money and food. Without a trace of cynicism in her voice, as if it were the most natural thing in the world, the girl told me that she had once had sex with 14 of them. And why did you do it? I asked her. They were having a party one night and I was alone with them. They turned on a gramophone, I danced a few steps with each of them, and as we danced, we'd lose our way into one bedroom or another. That way, everyone was happy. She was not a prostitute. No, she was just another product of colonialism, a candid and generous fruit of its tree. Her story impressed me, and from then on, I had a soft spot for her in my heart. My solitary bungalow was far from any urban development. When I rented it, I tried to find out where the toilet was, I couldn't see it anywhere. Actually, it was nowhere near the shower, it was at the back of the house. I inspected it with curiosity. It was a wooden box with a hole in the middle, very much like the artifact I had known as a child in the Chilean countryside. But our toilets were set over a deep well or over running water. Here the receptacle was a simple metal pail under the round hole. The pail was clean every morning, but I had no idea how its contents disappeared. One morning I rose earlier than usual, and I was amazed when I saw what had been happening. Into the back of the house, walking like a dusky statue, came the most beautiful woman I had yet seen in Ceylon, a Tamil of the Paraya caste. She was wearing a red and gold sari of the cheapest kind of cloth. She had heavy bangles on her bare ankles. Two tiny red dots glittered on either side of her nose. They must have been ordinary. Glass, but on her they were rubies. She walked solemnly toward the latrine, without so much as a side glance at me, not bothering to acknowledge my existence, and vanished with the disgusting receptacle on her head, moving away with the steps of a goddess. She was so lovely that, regardless of her humble job, I couldn't get her off my mind. 
Like a shy jungle animal, she belonged to another kind of existence, a different world. I called to her, but it was no use. After that, I sometimes put a gift in her path, a piece of silk or some fruit. She would go past without hearing or looking. That ignoble routine had been transformed by her dark beauty into the dutiful ceremony of an indifferent queen. One morning, I decided to go all the way. I got a strong grip on her wrist and stared into her eyes. There was no language I could talk with her. Unsmiling, she let herself be led away and was soon naked in my bed. Her waist, so very slim, her full hips, the brimming cups of her breasts made her like one of the thousand-year-old sculptures from the south of India. It was the coming together of a man and a statue. She kept her eyes wide open all the while, completely unresponsive. She was right to despise me. The experience was never repeated. I hardly believed it when I read the cable. The Minister of Foreign Relations was notifying me of my new appointment. I would end my term as consul in Colombo and go on to carry out the same function in Singapore and Batavia. This raised me from the first circle of poverty into the second. In Colombo, I had the right to retain, if it was taken in, the sum of $166. 66 now, as consul in two colonies at once, I could retain, if it was taken in, twice $166. 66, namely, the sum of $333 to $32, if it was taken in. This meant that, for the present anyway, I would stop sleeping on a field cot. My material aspirations were not too high. But what was I going to do with Kiria, my mongoose? Give her to the impudent neighborhood kids, who no longer believed in her power against serpents? I wouldn't dream of it. They would neglect her, they would not let her eat at the table, as she was used to with me. Set her loose in the forest to revert to her primitive state? Never. She had doubtless lost her defensive instincts and the birds of prey would devour her in an unguarded moment. But how could I take her with me? Such a singular passenger would never be allowed on board ship. So I decided to have Brampi, my Singhalese boy, make the trip with me. It was a millionaire's luxury, and it was also madness. We were going to countries, Malaya, Indonesia, whose languages Brampi couldn't speak a word of. The Mongoose, on the other hand, could travel incognito in a basket on deck. Brampi knew her as well as I did. Customs was a problem, but crafty Brumpy would be sure to get around it. And that's how, with sadness, joy, and the mongoose, we left the island of Ceylon, headed for another, unknown world. It must be difficult to understand why Chile had consulates scattered all over the world. It surely would seem odd that a small republic tucked down in a corner near the South Pole should post and maintain official representatives on archipelagos, coasts, and reefs on the other side of the globe. In truth, as I see it, these consulates are evidence of the flights of fancy and self-importance we South Americans generally indulge in. But also, as I have already mentioned, from these far-flung places Chile got jute and paraffin to manufacture candles and, above all, tea, enormous quantities of tea. In Chile we drink tea four times a day and we can't grow it. Once we had a widespread strike among the nitrate workers because of a shortage of this exotic product. I recall that one day, after a few whiskies, some English exporters asked me what we did in Chile with such exorbitant quantities of tea. We drink it, I told them. If they expected to pump out of me some secret industrial exploitation of tea in Chile, I was sorry to disappoint them. The consulate in Singapore had already been in existence for 10 years. I went ashore, then, with the confidence instilled in me by my 23 years, with Brumpy and my mongoose in tow. We went straight to the Rams Hotel. 
there I sent out my laundry, of which one had quite a bit, and then I sat down on the veranda. I stretched out lazily in an easy chair and ordered one, two, perhaps three gin pabits. It was all very much like something in Somerset Morgham, until I decided to look in the telephone book for my consulate's headquarters. It wasn't listed, dumb it. I immediately put an urgent call through to the British government offices. They replied, after checking, that there was no Chilean consulate there. I made inquiries about the consul, Sir Mansilla. They knew nothing of him. I was crushed. I barely had enough money to pay for one day at the hotel and for my laundry. Then it struck me that the Phantom Consulate must have its headquarters in Batavia, and I decided to get back on the ship I had come on, since Batavia was where it was going and it was still in port. I ordered my laundry removed from the tub where it was soaking, Grumpy rolled it up into a wet bundle, and we set out for the docks at breakneck speed. They were drawing up the ship's ladder. I puffed up the steps. My ex-traveling companions and the ship's officers stared at me incredulously. I moved back into the cabin I had left that morning, and lying on my back on the bunk, I closed my eyes as the ship pulled away from that unlucky port. I had met a Jewish girl on the ship. Her name was Krizi. A blonde, on the plum side, she had orange-colored eyes and was bubbling over with good spirits. She told me she had a good job in Batavia. I stayed close to her during the cruise's farewell party. She kept dragging me out to dance, between drinks, and I followed her clumsily in the slow contortions that were popular at the time. We spent that last night making love in my cabin, in a friendly way, knowing that chance had brought us together for this brief time only. I told her about my misadventures. She comforted me gently and her light-hearted tenderness touched me. Kriji, in turn, confided the real nature of the job waiting for her in Batavia. There was an organization, more or less international, which placed European girls in the beds of respectable Asians. She had been given a choice between a Maharaja, a Prince of Siam, and a wealthy Chinese merchant. She picked the last, a young but mild-mannered man. When we landed, the following day, I got a look at the Chinese magnate's Rolls-Royce as well as its owner's profile through the automobile's flowered curtains. Kriji vanished among the crowd and luggage. I settled into the Nederlanden hotel and was getting ready for lunch when I saw Kriji come in. She flung herself into my arms, choked by sobs. They're throwing me out of here. I have to leave tomorrow. But who is throwing you out? Why are they throwing you out? She sobbed out her unhappy story. She was about to get into the Rolls Royce when the immigration officers stopped her and subjected her to a brutal interrogation. She had to confess everything. The Dutch authorities considered it a grave offense for her to live as the concubine of a Chinese. They finally let her go, on her promise not to visit her gallant and to get back on the ship she had arrived in, which was returning to the West the next day. What hurt her most was to disappoint the man who had been waiting for her, a sentiment the imposing Rolls Royce may have had some bearing on. Still, Kriji was sentimental at heart. There was much more to her tears than her frustrated interests, she felt humiliated and deeply offended. Do you know his address? Do you have his telephone number? I asked. Yes, she said. But I'm afraid they'll arrest me. They threatened to throw me in jail. You have nothing to lose. Go see the man whose dreams must have been full of you, though he did not even know you. You owe him at least a few words. Why worry about the Dutch police at this point? Get even with them. Go see your Chinese. Take care, give them the slip, and you'll feel better. I'm sure you'll leave this country feeling happier then. Late that night she returned. She had seen her mail-order suitor, 
and she told me all about their meeting. The Oriental was a literate man who affected French manners and spoke French quite well. He was married, observed the mores and practices of honorable Chinese matrimony, and led a very boring life. The yellow-skinned suitor had prepared for his white, western sweetheart a bungalow with a garden, mosquito screens, Louis XVI furniture, and a huge bed, which they tried out that night. The house's owner sadly showed her the little refinements he had been preparing for her, the silver knives and forks, he himself used only chopsticks, the bar stocked with European drinks, the refrigerator filled with fruit. Then he stopped before a huge locked chest. He took a key from his pants pocket and opened the trunk, revealing the strangest of treasures to Krigi's eyes, hundreds of ladies' undergarments, soft, silken panties, the scantiest of briefs, intimate women's dainties, hundreds, thousands of them stuffed into that piece of furniture sanctified by the pungent aroma of sandalwood. Every kind of silk, every color, was there. From violet to yellow, from every shade of pink to the mystic greens, from strident reds to shimmering blacks, from electric sky blues to nuptial white. The entire rainbow of male concupiscence put together by a fetishist who obviously had collected the items for his own sensual pleasure. I was stunned, Griggy said, beginning to sob again. I grabbed a handful at random and here they are. I, too, was touched by this mystery of human behavior. Our Chinese, a serious businessman, importer and exporter, amassed ladies' panties as if he were collecting butterflies. Who would have dreamed it? Let me have one of them, I said to my friend. She picked out a white and green garment and stroked it softly before handing it to me. Write something on it for me, Griji, please. She smoothed it out with care and wrote my name and hers on its silky surface, which she also sprinkled with a few tears. She left the next day without my seeing her, and I have never seen her again. Those surest of panties, with her words of dedication and her tears, travelled around in my suitcases among my clothes and my books for a good many years. I never knew when or how some cheeky lady visitor walked out of my house with them on. Batavia In those days, when motels had not yet come into the world, the Nederlanden was a rarity. It had a large central building for dining room service and offices and then individual bungalows for the guests, separated by tiny gardens and robust trees. In the high tops of these trees lived an infinitude of birds, flying squirrels that flitted from branch to branch, and insects that chirred just as if in the jungle. Grumpy outdid himself at his job of looking after the mongoose, which was more and more restive in her new home. There really was a Chilean consulate here. At least it was listed in the telephone book. I set out for its offices on the following day, rested and more appropriately dressed. The consular coat of arms of Chile hung on the facade of a huge building occupied by a steamship line. One of its numerous personnel took me to the office of the manager, a florid, Corpulent Dutchman who looked more like a longshoreman than like the manager of a shipping, I am the new Chilean consul, I introduced myself. First, let me thank you for your help, and then I'd be obliged if you would brief me on the running of the consulate. I propose to take over my post right away. I am the only consul here. He said angrily. How's that? Start off by paying me what you people owe me. He shouted. The man may have known something about shipping, but he had no idea what good manners were, in any language. Phrase after phrase tumbled out, while he chewed furiously on an awful cheroot that was polluting the air. The wild man hardly let me get a word in edgewise. His indignation and his cheroot threw him into deafening cuffing fits, or else into gargles that turned into gobs of spit. I was finally able to get in a word in self-defense, Sir, I don't owe you a thing, and I don't have to pay you a thing. It is my understanding that you are consul and honored, honorary consul, that is. 
And if this seems open to question, I hardly see how it can be settled with all this shouting, which I don't intend to put up with. Later I learned that the nasty Dutchman had every argument on his side. The fellow had been the victim of a swindle that, of course, could not be blamed either on the government of Chile or on me. Mansilla was the crook at the source of the Dutchman's rage. I discovered that Mansilla, the so-and-so, had never assumed his duties as consul in Batavia, he had been living in Paris for some time. He had made a deal with the Dutchman to have him perform the consular duties and send him, Mansilla, the papers and fees he took in every month. Mansilla pledged to pay him a monthly stipend, which he never paid. Thence the indignation of this naive Dutchman, who came down on my head like a collapsing roof. I felt miserable the next day. Malignant fever, flu, loneliness, and hemorrhaging. I was burning hot and perspiring profusely. My nose began to bleed as it had in my childhood in Temuco's cold climate. Mustering all my strength, I headed for the government offices. They were located in Bittenzog, in the magnificent botanical gardens. The bureaucrats raised their blue eyes from their white papers with difficulty. They took out their pens, which were also dripping with perspiration, and wrote down my name with a few drops of sweat. I came out feeling worse than when I had gone in. I walked down the avenues and finally sat down under an enormous tree. Here everything was healthy and cool, life breathed calm and powerful. Before me, the giant trees lifted their trunks straight, smooth, and silvery, a hundred meters into the air. I read the enameled nameplates identifying them. They were varieties of eucalyptus I was not familiar with. A chill perfume drifted down to my nostrils from the immense height. That emperor of trees had taken pity on me, and a gust of its scent restored my strength. Or perhaps it was the green solemnity of the botanical gardens, the infinite variety of leaves, the crisscrossing vines, the orchids flashing like sea stars in the foliage, the undersea depth of that forest-like enclosure, the shrieks of the macaws, the squeals of the monkeys, all of it restored my confidence in the future and returned my zest for living, which had been flickering like the stub of a candle. I got back to the hotel in better spirits and sat down on the veranda of my bungalow, with writing paper and my mongoose on my table, I had decided to send a cable to the Chilean government. I needed ink. So, I called a boy from the hotel and asked him in English for some ink, hoping he'd bring me an inkwell. He didn't show the slightest glimmer of understanding. He just called another boy, also dressed in white and barefoot, to help interpret my buffing request. It was no use. Whenever I said ink and moved my pen, dipping it into an imaginary inkwell, the seven or eight boys who had by now congregated to advise the first repeated my motion as one man, with pens they had drawn out of their pockets, exclaiming vigorously, ink, ink, and nearly dying with laughter. They thought it was a new ritual they were learning. I rushed desperately into the bungalow across the way, followed by the string of servants in white from the solitary table I took an inkwell that by sheer luck was there, and waving it in front of their astonished eyes, I screamed at them, this, this. They all smiled and sang out together, Tinta, Tinta. And that was how I learned that, in Malay, ink is called by the same name, Tinta, as in Spanish. In time I regained the right to take up my duties as consul. My disputed patrimony consisted of a moth-eaten rubber stamp, an ink pad, and a few folders with records of profits and losses. The profits had ended up in the pockets of the wily consul operating from Paris. His swindled Dutch surrogate handed me the insignificant sheaf of papers with the cold smile of a frustrated mastodon and never stopped chewing on his cheroot. From time to time, I signed consular invoices and put the dilapidated official stamp on them. That's how I obtained the dollars that, converted into guilders, made it possible for me to eke out a living, 
food and lodging for me, Brumpy's wages, and the upkeep of my mongoose Kiria, who was growing noticeably and consumed three or four eggs a day. Besides, I had to buy myself a white dinner jacket and tails, which I undertook to pay for by the month. Sometimes I would sit, almost always alone, in a crowded open-air cafe alongside a wide canal, to have a beer or a gin aphid. That is, I resumed my desperately uneventful life. The rice table of the hotel restaurant was fit for a king. A procession of ten or fifteen serving boys would come into the dining room, filing past with their respective platters held high. Each platter was divided into sections, and each section held a mysterious, magnificent delicacy. Each item of this endless variety of food was mounted on a rice base. I have always been a hearty eater, and I had been undereating for such a long time, I would choose something from the platter offered by each of the fifteen or eighteen serving boys, until my plate became a small mountain where exotic fish, indescribable eggs, astonishing vegetables, incredible chickens, the choicest, rarest meats covered the summit of my lunch like a flag. The Chinese say that food must excel in three things, taste, aroma, and color. The rice table at my hotel had those three virtues and one more, abundance. At about this time I lost my mongoose. Kiria had the dangerous habit of tagging after me wherever I went, with quick, imperceptible steps. Following me meant plunging into streets travelled by cars, trucks, rickshaws, and Dutch, Chinese, and Malay pedestrians. A turbulent life for a trusting mongoose who knew only two persons in the whole world. The inevitable happened. On my return to the hotel one day, I saw the tragedy written all over Brumpy's face. I didn't ask him anything. But when I sat down on the veranda, she did not come to jump on my knees or brush her furry tail against my head. I placed an ad in the papers, Lost, Mongoose, Answers to the Name of Kiria. There was no reply. None of the neighbors had seen her. Maybe she was already dead. She had disappeared forever. Brumpy, her guardian, felt so disgraced that he stayed out of sight. My clothes, my shoes, were taken care of by a phantom. Sometimes I thought I heard Kiria squeal, calling me from a tree during the night. I would turn on the light, open the windows and doors, peer into the coconut trees. It wasn't she. The world Kiria knew had betrayed her. Her trustfulness had shattered in the city's dangerous jungle. I was grief-stricken for a long time. Overcome with shame, Brumpy decided to go back to his native country. I was not happy about it, but the mongoose had really been the only thing we had in common. One afternoon he came in to show me the new suit he had bought so that he could return well-dressed to his hometown in Ceylon. He showed up suddenly, dressed in white and buttoned all the way up to his neck. The most surprising thing was the huge chef's cap he had settled on his jet black head. I burst out laughing, in spite of myself. Brumpy was not insulted. On the contrary, he smiled at me sweetly, with a smile of understanding for my ignorance. My new home in Batavia was on a street called Probolingo. It had a living room, a bedroom, a kitchen, a bathroom. I never owned a car, but I did have a garage that was always empty. I had more than enough space in this tiny house. I took on a Javanese cook, an old peasant woman, charming and egalitarian. A boy, also Javanese, served table and looked after my clothes. There I finished residentia en la tierra. My solitude became even deeper. I decided to get married. I had met a Creel, to be exact, a Dutch girl with a few drops of Malay blood, and I became very fond of her. She was a tall, gentle girl and knew nothing of the world of arts and letters. About this marriage of mine, my friend and biographer Margarita Aguayo was to write several years later, Neruda returned to Chile in 
932. Two years earlier, in Batavia, he had married Marfa Antonieta Hagenar, a young Dutch woman who lived in Java. She is quite proud of being a consul's wife and has a most exotic opinion of America. She doesn't know any Spanish, but she's learning it. However, there is no doubt that it is not just the language that she has had trouble learning. In spite of all this, she is very much attached to Neruda, and they are always together. Maruka, that's what Pablo calls her, is tali, stately, hieratic. My life was very simple. I was soon meeting other amiable people. Linked by our common language, the Cuban consul and his wife became my friends as a matter of course. Capablanca's countryman talked non-stop, like a self-winding machine. Officially he was representing Machado, the Cuban tyrant. Yet he would tell me how items belonging to political prisoners, watches, rings, sometimes even gold teeth, would turn up in the bellies of sharks caught in Havana's bay. The German consul, Hertz, was a great admirer of the modern plastic arts, Franz Marx's blue horses, Wilhelm Lambruck's elongated figures. He was a sensitive person, romantic in temperament, a Jew with a centuries-old cultural heritage. I once asked him, and this Hitler whose name appears from time to time in the newspapers, this anti-Semite, anti-communist leader, don't you think he can assume power? Impossible, he told me. Why impossible, when history is full of the most absurd incidents? But you don't know Germany, he stated flatly. That's the one place where it is absolutely impossible for a mad agitator like him to run even a village. My poor friend, poor consul hurts. That mad agitator barely missed running the world. And the ingenious hurts, with all his culture and his noble romanticism, must have ended up in some monstrous, anonymous gas chamber. Memoirs By Pablo Neruda Spain in my heart What Federico was like A long sea voyage of two months brought me back to Chile in 1932. There I published El Hondero Enthusiasta, which had been mislaid among my papers, and Residencia en la Tierra, which I had written in the Orient. In 1933, I was appointed consul of Chile in Buenos Aires, and there I arrived in the month of August. Federico Garcia Lorca arrived in that city almost at the same time to direct his tragedy Blood Wedding, performed by Lola Membrives' troupe. We hadn't known each other, but we met in Buenos Aires and were often fated together by writers and friends. Of course, we had our share of incidents. Federico had his detractors. So did I, and I still have them. These detractors are driven by a desire to snuff out the lights, to keep us from being seen. That's what happened this time. Because there was a lot of interest in attending the banquet the P.E.N. Club was holding for Federico and me at the Plaza Hotel, someone kept the phones busy all day long spreading the word that the dinner in our honor had been called off. They were so persistent that they even called the hotel manager, the telephone operators, and the chef to make sure no reservations were accepted and no dinner was prepared. But the maneuver fell through and in the end Federico Garcia Lorca and I got together with a hundred Argentine writers. We came up with a big surprise. We had prepared a talk a Lalim 6N. You probably don't know what that means, and neither did I. Federico, who always had some invention or idea up his sleeve, explained, to bullfighters can fight the same bull at the same time, using only one cape between them. This is one of the most perilous feats in bullfighting. That's why it is so seldom seen. Not more than twice or three times in a century, and it can be done only by two bullfighters who are brothers, or at least blood relations. This is called fighting a bull al alim 6N. And that's the way we'll do our talk. And that is what we did. But no one knew about it beforehand. 
when we got up to thank the president of the PEN club for honoring us with the banquet, we did it together, like two bullfighters, to make our single speech. The diners sat at small, separate tables, and Federico was at one end of the room, I at the other. People on my side tugged at my jacket to make me sit down, believing there was a mix-up, and the same thing happened to Federico on the other side of the room. Well, we set out speaking together, with me saying, ladies, and he continuing with, and gentlemen, twining our phrases throughout, so that they flowed like a single speech, right to the end. The oration was dedicated to Rubain Darfo, because, though no one could accuse us of being modernists, both Garcia Lorca and I regarded Rubain Darfo as one of the most creative poets in the Spanish language. Here is the text of the speech. Nerura, ladies. Lorca. And gentlemen, in bullfighting there is what is known as bullfighting al alim 6n, in which two toreros, holding one cape between them, outwit the bull together. Neruda. Linked as if by an electrical impulse, Federico and I will together thank you for this prestigious reception. Lorca. At these gatherings it is customary for a poet to bring forth his living word, be it of silver or wood, and hail his companions and friends with his own voice. Neruda. We, however, are going to seat a dead man among you, to bring you a table companion who is widowed, obscured by the darkness of a death greater than other deaths, widowed of life, whose dazzling spouse he was, in his shining hour. We shall stand in his fiery shadow, we shall call out his name until his powers leap back from oblivion. Lorca And gentlemen, in bullfighting there is what is known as bullfighting al alamin in which two toreros, holding one cape between them, outwit the bull together. Neruda Linked as if by an electrical impulse, Federico and I will together thank you for this prestigious reception. Lorca At these gatherings it is customary for a poet to bring forth his living word, be it of silver or wood, and hail his companions and friends with his own voice. Neruda We, however, are going to seat a dead man among you, to bring you a table companion who is widowed, obscured by the darkness of a death greater than other deaths, widowed of life, whose dazzling spouse he was, in his shining hour. We shall stand in his fiery shadow, we shall call out his name until his powers leap back from oblivion. Lorca First, a symbolic embrace, with a penguin-like tenderness, to that exquisite poet, M.D.O. Willer. Then we offer a great name upon the festal board, in the knowledge that wine glasses will shatter, folks fly in search of the eye they hunger for, and a tidal wave stain the table linen. We give you the poet of America and Spain, Rubain. Neruda. Dario. Because, ladies. Lorca. And gentlemen. Neruda. Where, in Buno Eris, is there a Rubain Dario Plaza? Lorca. Where is Rubain Dario's statue? Neruda. He loved parks. Where is Rubain Dario Park? Lorca. What florist carries Rubain Dario roses? Neruda. Where are Rubain Darfo apple trees? Rubain Dario apples? Lorca. Where is the cast of Rubain Dario's hand? Neruda. Where? Lorca. Rubain Dario sleeps in the Nicaragua of his birth under a ghastly lion made of plaster like those the rich set at their gates. Neruda. A mail order lion for him who was a founder of lions, a lion without stars for him who dedicated the stars to others. Lorca. In an adjective he gave us the sounds of the forest. Like Fray Luis de Granada, a master of words, he created constellations with the lemon, and the stag's foot, and mollusks filled with terror and infinity, he sent us to see with frigates and shadows in the pupils of our eyes, and he built a limitless esplanade of gin across the greyest afternoon the sky has ever known, and he talked to the south wind in familiar terms, 
all heart, like the romantic poet he was, and his hand rested on the Corinthian capital, skeptical about all the ages, ironic and sorrowing. Neruda His luminous name should be remembered in its every essence, with the terrible griefs of his heart, his incandescent incertitude, his descent into the deepest circles of hell, his rise to the castles of fame, his greatness as a poet, then and forever and unequaled. Lorca As a Spanish poet, he was teacher in Spain to the older masters as well as to the children, with a sense of universality and a generosity present-day poet do not poses. He was teacher to Valenklin and Juan Ram Six and Jimenez and the Machado brothers, and his voice was water and nitrate in the furrows of our time-honored language. From Rodrigo Caro to the Arjun Solas and Don Juan del Aguijo, the Spanish language had not had such a festival of words, such clashing of consonants, such fire and such form as in Ruben Darío. From Velázquez's landscape and Goya's campfire, from Quivido's melancholy to the precious apple cheeks of major kin peasant girls, Darío travelled over the land of Spain as if it were his own land. Neruda The tide brought him to Chile, the warm sea of the north, and the sea left him there, abandoned on the rugged, rock-toothed coast, and the ocean pounded him with foam and bells, and Valparaiso's black wind covered him with songs of salt. Tonight let us make him a statue of air and let smoke, voices, circumstances, and life flow through it, like his magnificent poetry with dreams and sounds flowing through it. Lorca But I want to give this statue of air blood like a coral branch stirred by the sea, nerves like a cluster of lightning in a photograph, the head of a minotaur with G6 Jorah's snow painted on by a flight of hummingbirds, the wandering and absent eyes of a millionaire of tears, and also, his failings. Shelving eaten away by hedge mustard, where the empty spaces are echoes of a flute, the cognac bottles of his spectacular drunken sprees, his charming lack of taste, and the barefaced verbal stunts that make the vast majority of his poems so human. The fertile substance of his great poetry stands outside norms, forms, or schools. Neruda, Federico Garcia Lorca, a Spaniard, and I, a Chilean, turn over the honor of this evening among friends to that great shadow who sang more loftily than we and hailed with his unique voice the Argentine soil on which we stand. Lorca, Pablo Neruda, a Chilean, and I, a Spaniard, linked by our language and by the person of the great Nicaraguan, Argentine, Chilean, and Spanish poet, Rubén Darío. Neruda and Lorca In whose honor and glory, we raise our glasses. I remember an evening when I received unexpected support from Federico in a colossal erotic escapade. We had been invited out by one of those millionaires that only Argentina or the United States can produce. He was a born rebel, a self-made man who had amassed a fantastic fortune with a sensationalist newspaper. Girded by an immense park, his house was the dynamic nouveau Richie's dream come true. Cages by the hundreds, with many colored pheasants from all over the world, lined the driveway. His library consisted of antique books bought by cable at book dealers' auctions throughout Europe, and what's more, it was quite comprehensive and filled to capacity. But the most spectacular thing about it was the floor of his enormous reading room, every inch of which was covered with panther skins sewed together into a single, gigantic carpet. I learned that the man had agents in Africa, Asia, and the Amazon, commissioned exclusively to collect the skins of leopards, ocelots, fabulous cats, whose spots now glistened beneath my feet in this ornate library. That's what it was like in the home of Natalio Botana, a notorious, powerful capitalist, who dominated public opinion in Buenos Aires. At the table, Federico and I sat on either side of the host and across from a tall, ethereal lady poet who kept her green eyes on me more than on Federico during dinner. This consisted of a whole steer brought right to the hot coals and ashes in an enormous hand barrow on the shoulders of eight or ten gauchos. The evening sky was a fierce blue, 
and starry. The aroma of the beef roasted in its hide, sublime invention of the Argentines, mingled with the breath of the pampas, the scent of clover and mint, and the chatter of a thousand crickets and tadpoles. The lady poet and I, along with Federico, who was delighted and moved to laughter by everything, rose from the table after dinner and went off toward the lighted swimming pool. Garcia Lorca walked in the lead, chatting and laughing. He was happy. He was always like that. Happiness was as much a part of him as his skin. A high tower soared above the shimmering swimming pool, dominating it. The whiteness of its lime was phosphorescent under the night lights. We climbed slowly to the tower's highest lookout. Up there the three of us, poets of different styles, were far removed from the world. The pool's blue eye gleamed below. Farther off, we could hear guitars and singing from the party. Over us the night hung so close, swarming with such a multitude of stars, that it seemed to envelop our heads, submerging them in its depths. I took the tall, golden girl in my arms, and when I kissed her, I found her sensual, well-fleshed, all woman. To Federico's surprise, we lay on the floor of the lookout, and I was starting to undress her, when I caught his enormous eyes staring down at us, not fully believing what was happening. Get out of here. Go see that nobody comes up the stairs. I shouted at him. As the sacrifice to the starry sky and the Aphrodite of the night was about to be consummated high in the tower, Federico hustled off cheerfully on his mission as aide and sentinel, with such ill fortune, however, that he rolled down the tower's darkened steps. The lady and I had to go help him up, with great difficulty. And he hobbled around for two weeks. Miguel Hernandez I was not at the consulate in Buenos Aires very long. At the start of 1934, I was transferred to Barcelona in the same capacity. Don Tulio Macvera, the Consul General of Chile in Spain, was my boss. He was, incidentally, the most dedicated official in the Chilean consular service I have come across. A severe man, with a reputation for reticence, he was extremely kind, understanding, and cordial to me. Don Tulio Macvera quickly learned that I was very bad at subtracting and multiplying, and that I didn't know how to divide, I have never been able to learn. So, he said to me, Pablo, you should go live in Madrid. That's where the poetry is. All we have here in Barcelona is that terrible multiplication and division that certainly doesn't need you around. I can handle it. In Madrid, turned overnight, as if by magic, into a Chilean consul in the capital of Spain, I met Garcia Lorca's and Alberti's friends. They were many. And within a few days I was one with the Spanish poets. Spaniards and Latin Americans are different, of course, a difference that is born with pride, or an error, by either side. The Spaniards of my generation were more brotherly, more close-knit and good-spirited than their counterparts in Latin America. I found that we were more cosmopolitan, had gone more into other languages and cultures. There were few among them who spoke any other language than Spanish. When Desnos and Creville came to Madrid, I had to act as interpreter, so that they and the Spaniards could communicate. The young poet Miguel Hernandez was one of Federico's and Alberti's friends. I met him when he came up, in espadrilles and the typical corduroy trousers peasants wear, from his native Orihula, where he had been a goat herd. I published his poems in my review Caballo Verde, Green Horse, and I was enthusiastic about the radiance and vigor of his exuberant poetry. Miguel was a peasant with an aura of earthiness about him. He had a face like a clod of earth or a potato that has just been pulled up from among the roots and still has its subterranean freshness. He was living and writing in my house. My American poetry, with other horizons and planes, had its impact and gradually made changes in him. He told me earthy stories about animals and birds. 
He was the kind of writer who emerges from nature like an uncut stone with the freshness of the forest and an irresistible vitality. He would tell me how exciting it was to put your ear against the belly of a sleeping she goat. You could hear the milk coursing down to the udders, a secret sound no one but that poet of goats has been able to listen to. At other times he would talk to me about the nightingale's song. Eastern Spain, where he came from, swarmed with blossoming orange trees and nightingales. Since that bird, that sublime singer, does not exist in my country, Crazy Miguel liked to give me the most vivid imitation of what it could do. He would shiny up one of the trees in the street and from its highest branches would whistle or wobble like his beloved native birds. Since he had nothing to live on, I tried to get him a job. It was hard to find work for a poet in Spain. At last, a viscount, a high official in the Ministry of Foreign Relations, took an interest in his case and replied that yes, he was all for it, he had read Miguel's poems, admired them, and Miguel just had to indicate what position he preferred and he would be given the appointment. I was jubilant and said, Miguel Hernandez, your future is all set, at last. The Viscount has a job for you. You'll be a high-ranking employee. Tell me what kind of work you want, and your appointment will go through. Miguel gave it some thought. His face, with its deep, premature lines, clouded up with anxiety. Hours went by and it was not until late in the afternoon that he gave me his answer. With the radiant look of someone who has found the solution to his whole life, he said to me, could the Viscount put me in charge of a flock of goats somewhere near Madrid? The memory of Miguel Hernandez can never be rooted out of my heart. The song of the Levantine nightingales, their spires of sound soaring between the darkness and the orange blossoms, was an obsession with him. They were in his blood, in his earthy and wild poetry, where all the extravagances of color, of perfume, and of the voice of the Spanish Levant came together, with the exuberance and the fragrance of a powerful and virile youth. His face was the face of Spain. Chiseled by the light, rutted like a planted field, it had some of the roundness of bread or of earth. Filled with fire, burning in that surface coached and made leathery by the wind, his eyes were to beams of strength and tenderness, I saw the very elements of poetry rise out of his words, altered now by a new greatness, by a savage light, by the miracle that converts old blood into an infant son. In all my years as poet, as wandering poet, I can say that life has not given me the privilege of setting eyes on anyone with a vocation and an electrical knowledge of words like his. Green Hawes Federico and Alberti, who lived near my house in an apartment overlooking an avenue of trees, his lost grove, the sculptor A. Iberto, a baker from Toledo who was master of abstract sculpture, Alta Laguaya and Bergamfin, the great poet Louis Cernuda, Vicent Alexander, poet of limitless dimension, Louis Lacasa, the architect all of us, singly or in groups, would get together every day in someone's home or in a cafe. From Castellana Avenue or from the Corio's Tavern we would go to my house, the House of Flowers, in the Arguels sector. Down from the upper deck of one of the double-decker buses that my countryman, the great Kotapos, called Bombardins, we would come in boisterous groups to eat, drink, and sing. Among my young companions in poetry and merriment, I recall Archuro Serrano Plaja, poet, Jose Caballero, a painter of dazzling talent and a very amusing fellow, Antonio Apricio, who came from Andalusia straight to my house, and so many others who are no longer near or no longer alive, but whose friendship I miss as keenly as some part of my body or the substance of my soul. Ah, Madrid in those days. I would make the rounds of the working-class neighborhoods with Maruja Mallo, the Galician painter, looking for the places where esparto grass and mats were sold, looking for the streets of the barrel makers, of the rope makers, streets where they deal in all the dry goods of Spain, goods that entangle and choke her heart. Spain is dry and rocky, and the high sun beats down on it hard, 
drawing sparks from the flatlands, building castles of light out of clouds of dust. The only true rivers of Spain are its poets, Quivido, with his profound green waters and black foam, Caldas 6N, with his syllables that sing, the crystalline Argensulas, G6 Nagora, River of Rubies. I saw Valenklin only once. Very thin, with an endless white beard and a complexion like a yellowing page, he seemed to have walked out of one of his own books, which had pressed him flat. I met Ram Six and G6 Maze de la Serna in his crypt, the Pombo Cafe, and later on I saw him at home. I can never forget Ram Six N's booming voice guiding, from his spot in the cafe, the conversation and the laughter, the trends of thought and the smoke. Ram Six and G6 Maze de la Serna is for me one of the finest writers in our language, and his genius has some of the variegated greatness of Quivido and Picasso. Every page of Ram Six and G6 Maze de la Sama price like a ferret into the physical and the metaphysical, into the truth and the spectrum, and what he knows and has written about Spain has been said by him and no one else. He has put together a secret universe. He has changed the syntax of the language with his own hands, leaving his fingerprints so embedded in it that no one can wipe them off. I saw Don Antonio Machado several times, sitting in his favorite cafe dressed in his black notary suit, silent and withdrawn, as sweet and austere as an old Spanish tree. Incidentally, mean tongued Juan Ram Six and Jimenez, diabolical old brat of poetry, said of him, of Don Antonio, that he went around covered in ashes and that cigarette butts were all he carried in his pockets. It was Juan Ram Six and Jimenez, poet of great splendor, who took it upon himself to teach me all about that legendary Spanish envy. This poet who had no need to envy anyone, since his work is a resplendent beam flashing on the dark beginnings of the century, affected the life of a hermit, lashing out from his hideaway at anything he thought might overshadow him. The younger generation, Garcia Lorca and Alberti, as well as George Gillen and Pedro Salinas, were doggedly needled by Juan Ram Sixen, a bearded demon who dug his knife daily into one or another. He said unfavorable things about me every week in the elaborate critical commentaries he published Sunday after Sunday in the newspaper El Sol. But I made up my mind to live and let live. I never answered back. I never replied to literary attacks, and I still don't. The poet Manuel Altolaguaya, who had a printing press and the vocation of printer, came by my house one day to tell me that he was going to bring out a handsome poetry review, in the finest format and with the best work in Spain. There's only one person who can edit it, he said to me, and you're that person. I had been a heroic founder of magazines who quickly dropped them or was dropped by them. In 1925 one started Caballo de Bastos, Jack of Clubs. In those days we wrote without punctuation and were discovering Dublin by way of the streets in Joyce. Humberto Diaz Casanueva sported a turtleneck sweater, a very daring thing for a poet at that time. His poetry was lovely and immaculate, as it has continued to be. Rosemel Dale Valle always dressed in black from head to toe, as poets should. I remember these distinguished friends as my active collaborators. I have forgotten some of the others. At any rate, our galloping horse jolted the times. Yes, Menelito, I'll edit the review. Manuel Altolaguaya was an excellent printer whose own hands arrayed the cases with magnificent Bodoni characters. Manelito honored poetry with his poems and with his hands, a hard-working archangel's hands. He also printed Pedro de Espinosa's Fibula del Geni, Fable of the Genil River. What brilliance flashed from the lustrous golden verses of the poem in that majestic typography that made the words stand out as if they had been recast in the smelting furnace. Five fine, handsome issues of my Caballo Verde appeared on the bookstands. I like to watch Manolito, always full of laughter and smiles, pick out the type, set the characters in the cases, 
and then activate the small letter press with his foot. Sometimes he would set off with the copies of the review in his daughter Paloma's baby carriage. People in the streets made much of this, what a wonderful father. Going out even in this hellish traffic with his baby. The baby was poetry, riding her green horse. The review published Miguel Hernandez's first new poem and of course the poems of Federico, Cernuda, Alexander, Gillen, The Good One, The Spaniard. Neurotic, turn of the century one Ram six and Jimenez went on aiming his Sunday darts at me. Rafael Alberti didn't like the title, Why a Green Horse? Red Horse is what it should be called. I did not change its color. And Rafael and I didn't bicker over it. We never bickered over anything. There is plenty of room in the world for horses and poets of all the colors of the rainbow. The sixth number of Caballo Verde was left on Virieto Street, the pages not yet collated and sewn. It was dedicated to Julio Herrera y Riesig, a second lottery mont, produced by Montevideo, and the texts written in his honor by the poets of Spain were silenced in all their beauty, stillborn, having nowhere to go. The magazine was to have come out on 19th July 1936, but on that day the streets were filled with shooting. In his African garrison, an obscure general, Francisco Franco, had risen against the Republic. The crime was in Granada. Right now, as I write these lines, Spain is officially celebrating many so many years of successful insurrection. In Madrid at this very moment, dressed in blue and gold, surrounded by his Moorish guards, and at his side the ambassadors of the United States, England, and several other countries, the Supreme Commander is reviewing his troops. Troops made up mostly of boys who did not see that war. But I saw it. A million dead Spaniards. A million exiles. It seemed as if that thorn covered with blood would never be plucked from the conscience of mankind. And yet, perhaps the boys who are now passing in review before the Moresh guards don't know the truth about the terrible history of that war. For me, it started on the evening of 19 July 1936. A resourceful and pleasant Chilean, Bobby Diglane, was wrestling promoter in Madrid's huge Circo Prize Arena. I had expressed my reservations about the seriousness of that sport, and he convinced me to go to the arena that evening with Garcia Lorca to see how authentic the show really was. I talked Garcia Lorca into it and we agreed to meet there at a certain time. We were going to have great fun watching the truculence of the masked troglodyte, the Abyssinian strangler, and the sinister orangutan. Federico did not show up. He was at that hour already on his way to death. We never saw each other again, he had an appointment with another strangler. And so the Spanish war, which changed my poetry, began for me with a poet's disappearance. What a poet! I have never seen grace and genius, a winged heart and a crystalline waterfall, come together in anyone else as they did in him. Federico Garcia Lorca was the extravagant, duend, his was a magnetic joyfulness that generated a zest for life in his heart and radiated it like a planet. Open-hearted and comical, Worldly and provincial, an extraordinary musical talent, a splendid mime, easily alarmed and superstitious, radiant and noble, he was the epitome of Spain through the ages, of her popular tradition. Of Arabic Andalusian roots, he brightened and perfumed like Jasmine the state set of a Spain that, alas, is gone forever. Garcia Lorca's monumental command of metaphor seduced me, and everything he wrote attracted me. For his part, he would sometimes ask me to read him my latest poems, and halfway through the reading he would break in, shouting, Stop, stop, I'm letting myself be influenced by you. In the theatre and in a silence, in a crowd and in a small group, he generated beauty. I have never known anyone else with such magical hands, I never had a brother who loved laughter more. He laughed, sang, played the piano, leaped, invented, he sparkled. Poor friend, 
He had all the natural gifts and he was a goldsmith, a drone in the hive of great poetry, but he also wasted his creative talent sometimes. Listen, he would say, taking hold of my arm, do you see that window? Don't you think it's corpitalic? And what does corpitalic mean? I don't know either, but one must know what is and what's not corpitalic. Otherwise, you're lost. Look at that dog, he's really corpitalic. Or he would tell me that he had been invited to a ceremony commemorating Don Quixote at a school for boys, and that when he walked into the classroom the children, led by the headmistress, sang. This book, which was explicated by F. Roderick Jamarin, Ph.D., will be everywhere celebrated forever M.D. ever. Amen. Once I gave a talk on Garcia Lorca, years after his death, and someone in the audience asked me, in your Ordo Federico Gagfa Lorca, why do you say that they paint hospitals blue for him? Look, my friend, I replied, asking a poet that kind of question is like asking a woman her age. Poetry is not static matter but a flowing current that quite often escapes from the hands of the creator himself. His raw material consists of elements that are and at the same time are not, of things that exist and do not exist. Anyway, I'll try to give you an honest answer. For me, blue is the most beautiful color. It suggests space as man sees it, like the dome of the sky, rising toward liberty and joy. Federico's presence, his personal magic, instilled a mood of joy around him. My line probably means that even hospitals, even the sadness of hospitals, could be transformed by the magic spell of his influence and suddenly changed into beautiful blue buildings. Federico had a premonition of his death. Once, shortly after returning from a theatrical tour, he called me up to tell me about a strange incident. He had arrived with the La Barraca troop at some out-of-the-way village in Castile and camped on the edge of town. Overtired because of the pressures of the trip, Federico could not sleep. He got up at dawn and went out to wander around alone. It was cold, the knife-like cold that Castile reserves for the traveller, the outsider. The mist separated into white masses, giving everything a ghostly dimension. A huge rusted iron grating. Broken statues and pillars fallen among decaying leaves. He had stopped at the gate of an old estate, the entrance to the immense park of a feudal manor. Its state of abandonment, the hour, and the cold made the solitude even more penetrating. Suddenly Federico felt oppressed as if by something about to come out of the dawn, something about to happen. He sat down on the broken-off capital of a pillar lying toppled there. A tiny lamp came out to browse in the weeds among the ruins, appearing like an angel of mist, out of nowhere, to turn solitude into something human, dropping like a gentle petal on the solitude of the place. The poet no longer felt alone. Suddenly a herd of swine also came into the area. There were four or five dark animals, half-wild pigs with a savage hunger and hoofs like rocks. Then Federico witnessed a blood-curdling scene, the swine fell on the lamb and, to the great horror of the poet, tore it to pieces and devoured it. This bloody scene in that lonely place made Federico take his touring company back on the road immediately. Three months before the civil war, when he told me this chilling story, Federico was still haunted by the horror of it. Later on I saw, more and more clearly, that the incident had been a vision of his own death, the premonition of his incredible tragedy. Federico Garcia Lorca was not merely shot, he was assassinated. It would never have crossed anyone's mind that they would kill him one day. He was the most loved, the most cherished, of all Spanish poets, and he was the closest to being a child, because of his marvellous happy temperament. Who could have believed there were monsters on this earth, in his own Granada, capable of such an inconceivable crime? This criminal act was for me the most painful in the course of a long struggle.
Spain was always a battleground of gladiators, a country where much blood has flowed. The bull ring, with its sacrifice and its cruel elegance, repeats, glamorized in a flamboyant spectacle, the age-old struggle to the death between darkness and light. The Inquisition incarcerated Fray Luis de Le Sixen, Quivido suffered torments in a dungeon, Columbus hobbled with irons on his ankles. And the great showplace was the charnel house of El Escorial, just as the monument to the fallen is today, with its cross standing over a million dead and numberless dark memories. My book on Spain Time passed. We were beginning to lose the war. The poets sided with the Spanish people, Federico had been murdered in Granada. Miguel Hernandez had been transformed from a goat herd into a fighting word. In soldier's uniform, he read his poems on the front lines. Manuel Altolaguaya kept his printing presses going. He set one up on the Eastern Front, near Gerona, in an old monastery. My book Yesma and El Corazbin was printed there in a unique way. I believe few books, in the extraordinary history of so many books, have had such a curious birth and fate. The soldiers at the front learned to set type. But there was no paper. They found an old mill and decided to make it there. A strange mixture was concocted between one falling bomb and the next in the middle of the fighting. They threw everything they could get their hands on into the mill, from an enemy flag to a Moorish soldier's blood-stained tunic. And in spite of the unusual materials used and the total inexperience of its manufacturers, the paper turned out to be very beautiful. The few copies of that book still in existence produce astonishment at its typography and at its mysteriously manufactured pages. Years later I saw a copy in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., displayed in a showcase as one of the rarest books of our time. My book had just been printed and bound when the Republic's defeat was suddenly upon us. Hundreds of thousands of refugees glutted the roads leading out of Spain. It was the Exodus, the most painful event in the history of that country. Among those lines of people going into exile were the survivors of the Eastern Front, and with them Manuel Altolaguaya and the soldiers who had made the paper and printed Espafia and El Coraz 6 Sen. My book was the pride of these men who had worked to bring out my poetry in the face of death. I learned that many carried copies QF the book in their sacks, instead of their own food and clothing. With those sacks over their shoulders, they set out on the long march to France. The endless column walking to exile was bombed hundreds of times. Soldiers fell and the books were spilled on the highway. Others continued their interminable flight. On the other side of the border, the Spaniards who reached exile met with brutal treatment. The last copies of this impassioned book that was born and perished in the midst of fierce fighting were immolated in a bonfire. Miguel Hernandez sought refuge in the Chilean embassy, which during the war had granted asylum to 4,000 Franco followers. Carlos Morla Lynch, the ambassador, claimed to be his friend but denied the great poet his protection. A few days after, he was arrested and thrown into prison. He died of tuberculosis in jail three years later. The nightingale could not survive in captivity. My consular duties had come to an end. Because I had taken part in the defense of the Spanish Republic, the Chilean government decided to remove me from my post. The war and Paris. We reached Paris. I took an apartment together with Rafael Alberti and his wife, Marfa Teresa Le Sixen, on the Quai de El Hologe, a quiet, marvelous neighborhood. From our place I could see the Pont Neuf, the statue of Henry IV, and the fishermen dangling over the banks of the Seine. Nerval's place Dauphin, with its smell of leaves and restaurants, was behind us. The French writer Alejo Carpentier, one of the most uncommitted men I have known, lived there. He didn't dare voice an opinion on anything, not even on the Nazis, 
who were about to fall upon Paris like famished wolves. From my balcony, to the right, I could make out the black towers of the conciergerie. Its big gold clock was, for me, the neighborhood's final boundary. In France then, and for many years after, I had the good fortune to count as dear friends the two foremost figures of her literature, Paul Eluard and Argonne. They were and are extraordinary classic examples of naturalness with a vital authenticity that gives them a place in the most resonant part of the forest of France. At the same time, they are unshakable and intrinsic adherents of historical morality. Few human beings were as different from each other as these two. I often enjoyed the poetic pleasure of wasting time with Paul Eluard. If poets answered public opinion polls truthfully, they would give the secret away, there is nothing as beautiful as wasting time. Everyone has his own style for this pastime, as old as time itself. With Paul, I would lose all sense of the passing of day or night, and I never cared if what we were talking about was important or not. Argonne is an electronic machine of intelligence, learning, virulence, high-speed eloquence. I always left Eluard's home smiling without even knowing why. I come out of a few hours spent with Argonne completely worn out because this demon of a man has forced me to think. Both men have been my stalwart friends and perhaps what attracts me most about them is the tremendous difference in the nature of their great talents. Nancy Cunard Nancy Cunard and I decided to put out a poetry review which I titled Les Poets du Monde Defendant Les Pupil Espagnol, The Poets of the World Defend the Spanish People. Nancy had a small printing press in her country house in the French provinces. I don't remember the name of the place, but it was far from Paris. When we got to her house, it was night and the moon was out. The snow and the moonlight fluttered like a curtain around the estate. I went for a walk, filled with excitement. On my way back, the snowflakes swirled around my head with chilly insistence. I lost my bearings completely and had to grope my way through the whiteness of the night for half an hour. Nancy had printing experience. During her close relationship with Argon, she had published the translation of The Hunting of the Snark done by Argon and herself. This Lewis Carroll poem is really untranslatable and only in G6 Nagora, I believe, can we find a parallel to its insane mosaic. I started setting type for the first time and I am sure there has never been a worse typesetter. I printed PS upside down and they turned into DS through my typographical clumsiness. A line in which the word parpados, eyelids, appeared twice ended up with two dadapos. For years after, Nancy punished me by calling me that. My dear dardapo she would begin her letters from London. But it turned out to be an attractive publication and we managed to print six or seven issues. Besides militant poets like Gonzalez Tufi 6N or Alberti, and some French ones, we published impassioned poems by W. H. Auden, Spender, etc. These English gentlemen will never know how much my lazy fingers suffered setting their poems. From time to time, poets would come over from England, friends of Nancy's, dandies with a white flower in their lapel, who also wrote anti-Franco verses. In the history of the intellect there has not been a subject as fertile for poets as the Spanish War. The blood spilled in Spain was a magnet that sent shudders through the poetry of a great period. I don't know if the publication was a success or not, because the war in Spain came to its disastrous end at this time and a second world war had its disastrous beginning. In spite of its magnitude, its immeasurable cruelty, and all the heroic blood it spilled, that war did not manage to grip the collective heart of poetry as the one in Spain had. A short time later I would have to leave Europe to return to my country. Nancy would also be going to Chile soon, with a bullfighter who then left her and the bulls in Santiago to set up a business in sausages and cold cuts. But my dear friend, 
who was a high-class snob, was not one to give up easily. In Chile she took a poet as her lover, a slovenly vagrant, a Chilean of Basque descent with some talent but no teeth. What's more, Nancy's new lover was a hopeless drunk and gave the aristocratic English woman nightly beatings that forced her to appear in public wearing enormous dark glasses. Quixotic, anal tribble, fearless, and pathetic, Nancy was one of the strangest persons I have ever known. The sole heir to the Cunard line, Nancy, daughter of Lady Cunard, had scandalized London in 1930 by running away with a black man, a musician in one of the first jazz bands imported by the Savoy Hotel. When Lady Cunard found her daughter's bed empty and a letter proudly informing her of her black future, the noblewoman went to her lawyer and proceeded to cut her off without a cent. And that was how this young woman I met roaming the world had been disinherited from the British nobility. Her mother's salons were frequented by George Moray, who, gossip had it, was Nancy's real father, Sir Thomas Beecham, young Aldous Huxley, and the future Duke of Windsor, still Prince of Wales at the time. Nancy Cunard struck back. In December of the year in which her mother excommunicated her, the English aristocracy received as a Christmas present a pamphlet bound in red, entitled Negro Man and White Ladyship. I have never seen anything more vitriolic. It is as trenchant as swift, in some passages. Her arguments in defense of blacks came down like clubs on the heads of Lady Cunard and English society. I recall that she said, I am quoting from memory, and her words were more eloquent, suppose you, your white ladyship, or rather your people, had been kidnapped, beaten, and chained by a more powerful tribe and then shipped far from England to be sold as slaves, displayed as ludicrous specimens of human ugliness, forced to work under the whip and fed poorly. What would be left of your race? The blacks suffered all this violence and cruelty and much more besides. After centuries of suffering, however, they are still the best and most graceful athletes, and they have created a new music that is more universal than any other. Could you, and whites like you, have emerged victorious from so much iniquity? Who is better, then? And so on, for 30 pages. Nancy was never able to live in England after that, and from then on, she embraced the cause of the persecuted black race. During the invasion of Ethiopia, she went to Addis Ababa. Then she travelled to the United States to make common cause with the black boys of Scottsboro who were accused of infamous crimes they had not committed. The young blacks were sentenced by racist youth S. Justice and Nancy Cunard was deported by the Democratic North American police. My friend Nancy Cunard would die in 1969 in Paris. A sudden turn in her death agony made her go downstairs in the hotel elevator all but naked. There she collapsed on the floor and closed her lovely sky blue eyes forever. She weighed 35 kilos at the time of her death. She was a mere skeleton. Her body had wasted away in a long battle against injustice in the world. Her reward was a life that became progressively lonelier and a godforsaken death. A Congress in Madrid The war in Spain was going from bad to worse, but the Spanish people's spirit of resistance had captivated the whole world. International brigades were already fighting in Spain. I saw them arrive in Madrid, in 1936, in uniform. They were a magnificent group of people of different ages, colouring, hair. Now it was 1937 and we were in Paris and the main thing was to organize an anti-fascist congress of writers from all over the world. The congress would be held in Madrid. That's when I began to know Argon better. The first thing about him that surprised me was his incredible capacity for work and organization. He dictated all his letters, corrected and remembered them. Not even the slightest detail escaped him. He worked long, steady hours in our small office. Yet, as everyone knows, he writes thick volumes of prose, 
and his poetry is the most beautiful in the French language. I saw him correcting the galleys of translations he had done of Russian and English writers, and I saw him redo them right on the printer's proofs. He is really an extraordinary man, and that's when I began to appreciate that fact. I had been left without a consulship and consequently without a penny. I went to work for 400 old francs in an organization for the defense of culture managed by Argonne. Delia Dale Carroll, my wife then and for many years to come, was reputed to be a rich landowner, but she was actually poorer than I. We lived in a dubious, run-down hotel whose first floor was reserved for transient couples that came and went. For months we ate very little and badly. But the Congress of Anti-Fascist Writers became a reality. Priceless replies poured in from all over. One was from Yeats, Ireland's national poet, another, from Selma Lagerlof, the notable Swedish writer. They were both too old to travel to a beleaguered city like Madrid, which was being steadily pounded by bombs, but they rallied to the defense of the Spanish Republic. I have always considered myself a man of few qualifications, especially in practical matters or for high-minded missions. I stared open mouth, therefore, when I received a bank draft from the Spanish government for a considerable sum to cover expenses for the Congress, including fares for delegates from other continents. Dozens of writers were flocking to Paris. I was at a complete loss. What was I to do with the money? I decided to endorse the funds to the organization that was behind the Congress. I haven't laid eyes on the money and I wouldn't know what to do with it, anyway, I told Rafael Alberti, who was passing through Paris. You're a big fool, Rafael said. You've lost your consular post defending the Spanish cause, you're walking around with holes in your shoes, and you won't even set aside a few thousand francs for your work and your minimum needs. I glanced at my shoes, and in fact they did have holes. Alberti made me a gift of a new pair. We were leaving for Madrid in a few hours with all the delegates. Delia and Amparo Gonzalez Tufi Sixen and I were swamped with paperwork to clear the way for the writers who were planning to attend. The French exit visas presented us with endless problems, so we practically took over the Paris police headquarters, where the formal acknowledgments jocularly referred to as recipes were issued. Sometimes we ourselves stamped the passports with that supreme French contrivance called tampon. Along with the Norwegians, the Italians, the Argentines, the poet Octavio Paz arrived from Mexico, after a thousand adventures and misadventures. I was proud of having brought him. He had published just one book, which I had received two months before and which seemed to contain genuine promise. No one knew him yet. My old friend Caesar Vallejo came to see me with a scowl on his face. He was angry because his wife, whom the rest of us found unbearable, had not been issued a ticket. I got one for her quickly. We gave it to Vallejo and he left, as surly as when he had come in. Something was bothering him and it took me several months to discover what it was. At the bottom of it was this, my countryman Vicent Hudobro had come to Paris to attend the Congress. Hudobro and I had had a falling out and were not speaking. But he was a close friend of Vallejo's and used his few days in Paris to fill my trusting friend's head with stories about me. Everything was cleared up later in a heated conversation I had with Vallejo. Never had a train left Paris packed with so many writers. We recognized or ignored one another in the corridors. Some slept. Others chain smoked. For many, Spain was both the enigma and the key to that moment of history. Vallejo and Hudobro were somewhere on the train. Andre Malrock stopped to talk to me for a moment, with his facial tics, his raincoat tossed over his shoulders. This time he was traveling alone. I had always seen him before with the flyer Coniglian Molinier, 
who was his right-hand man in his adventures through the skies of Spain, cities lost and discovered, or a vital delivery of planes to the Republic. I remember that the train was held up a long time at the border. Apparently, Eudobro had lost a suitcase. Everyone was occupied, or preoccupied, with the delay and no one was in a mood to listen to him. The Chilean poet picked the wrong moment to come looking for his bag out on the platform, where Malrox, the leader of the expedition, was. Nervous by nature, and with a lot of problems accumulating around him, Malrox was at the end of his tether. Maybe he didn't know Hudobro by sight or by name. When he came up to complain about losing his suitcase, Malrox lost the little patience he had left. I heard him shout, Is this the time to be pestering anyone? Get away! J. Wu Senmerd It's too bad that I had to be the one to witness this incident which deflated the Chilean's vanity. I wish I had been a thousand miles away at that moment. But life is fickle. I was the one person Hudobro detested on that train. And to make matters worse, I, his countryman, and not any of the hundred writers travelling with us, had to be the sole spectator of this incident. When we got underway again, with the night far advanced and the train rolling through the Spanish countryside, I thought of Hudobro, his suitcase, the unpleasant moment he had been through. So I said to some young Central American writers who had come to my compartment, go see Hudobro too, he must be alone and depressed. They were back in twenty minutes, their faces beaming. Eudobro had said to them, Don't talk to me about the lost bag, that's not important. What really matters is that although the universities of Chicago, Berlin, Copenhagen, and Prague have conferred honorary titles on me, the small university in the small country you come from insists on ignoring me. I haven't even been asked to give a lecture on creationism. My countryman the great poet was definitely a hopeless case. We finally reached Madrid. While the visitors were being welcomed and assigned a place to stay, I decided to visit the home I had left almost a year before. My books and my things, everything had been left behind in it. It was an apartment in a building called the House of Flowers near the entrance to the university campus. Franco's advance lines had reached it and the block of apartments had changed hands several times. Miguel Hernandez, who was wearing his militia uniform and carrying his rifle, got a van to transport the books and the belongings I was most interested in taking with me. We went up to the fifth floor and opened the apartment door expectantly. Flack had knocked in the windows and chunks of the walls. The books had toppled off the shelves. It was impossible to find one's way in the rubble. I searched for things haphazardly. Oddly enough, the most useless, superfluous things had vanished, carried off by invading or defending forces. The pots and pans, the sewing machine, the dishes were there, they were scattered all over, but they had survived, yet there was not a trace of my consul's tail coat, my Polynesian masks, my oriental knives. War is as whimsical as dreams, Miguel. Miguel found some manuscripts of mine somewhere among the strewn papers. That chaos was a final door closing on my life. I said to Miguel, I don't want to take anything with me. Nothing? Not even one book. Not even one book. And we went back with the van empty. The masks and the war. My house was caught between the two fronts. On one side, Moore's MD Italians advanced on the other, Madrid's defenders advanced, fell back, or were baited the artillery had crashed through the walls the windows were smashed to smithereens. On the floor, among my books, I found shrapnel. But my masks were gone. Masks collected in Siam, Bali, Sumatra, the Malay archipelago, Bandung. Gilded, ashen, tomatoid, with silver eyebrows, blue, demonic eyebrows, lost in thought, 
my mask's bad been my soul keep six from the orient i had gone to alone that first time which had received me queet its odor of tea dung opium sweat the intensest jasmine frangipani fruit rotting in the streets those masks a reminder of the purest dances of the dancing before the temple wooden drops colored by myth the residue of a mythology of nors that sketched dreams in the air customs demons mysteries alien to my american nature and then perhaps the militiamen had leaned out the windows of my house between shots with the masks on to strike terror into the moors many masks had been left there smashed spattered with blood others had rolled down from my fifth floor apartment wrenched off by a bullet franco's advance lines bat taken up their positions in front of them the horde of illiterate mercenaries had screeched past before them 30 masks of asian gods rising from my house in their last dance the dance of death a moment of respite the positions had reversed i sat looking at the debris the blood stains on the mat and through the new windows the gaping holes left by the gunfire i stared far off beyond the campus toward flatlands toward ancient castles spain looked empty to me it looked as if my last guests had gone off forever with masks or without in the middle of the shooting and the war chants the mad rejoicing the incredible defense death or life all that was over for me it was the last silence after the feasting after the last feasting with the masks that bad gone with the masks that had fallen with those soldiers i bad not invited in spain had gone jor me memoirs by pablo neruda i went out to look for the fallen i picked a road i received my activists card much later in chile when i enrolled in the party officially but i believe i had looked upon myself as a communist during the war in spain many things had contributed to my deep conviction my contradictory friend the nietzschean poet leon felipe was a very likable man whose most attractive quality was his anarchist's proclivity to indiscipline and his mocking rebelliousness at the height of the civil war he fell easily for the blustery propaganda of fai iberian anarchist federation he was often at the anarchist fronts where he lectured on his theories and read his iconoclastic poems these reflected an ideology that was vaguely libertarian anti-clerical capped with invocations and blasphemies his words captivated the anarchist groups that blossom like hothouse flowers in madrid while the rest of the people were at the battlefront which was coming closer and closer these lawless groups had painted the trolleys and buses half red and half yellow with their long hair and beards wearing bullets strung into necklaces and bracelets they played a leading role in spain's carnival of death i saw several of them in symbolic leather shoes half red and half black which must have put the shoemakers to a lot of trouble and don't let anyone think it was all in a scene show they carried knives revolvers rifles and carbines groups of them would park themselves at the main entrances of buildings smoking and spitting showing off their hardware their main concern was to collect rents from terrorized tenants or make them hand over their jewels rings and watches leon felipe was on his way back from one of his pro anarchist lectures late one night when we ran into each other at the cafe on the corner of my block The poet was wearing a Spanish cape that went very well with his nazrene beard. On the way out, the elegant folds of his romantic attire brushed against one of his touchy co-religionists. I don't know if Le Six and Felipe's bearing, that of an old-time Hidalgo, annoyed that hero of the rear guard, but I do know that we were stopped a few steps farther on by a bunch of anarchists headed by the man who had considered himself offended at the cafe. They wanted to check our papers and after they had glanced at them the Spanish poet was taken away between two armed men as he was being led off to a place of execution near my house where firing squads often kept me awake at night i saw two armed militiamen coming back from the front 
I explained who Le Six Sen Felipe was, the offense he had been accused of, and was able to obtain my friend's release thanks to them. This ideological chaos and gratuitous destruction gave me a lot to think about. I heard of the exploits of an Austrian anarchist, an old, near-sighted man with a long blonde money, whose specialty was taking people for a walk. He had formed a squad which he dubbed Dawn because it went into action at daybreak. Haven't you ever had a headache? He would ask his victim. Yes, of course, sometimes. Well, I'm going to administer an excellent painkiller, the Austrian would say, pointing his revolver at the other's forehead and pulling the trigger. Gangs like these roamed Madrid's pitch black nights. The communists were the only organized group and had put together an army to confront Italians, Germans, Moors, and Phalangists. They were also the moral force that kept the resistance and the anti fascist struggle going. It boiled down to this you had to pick the road you would take. That is what I did, and I have never had reason to regret the choice I made between darkness and hope in that tragic time. Rafael Alberti Poetry is an act of peace. Peace goes into the making of a poet as flour goes into the making of bread. Arsonists, warmongers, wolves hunt down the poet to burn, kill, sink their teeth into him. A swordsman left Pushkin mortally wounded under the trees in a dark and gloomy park. The fiery horses of war charged over Petofi's lifeless body. Byron died in Greece, fighting against war. The Spanish fascists started off the war in Spain by assassinating its greatest poet. Rafael Alberti is a kind of survivor. He was marked for death a thousand times. One of those times, in Granada, like Lorca. Another time death waited for him in Barjos. They looked for him in Sunbrinch, Seville and in Cades and Puerto de Santa Marfa in his home province, to kill him, to hang him and so deal poetry another death blow. But poetry has not died, it has a cat's nine lives. They harass it, they drag it through the streets, they spit on it and make it the butt of their jokes, they try to strangle it, drive it into exile, throw it into prison, pump lead into it, and it survives every attempt with a clear face and a smile as bright as grains of rice. I knew Alberti when he walked through the streets of Madrid in a blue shirt and a red tie. I knew him fighting in the ranks of the people when not too many poets were following that difficult course. The bells had not yet tolled for Spain, but he knew what might be coming. He is a man from the south, born near the singing sea and cellars filled with wine as golden yellow as topaz. There his heart took fire from the grape and song from the wave. He was always a poet, but he himself did not know this in his early years. Later all Spain would know it, and still later, the world. For those of us who have the good fortune to speak and know the language of Castile, Rafael Alberti embodies all the resplendent qualities of Spanish poetry. He is not only a born poet but also a master craftsman. Like a red rose blooming miraculously in winter, his poetry contains a flake of G6 Jora snow, a root from George Manrique, a petal from Garcilaso, a fragrance of morning from Gustavo Adolfo Becker. The true essences of Spanish poetry come together in his crystalline wine glass. His red rose threw its brilliance over the road for those who tried to stop fascism in Spain. The world knows this heroic and tragic story. Alberti wrote epic sonnets. He read them in barracks and at the front, and he invented poetry's guerrilla warfare, poetry's war against war. He invented songs that grew wings under the thunder of artillery fire, songs that later soared over the entire planet. A consummate poet, he showed how useful poetry could be at a moment that was critical for the whole world. In this, he resembles Mayakovsky. This application of poetry for the benefit of the majority is based on strength, tenderness, joy, on man's true nature. Without it, poetry gives off sound, but it doesn't sing. Alberti's poems always sing. 
Nazis in Chile. Once again, I returned to my country, third class. In Latin America, there were no eminent writers like Celine, Dryula Rochelle, or Adra Pound, who turned traitor to serve fascism, but there was a strong fascist movement nurtured, with or without financial aid, by Hitlerism. Groups sprang up everywhere whose members dressed like stormtroopers and raised their and in the fascist salute. And they weren't just small groups. The old feudal oligarchies of the continent sided, and still side, with anti-communism of any kind, whether it came from Germany or the Creole ultra-left. What's more, let's remember that people of German descent make up the bulk of the population in some parts of Chile, Brazil, and Mexico. Those areas were easily seduced by Hitler's meteoric rise and by the fabled millennium of German greatness. More than once, in those days of Hitler's resounding victories, I literally had to walk through a street, in some small village or town in the south of Chile, under forests of flags bearing the swastika. Once, in a small southern town, I was forced to pay an involuntary tribute to the Fuhrer in order to use the telephone. The German owner of the establishment which had the only telephone in town had managed to place the instrument so that, to take the receiver off the hook, you had to raise your arm to a portrait of Hitler, whose arm was also raised. I was editor of the magazine Aurora di Chile. All its literary weapons, we had no others, were aimed at the Nazis, who were swallowing country after country. Hitler's ambassador to Chile donated books, by authors of the so-called Neo-German culture, to the National Library. We countered by asking our readers to send us German books that were faithful to the real Germany, the Germany banned by Hitler. It was a momentous experience. I received death threats. And many neatly wrapped packages arrived with books smeared with filth. We also received whole collections of Der Sturmer, a pornographic periodical that was sadistic and anti-Semitic, edited by Julius Streicher, deservedly hanged in Nuremberg years later. German-language editions of Heinrich Heine, Thomas Mann, Anna Says, Einstein, Arnold Zweig also trickled in. And when we had nearly 500 volumes, we took them to the library. We were in for a surprise. The National Library had padlocked its doors to us. Then we organized a march and entered the university's Hall of Honor carrying pictures of the Reverend Nimoella and Karl von Ossietsky. Some kind of ceremonial act was taking place, presided over by Don Miguel Cruchaga Toconil, the foreign minister. We set the books and portraits down carefully on the speaker's days. The battle was won. The books were accepted. Isla Negra I made up my mind to throw myself into my writing with more devotion and energy. My visit to Spain had given me added strength and maturity. The bitterness in my poetry had to end. The brooding subjectivity of my vent poemas de amor, the painful moodiness of my residencia en la tierra, were coming to a close. In them, I now believed, I had struck a vein, not in rocks underground, but in the pages of books. Can poetry serve our fellow men? Can it find a place in man's struggles? I had already done enough tramping over the irrational and the negative. I had to pause and find the road to humanism, outlawed from contemporary literature but deeply rooted in the aspirations of mankind. I started work on my canto general. For this, I needed a place to work. I found a stone house facing the ocean, in a place nobody knew about, Isla Negra. Its owner, a Spanish socialist of long standing, a sea captain, Don Eladio Sobrino, was building it for his family but agreed to sell it to me. How could I buy it? I submitted a projected canto general, but it was turned down by editorial Ursula, my publisher at the time. In 1939, with the help of another publisher, who reimbursed the owner of the house directly, I was finally able to get my house on Isla Negra to work in. 
I felt a pressing need to write a central poem that would bring together the historical events, the geographical situations, the life and struggles of our peoples. Isla Negra's wild coastal strip, with its turbulent ocean, was the place to give myself passionately to the writing of my new song. Bring me Spaniards. But life wrested me away almost at once. The chilling news of the Spanish exodus reached Chile. More than 500,000 men and women, combatants and civilians, had crossed the French border. In France, under pressure from reactionary forces, Leon Blum's government herded them into concentration camps, dispersed them to fortresses and prisons, massed them together in its African possessions near the Sahara. In Chile the government had changed. The vicissitudes of the Spanish people had brought fresh strength to Chile's popular forces and we had a progressive government now. Chile's popular front government decided to send me to France on the noblest mission I have ever undertaken, to get Spaniards out of their French prisons and send them to my country. And so, like a radiant light from America, my poetry would spread among throngs of human beings burdened with suffering and heroic like no other people. My poetry would become one with material assistance from America, which, by taking in the Spaniards, would be paying an age-old debt. Virtually an invalid, just recovering from an operation and with one leg in a cast such was my health at the time, I left my heaven and went to see the President of the Republic. Don Pedro Aguayo Cerda received me warmly. Yes, bring me thousands of Spaniards. We have work for all of them. Bring me fishermen, bring me Basques, Castilians, people from Extremadura. A few days later I left for France, still in my caste, to fetch Spaniards to Chile. I had a specific mission. My appointment papers stated that I was consul in charge of the immigration of the Spaniards. I showed up at the Chilean embassy in Paris flashing my credentials. My country's government and political situation were not what they had been, but the embassy in Paris was still the same. The idea of sending Spaniards to Chile infuriated our smartly dressed diplomats. They set me up in an office next to the kitchen, they harassed me in every way they could, even going so far as to deny me writing paper. The wave of undesirables was already beginning to reach the doors of the embassy, wounded veterans, jurists and writers, professionals who had lost their practice, all kinds of skilled workers. They had to make their way against hell and high water to get to my office, and since it was on the fourth floor, our embassy people thought up a fiendish scheme, they cut off elevator service. Many of the Spaniards had war wounds and were survivors of the African concentration camps, it broke my heart to see them come up to the fourth floor with such painful effort, while the cruel officials gloated over my difficulties. A Diabolical Character To complicate my life, the Popular Front government sent me word of the arrival of a charge d'affaires. This made me very happy, because a new department head at the embassy would be able to rid me of the many stumbling blocks the old diplomatic personnel had put in my way to impede the immigration of the Spaniards. A slender youngster with a pincenez that gave him the air of an old bookworm came out of the Gare saint Lazare. He must have been 24 or 25. In a high-pitched, effeminate voice broken by emotion, he told me that he accepted me as his boss and that the sole purpose of his coming was to act as my helper in the great task of sending to Chile the glorious vanquished of the war. My satisfaction at having a new assistant continued, but this character made me uncomfortable. In spite of the adulation and excessive attention he lavished on me, something about him did not ring true. I found out later that, with the triumph of the Popular Front in Chile, he had done an abrupt about-face, leaving the Knights of Columbus, that Jesuit organization, to become a member of the Communist Youth Movement, which was avidly recruiting members and was delighted with his intellectual qualifications. Arellano Marine wrote plays and articles, was an erudite lecturer, and seemed to know everything. World War was almost upon us. 
Paris waited every night for the German bombings, and every home had instructions on how to protect itself from the aerial attacks. I went home to Villa Neuchersen every evening, to a small house facing the river, which I left with a heavy heart every morning to return to the embassy. Within a few days the new arrival, Arellano Marine, had assumed an importance I had never attained. I had introduced him to Negrfin, Alvarez del Vallo, and a few leaders of the Spanish parties. A week later the new functionary was on familiar terms with almost all of them. Spanish leaders whom I didn't know went in and out of his office. Their extensive conversations were a mystery to me. From time to time, he called me over to show me a diamond or an emerald he had bought for his mother, or to confide in me about a very cute blonde who made him spend more than he should in the Paris cabarets. Arellano Marine became a close friend of the Argons, especially of Elsa, when the embassy took them in to protect them from anti-communist repression, he regaled them with attentions and little presents. This person's psychology must have intrigued Elsa Triolet, for she mentions him in one or two of her novels. I gradually realized that his greed for luxury and wealth was growing before my very eyes, which have never been too wide awake. He slipped easily from one make of automobile to another and rented luxurious homes. And each day the cute blonde seemed to be driving him more and more out of his mind with her demands. I had to go to Brussels to attend to a critical problem involving the emigrants. As I was leaving the unpretentious hotel where I was staying, I literally ran into my new assistant, the elegant Arellano Marine. He made a loud fuss over me and invited me to dine that same day. We met at his hotel, the most expensive in Brussels. He had had orchids placed on our table. Naturally, he ordered caviar and champagne. During the meal I was silent and preoccupied, listening to my host rave on about his lavish plans, his upcoming pleasure trips, the jewels he had bought. I was listening, I felt, to a nouveau Richie with certain symptoms of insanity, his penetrating eyes, his cocksure pronouncements, all of it made me sick. I decided to take a drastic step and tell him openly what was on my mind. I suggested that we have coffee in his room, because I had something to say to him. As we were on our way upstairs, two strangers walked up to him at the foot of the grand staircase. He told them in Spanish to wait for him, he would be down in a few minutes. Once we were in his room, I thought no more about the coffee. Ours was a strained conversation. I believe you're heading down the wrong road, I said to him. You are becoming money mad. Maybe you're still too young to understand this, but our political obligations are a very serious matter. The fate of thousands of immigrants is in our hands, and this can't be taken lightly. I don't want to know anything about your affairs, but I do want to give you a piece of advice. There are a lot of people who say, at the end of an unhappy life, nobody gave me advice, nobody warned me. That's something you won't be able to say. I've made my speech. And now I am leaving. I looked at him as I said goodbye. Tears rolled down his eyes to his mouth. I could have bitten my tongue. Had I gone too far? I went to him and put my hand on his shoulder. Don't cry. It's just that I'm furious, he said. I left without another word. I returned to Paris and never saw him again. When they saw me coming down, the two strangers who had been waiting for him hurried up to his room. The conclusion of this story came much later, in Mexico, when I was Chilean Consul General there. One day I was invited to lunch by a group of Spanish refugees and two of them recognized me. Where do you know me from? I asked. We are the two fellows who went up to speak to your countryman, Arellano Marfin, when you came down from his room in Brussels. Oh, and what happened then? I've always been curious about it. They told me something extraordinary. 
They had found him miming in tears, hysterical, and he had sobbed out, I've just had the biggest shock of my life. Neruda has gone to turn you into the Gestapo as dangerous Spanish communists. I couldn't talk him into waiting even a few hours. You have only minutes to get away. Leave your suitcases with me, I'll watch them for you and send them on later. The bastard! I exclaimed. Thank heavens you managed to escape from the Germans, anyway. Yes, but the suitcases contained $90,000 that belonged to the Spanish workers' unions, and we never set eyes on that money again. Still later, I heard that this diabolical character had made an extended pleasure tour of the Near East with his Parisian lover. Incidentally, the cute blonde who had been so demanding turned out to be a blonde male student from the Sorbonne. Sometime afterward, his resignation from the Communist Party made news in Chile. Strong ideological differences compel me to make this decision, he said in his letter to the newspapers. A general and a poet. Each man who emerged from the defeat or from captivity was a novel with chapters, tears, laughter, loneliness, and idols. Some of these stories really amazed me. I met an Air Force general, tall and lean, a military academy man with all kinds of titles. There he was, roaming the Paris streets, a quixotic shadow from the Spanish soil, old and straight as the poplars of Castile. When Franco's army split the Republican zone in two, this general, Herrera, had to go the rounds in pitch darkness, inspect defenses, give orders right and left. On the blackest nights, he flew his airplane, with all its lights out, over enemy territory. Every now and again, gunfire from the Franco side barely missed his craft. But the general became bored with flying in the dark. So, he learned Braille. Once he had mastered this writing for the blind, he went on his dangerous missions reading with his fingers, while below him the fire and the pain of the civil war raged on. The general told me that he had read the Count of Monte Cristo and was just getting into the Three Musketeers when his night reading in Braille was interrupted by defeat and exile. Another story I recall with deep feeling is the story of the Andalusian poet Pedro Garfias, who ended up in exile in Scotland at the castle of some lord. The castle was always empty, and Garfias, a restless Andalusian, went to the local tavern every day speaking no English, only a gypsy Spanish that even I could not always understand, he drank his solitary beer in silence. This wordless customer attracted the tavernkeeper's interest, and one night, when the other drinkers had left, the tavernkeeper begged him to stay and they went on drinking silently next to the hearth, whose fire sputtered, doing the talking for the two of them. This invitation became a ritual. Each night, Garfias was welcomed by the bartender, lonely like him, with no wife or family. Little by little their tongues loosened up. Garfias told him about the Spanish War, with exclamations, oaths, and curses that were typically Andalusian. The other man listened in religious silence, not understanding a word, of course. The Scotsman, in turn, poured out his miseries, probably the story of a wife who had deserted him, the exploits of his sons, whose pictures in military uniform decorated the fireplace. I say, probably, because during the long months that these strange conversations lasted, Garfias did not understand a word either. Still, the bond of fellowship grew stronger and stronger between the two lonely men, each speaking with deep feeling about his own affairs in his own language, inaccessible to the other. Seeing each other every night and talking into the small hours became a necessity for both. When Garfias had to leave for Mexico, they said goodbye, drinking and talking, embracing and weeping. The feeling that bound them so deeply was the sundering of their two solitudes. Pedro, I often said to the poet, what do you think he was telling you? I never understood a word, Pablo, but when I listened to him, I always felt, I was always sure, that I knew what he meant. And when I talked, 
I was sure that he also knew what I meant. The Winnipeg One morning when I got to the embassy, I was handed a pretty long cable by the officials. Everyone was smiling, which was odd, since they no longer even greeted me. There had to be something in the message that delighted them. It was a cable from Chile, signed by the President himself, Don Pedro Aguayo Cerda, from whom I had received time's clear instructions to put the Spanish exiles on a ship bound for Chile. I was shocked to read that our good President, Don Pedro, had learned that very morning, much to his surprise, that I was arranging for the Spanish emigrants to go to Chile. He asked me to deny this outlandish news immediately. What was outlandish to me was the president's cable. The job of organizing, screening, selecting the immigrants had been hard, lonely work. Fortunately, Spain's government in exile had understood the importance of my mission. Yet new and unexpected obstacles presented themselves daily. Meanwhile, hundreds of refugees were leaving or preparing to leave the concentration camps in France and Africa, where thousands of them were crowded together and go to Chile. The Republican government in exile had succeeded in buying a ship, the Winnipeg. It had been converted to increase its passenger capacity and was waiting, tied up at the pier at Trompe-Loup, a little port near Bordeaux. What should I do? This time-consuming and vital work, on the brink of the Second World War, was the crowning point of my life. The hand I held out to the persecuted meant their salvation and showed them the true nature of my country, which welcomed and championed them. The President's cable was about to collapse all these dreams. I decided to talk things over with Negfen. I had had the good luck to make friends with President Juan Negfen, Minister Alvarez del Vallo, and some of the other members of the Spanish Republican government. Negrifin was the most interesting. Spanish high politics had always seemed to me a bit parochial, provincial, short-sighted. Negrifin was cosmopolitan, or European, anyway. He had studied in Leipzig and had university standing. In Paris he kept alive, with all dignity, the flimsy shadow that a government in exile is. We talked. I explained the situation, the president's strange cable, which in fact made me look like an imposter, a shalton offering a people in exile a pipe dream asylum. There were three possible ways out. The first, a revolting one, was simply to announce that the immigration of Spaniards to Chile had been called off. The second, a dramatic one, was to air publicly my objections, consider my mission ended, and put a bullet through my head. The third, a defiant one, was to fill the ship with immigrants, go aboard with them, and set out for Valparaiso without authorization, come what may. Negrifin leaned back in his armchair, puffing on his huge cigar. Then a melancholy smile crossed his lips and he said, Can't you use the telephone? In those days, Telephone communication between Europe and America was intolerably difficult, with hours of waiting. Between deafening noises and abrupt interruptions, I managed to hear the foreign minister's voice far away. In a broken conversation, with phrases having to be repeated twenty times, without knowing whether we were getting through to each other, screaming our heads off and hearing only the ocean's trumpet blasts in reply, I thought I made it clear to Minister Ortega that I wasn't obeying the President's countermand. I also felt sure I had heard him ask me to wait until the following day. Naturally, I spent a troubled night in my tiny Paris hotel. The next afternoon, I learned that the Foreign Minister had resigned that morning. He would not accept the withdrawal of my authority, either. The Cabinet tottered and our fine president, after a temporary disruption due to pressures beyond his control, recovered his authority. I received a fresh cable with instructions to go ahead with the immigration. We finally put them aboard the Winnipeg. Husbands and wives, parents and children, 
who had been separated for a long time and were coming from one or the other end of Europe or Africa were reunited at the embarkation point. The waiting crowd surged forward as each train came in. Rushing up and down, weeping and shouting, they would recognize their dear ones among those putting their heads out the windows in clusters. Everyone eventually got aboard ship. There were fishermen, peasants, laborers, intellectuals, a cross-section of strength, heroism, and hard work. My poetry, in its struggle, had succeeded in finding them a country. And I was filled with pride. I bought a newspaper. I was strolling down a street in Villeneuve-Neuchâtel. I was passing by the ancient castle whose ruins, scarlet with wines, lifted small slate towers skyward. That ancient castle where Ronsard and the Pleiad poets met centuries ago captured my imagination with its stone and marble, its hendecasyllables set down in ancient gold characters. I opened the newspaper. The Second World War had broken out that day. The newspaper which my hands dropped in that old, lost village said so in bold characters in smudgy black ink. Everyone had been expecting it. Hitler had been gobbling up territories, while English and French statesmen scurried with their umbrellas to offer him more cities, kingdoms, human beings. A great smoke drift of confusion filled people's consciences. From my window in Paris, I looked out on Les Invalids and I saw the first contingents leaving, youngsters who had not yet learned how to wear their soldiers' uniforms but were marching straight into death's gaping mouth. Their going was sad, and nothing could disguise that. It was like a war lost beforehand, something inexpressible. Chauvinist groups prowled the streets, hunting down progressive intellectuals. To them, the enemy was not Hitler's disciples, the Lavels, but the flower of French thought. At the embassy, which had undergone a significant change, we received the great poet, Louis Sargon. He spent four days there, writing day and night, while the hordes searched for him to take his life. In the Chilean embassy he finished his novel Passengers of Destiny. The fifth day, he left for the front, in uniform. It was his second war against the Germans. In those twilight days, I grew accustomed to the European lack of resolve, which does not permit continual revolutions or earthquakes yet allows the deadly poison of war to permeate the air we breathe and the bread we eat. In constant fear of bombings, the great metropolis blacked out every night, and this darkness shared by seven million people, a thick darkness in the heart of the city of light, still clings to my memory. At the end of this era, I am alone once more in newly discovered lands, as if this whole long voyage had been a waste. I go into an agony, into a second solitude, just as in the throes of birth, in the alarming beginning, filled with the metaphysical terror from which the spring of my early poems flowed, in the new twilight my own creation has provoked. Where am I to go? Which way should I return, aim for, which way to silence or a breathing space? I turn the light and the darkness upside down and inside out, and I find nothing but the emptiness my hands built with such deadly care. And yet what has always been closest to me, the most fundamental, the most extensive, the completely unexpected, would appear in my path for the first time now. I had thought hard about all the world, but not about man. Cruelly and painfully, I had probed man's heart, Without a thought for mankind, I had seen cities, but empty cities, I had seen factories whose very presence was a tragedy, but I had not really seen the suffering under those roofs, on the streets, at every way station, in the cities and the countryside. As the first bullets ripped into the guitars of Spain, when blood instead of music gushed out of them, my poetry stopped dead like a ghost in the streets of human anguish and a rush of roots and blood surged up through it. From then on, my road meets every man's road. And suddenly, I see that from the south of solitude I have moved to the north, which is the people, the people whose sword, whose handkerchief my bumble poetry wants to be, 
to dry the sweat of its vast sorrows and give it a weapon in its struggle for bread. Then space opens out, makes itself deep and permanent. We are now standing squarely on the earth. We want to take infinite possession of everything that exists. We are not looking for any mystery, we are the mystery. My poetry is becoming a material part of an atmosphere that extends infinitely, that runs under the sea and under the earth both. It begins to enter galleries of startling vegetation, to speak in broad daylight with the spectres of the sun, to explore pits of minerals hidden deep in the secretive earth, to establish forgotten links between autumn and man. The air dims and at intervals thunderbolts of phosphorescence and terror light it up, a new structure that is far from the evident, from trite words, looms on the horizon, a new continent rises from the innermost substance of my poetry. I have spent years settling these lands, classifying this kingdom, touching its many mysterious shorelines, soothing its foam, going over its zoology md the length of its geography, in this I have spent dark, solitary, remote years. Memoirs By Pablo Neruda Mexico, blossoming and thorny. My government sent me to Mexico. Oppressed to the breaking point by the memory of so many painful experiences and such chaos, in 1941 came to the Anahuac Plateau to breathe what Alfonso Rice hailed as the most transparent region of the air. Mexico with its prickly pear and its serpent, Mexico blossoming and thorny, dry and lashed by hurricane winds, violent in outline and color, violent in eruption and creation, surrounded me with its magic and its extraordinary light. I traveled through it for years, from market to market. Because Mexico is to be found in its markets. Not in the guttural songs of the movies or in the false image of the Mexican in sombrero, with moustache and pistol. Mexico is a land of crimson and phosphorescent turquoise shawls. Mexico is a land of earthen bowls and pitchers and fruit lying open to a swarm of insects. Mexico is an infinite countryside of steel blue century plants with yellow thorns. The most beautiful markets in the world have all this to offer. Fillet and wool, clay and weaving looms give evidence of the incredible skill of the fertile and timeless fingers of the Mexicans. I drifted through Mexico, I roamed over all its coasts, along its steep coastlines set ablaze by uninterrupted flares of shimmering lightning. I came down from Topolobampo in Sinalo, past names indigenous to this hemisphere, harsh names willed to Mexico by the gods, when men less cruel than those gods came to rule its lands. I travelled through all those mysterious and majestic syllables from the dawn of time. Sonora and Yuktan, Anahuac, rising like a cold brazier that draws to itself the mixed aromas of the land, from Nairit to Maikokin, from where you can make out smoke from the islet of Janitzio, and the odor of corn and magwe drifting up from Jalisco, and sulfur from the new volcano, Paracutfin, blending in with the wet fragrance of fish from Lake Patscuaro. Mexico, the last of the magic countries, because of its age and its history, its music and its geography. Working my way like a tramp over those rocks forever scourged by blood, rocks crisscrossed by a wide ribbon of blood and moss, I felt mighty and ancient, worthy to walk among such timeless things. Abrupt valleys partitioned off by immense walls of rock, tall hills that looked as if cut level with a knife, immense tropical forests teeming with timber and serpents, birds and legends. In that vast land made habitable as far as the eye can see by man's struggle through the ages, in its huge spaces, I found that we, Chile and Mexico, are the two countries most unlike each other in all America. I have never been moved by the conventional niceties of protocol that lead the ambassador of Japan, looking at Chile's cherry trees, to find that we are alike, or the Englishman experiencing the fog along our coast, or the Argentine or German seeing our snow, to find that we are much like all other countries. I delight in the diversity of landscapes on this planet, the varied products of the earth in every latitude.
I don't mean to detract in any way from Mexico, a place I love, by describing it as not even remotely resembling our ocean-washed and grain-rich land. I only hold up its differences so that our America may be seen on all its levels, its great heights, and its depths. And in America, perhaps on the whole planet, no country is more profoundly human than Mexico and its people. In its brilliant achievements, as well as its gigantic errors, one sees the same chain of grand generosity, deep-rooted vitality, inexhaustible history, and limitless growth. We made a turn-off one day, into fishing villages whose nets are so diaphanous they look like huge butterflies returning to the waters to pick up the silver scales they are missing, through mining centers whose metal turns from hard ingot to resplendent geometric forms almost as soon as it is out of the depths, over roads where Catholic convents loom, thick and thorny like giant cactus plants, through markets where the rich colors and flavors of vegetables displayed like flowers make you dizzy. And crossing Mexico like this, we reached Yucatan, the submerged cradle of the oldest race in the world, the idolatrous Maya. There the earth has been shaken by history and by the germinating seed. Side by side with the century plant, the ruins steeped in human intelligence and sacrifices are still growing. Having crossed the last roads, we come to the vast territory where the ancient peoples of Mexico left their embroidered history hidden away in the jungle. There we find a new water, the most mysterious water on earth. It is not sea, stream, river, or any of the waters we know. In Yucatan, the water is all under the ground, which may crack open suddenly, producing enormous jungle pools whose sides, overgrown with tropical vegetation, leave open to view, down below, a very deep water, deep as the sky, and green. The Mayas discovered those fissures in the earth called cenotes and defied them with their strange rites. Like all religions, in the beginning there's consecrated necessity and fertility, and the land's aridity was vanquished by those hidden waters for which the earth had opened. Then for thousands of years on the rims of the sacred pools, first the indigenous and then the invaders' religion increased the mystery of the waters. From the banks of the cenote, after nuptial ceremonies, hundreds of virgins decked with flowers and gold and laden with jewels were hurled into the whirling, bottomless waters. Garlands and golden crowns would float up from the depths to the surface, but the maidens stayed in the mud of the bottom, held fast by their gold chains. Thousands of years later, only a tiny portion of the jewels has been recovered and they are in the display cases of Mexican and U.S. Museums I went into that wilderness, not in search of gold, but seeking the cries of the drowned maidens. In the shrieks of the birds, I seemed to hear the hoarse anguish of the virgins, and in their swift flight, as they swept over the gloomy deeps of the timeless waters, I saw the yellow hands of the dead young girls. Once I watched a dove light on a statue that stretches its bright stone hand over the eternal waters and the air. An eagle may have been after it. It did not belong in that place whose only birds, the roadrunner with its stammer, the quetzal with its fabulous plumes, the turquoise hummingbird, and the birds of prey, conquered the jungle for their rapine, for their splendor. The dove lighted on the statue's hand, like a white snowflake among tropical rocks. I gazed at her because she came from another world, from a measured and harmonious world, from a Pythagorean column or a Mediterranean round number. She had stopped on the edge of the darkness, she respected my silence, for I had become part of this original American, blood-stained, ancient world, and my eyes followed her flight until they lost her in the sky. The Mexican Painters Mexico's intellectual life was dominated by painting. Mexican painters covered the city with history and geography, with civil strife, with fierce controversies. Jose Clement Orozco, lean, one-armed titan, has his place on an elevated peak, a sort of Goya in his phantasmagorical country. I talked to him often. The violence that haunted his work seemed alien to his personality. 
He had the gentleness of a potter who has lost his hand at the potter's wheel but feels he must go on creating worlds with his other hand. His soldiers and their women, his peasants gunned down by overseers, his sarcophagi with horrible crucified bodies, are immortal in our Native American painting, bearing witness to our cruelty. By this time Diego Rivera had done so much work, and so much squabbling with everyone, that this burly painter was a legend. Looking at him, it seemed strange to me that he didn't have scaly fishtails or cloven hoofs. Diego Rivera had always been a fabricator. In Paris, before the First World War, Ilya Ehrenberg had published a book about his exploits and hoaxes. The Extraordinary Adventures of Giulio Gerenito Thirty years later Diego Rivera was still a great master as painter and teller of tall stories. He used to recommend the eating of human flesh as a healthy diet much favored by the greatest gourmets. He gave out recipes for cooking people of all ages. At other times he went to great lengths theorizing on lesbian love, maintaining that it was the only normal relationship, as proved by the oldest historical remains found in excavations, he himself had directed. Sometimes he would ramble on for hours, working his hooded Indian eyes and telling me all about his Jewish background. At other times, forgetting the previous conversations, he swore to me that he was General Rommel's father, but this confidence must be kept very secret, as its disclosure could have grave international consequences. His extraordinarily persuasive tone and his serene way of delineating the minutest and most incredible details made him a marvellous charlatan whose charm can never be forgotten by anyone who knew him. David Alfaro Siqueiros was in jail then. Someone had sent him on an armed raid of Trotsky's home. I met him in prison, and outside as well, because we used to go out with Commandant Paris Rulfo, the warden, to have a drink somewhere where we wouldn't be noticed too much. We would return late at night and I would bid David goodbye with an embrace, and he would stay there behind bars. On one of those trips back from the streets to the prison with Siqueiros, I met his brother, Jesus Siqueiros, a most unusual man. Crafty, in the good sense of the word, comes closest to describing him. He glided alongside the walls without making a sound or any perceptible movement. Suddenly you noticed him right behind or beside you. He seldom spoke, and when he did speak, it was barely above a whisper, which did not prevent him from hauling around, just as quietly, forty or fifty pistols in a small bag. It was just my luck to open the bag once, absent-mindedly, and discover with a shock the arsenal of black, pearl, and silver handles. It all meant nothing, because Jest Siqueiros was as peace-loving as his brother David was tempestuous. Jest's was also a gifted artist and actor, a mime. Without moving his body or his hands, without letting out the slightest sound, acting only with his face, whose lines he changed at will, turning it into a series of masks, he gave vivid impressions of terror, anguish, joy, tenderness. He bore that pale, ghostly face through the labyrinth of his life, emerging, from time to time, with all those pistols that he never used. Those volcanic painters kept the public in line. Sometimes they got into tremendous debates. During one of these, Having run out of arguments, Diego Rivera and Siqueiros drew huge pistols and fired almost as one man, not at each other, but at the wings of the plaster of Paris angels on the theatre's ceiling. When the heavy plaster wings started falling on the heads of the people in the audience, the theatre emptied out and the discussion ended with a powerful smell of gunpowder in a deserted hall. Rufino Tamayo was not living in Mexico at this time. Complex and passionate, as Mexican as the fruit or the woven goods in the markets, his paintings came to us from New York. No parallel can be drawn between the painting of Diego Rivera and that of David Alfaro Siqueiros. Diego has a classicist's feeling for line, with that infinitely undulating line, a kind of historian's calligraphy, 
He gradually tied together Mexico's history and brought out in high relief its events, traditions, and tragedies. Sicueros is the explosion of a volcanic temperament that combines an amazing technique and painstaking research. During clandestine sorties from jail and conversations on every topic, Sicueros and I planned his final deliverance. On a visa I personally affixed to his passport, he traveled to Chile with his wife, Angelica Arenales. The people of Mexico had built a school in the Chilean city of Chilean, which had been destroyed by earthquakes, and in that Mexico school, Sicueros painted one of his extraordinary murals. The government of Chile repaid me for that service to our nation's culture by suspending me from my consular duties for two months. Napoleon Ubico I decided to visit Guatemala and set out by car. We passed through the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, Mexico's golden region, with its women dressed like butterflies and a scent of honey and sugar in the air. Next, we went into the great forest of Chiapas. We would stop the car at night, intimidated by the noises, the jungle's telegraph messages. Here, there, and everywhere, thousands of cicadas transmitted a deafening sound. Enigmatic Mexico spread its green shadows over ancient structures, remote paintings, jewels and monuments, colossal heads, stone animals. All this lay about in the forest, the untold riches of fabulous Mexico. Across the border, on the highest ridges of Central America, the narrow Guatemalan road dazzled me with its lianas and mammoth vegetation, and later with its placid lakes, high up in the mountains, like eyes forgotten by wasteful gods, and finally with its pine forests and broad primordial rivers where manatees peered out of the water like human beings. I stayed for a week with Miguel Angel Asturias, who had not yet become known for his successful novels. We realized we were born brothers and spent almost every day together. In the evening, we would plan visits to faraway places on mountains shrouded in mist or to United Fruits tropical ports. Guatemalans did not have the right of free speech, and no one talked politics. The walls had ears and could turn you in. Sometimes we would stop the car on a high plateau and make sure nobody was lurking behind some tree, and we would discuss the situation avidly. The despot's name was Ubico and he had been running the country for a good many years. He was a corpulent man, with cold, cruel eyes. His word was law, and nothing in Guatemala was done without his explicit approval. I met one of his secretaries, now my friend, a revolutionary. For arguing back about something, some petty detail, he had been bound on the spot to a column in the presidential office and whipped mercilessly by Ubico himself. The young poets asked me to give a poetry reading. They sent Ubico a telegram requesting permission. All my friends and many young students filled the auditorium. I was happy to read my poems, they seemed to open a tiny crack in the window of a vast prison. The chief of police sat conspicuously in the front row. Later I found out that four machine guns had been trained on me and the audience, ready to burst into action if the chief of police interrupted the reading by leaving his seat in a half. But nothing of the kind happened, the man stayed and listened to my poems to the end. Later someone wanted to introduce me to the dictator, a man with a Napoleon complex. He liked to wear a lock of hair on his forehead, and had his photograph taken a number of times in Bonaparte's famous pose. I was told that it was dangerous to turn down the offer, but I preferred not to shake his hand and went back to Mexico as fast as I could. Anthology of Pistols Mexico in those days was more gun-totting than gunfighter. There was a cult of the revolver, a fetishism of the 45. Calls were whipped out at the drop of a pin. Parliamentary candidates and newspapers would start their depistolization campaigns, but would quickly realize that it was easier to pull a Mexican's tooth than wrest his beloved gun from him. Once a group of poets entertained me with an outing in a flower-laden boat. 
Fifteen or twenty bards met at Lake Zoxamilco and took me on this ride, hemmed in by water and blossoms, over canals and through a maze of everglades used for flowery rides since the time of the Aztecs. Every inch of the boat is decorated with flowers, overflowing with marvelous patterns and colors. The hands of the Mexicans, like the hands of the Chinese, are incapable of creating anything ugly, whether they work in stone, silver, clay, or carnations. Well, during the ride, after a good many teculas, one of the poets insisted that, as a special honor of a different kind, I should fire into the sky his beautiful pistol whose grip was decorated with silver and gold designs. The colleague nearest to him whipped out his own pistol and, carried away with enthusiasm, slapped aside the FIR. T-man's weapon and invited me to do the shooting with his. Each of the other rhapsodists unsheathed his pistol on the instant, and a free-for-all ensued, they all raised their guns over my head, each insisting I choose his instead of one of the others. As the precarious panoply of pistols being waved in front of my nose or passed under my arms became more and more dangerous, it occurred to me to take a huge, typical sombrero and gather all the firearms into it, asking the battalion of poets for their guns in the name of poetry and peace. Everyone obeyed and I was able to confiscate the weapons and keep them safe in my house for several days. I am the only poet, I believe, in whose honor an anthology of pistols has been put together. Why Neruda? The salt of the earth had gathered in Mexico, exiled writers of every nationality had rallied to the camp of Mexican freedom, while the war dragged on in Europe, with victory upon victory going to Hitler's forces, which already occupied France and Italy. Among those present were Anna Sayers and the Czech humorist Egan Irvin Kish, who has since died. Kish left some fascinating books and I greatly admired his wonderful talent, his childlike curiosity, and his dexterity at ledger domain. No sooner had he entered my house than he would pull an egg out of his ear or swallow, one by one, as many as seven coins, which this very fine, impoverished exile could well use for himself. We had known each other in Spain, and when he showed incessant curiosity about my reason for using the name Neruda, which I was not born with, I kidded him, Great Kish, you may have uncovered the secret of Colonel Redl, the famous Austrian spy case of 1914. But you will never clear up the mystery of my name. And so it was. He died in Prague, having been accorded every honor his liberated country could give him, but this professional interloper was never able to find out why Neruda called himself Neruda. The answer was so simple and so lacking in glamour that I was careful not to give the secret away. When I was 14, my father was always at me about my literary endeavours. He didn't like the idea of having a son who was a poet. To cover up the publication of my first poems, I looked for a last name that would throw him completely off the scent. I took the Czech name from a magazine, without knowing it was the name of a great writer loved by a whole nation, the author of elegant ballads and narrative poems, whose monument stood in Prague's Mala Strana quarter. Many years later, the first thing I did when I got to Czechoslovakia was to place a flower at the foot of the bearded statue. The Eve of Pearl Harbor Wenceslao Rox, from Salmanca, and Constancia de la Mora, a Republican as well as a relative of the Duke of Mora, and the author of the book In Place of Splendor, which was a best-seller in North America, and the poets Le Six and Felipe, Juan Rejano, Mirano Villa, Herrera Petere, and the painters Miguel Prito and Rodriguez Luna used to come to my house. They were all Spaniards. Vittorio Vidali, the famed Commandant Carlos of the 5th Regiment, and Mario Montagnana, Italian exiles, full of memories, amazing stories, and possessed of a culture always in flux. Jackie Sustil and Gilbert Medioni were also there. They were Gaullist leaders, representatives of Free France. Mexico also swarmed with voluntary or forced exiles from Central America, Guatemalans, Salvadorians, 
Hondurans. All this gave it an international flavor, and sometimes my home, an old villa in the San Angel neighborhood, pulsated as if it were the heart of the world. In connection with Sustel, who was then a left wing socialist and who years later, as political leader of the attempted rebel coup in Algiers, would cause President de Gaulle so much trouble, something happened to me that I must tell about. We were far into the year 1941. The Nazis had laid siege to Leningrad and were penetrating farther into Soviet territory. The foxy Japanese military leaders, committed to the Berlin Rome Tokyo axis, were in a spot. Germany might win the war, and they would be deprived of their share of the spoils. Various rumors were circulating around the globe. Zero R, when the mighty Japanese forces would be unleashed in the East, loomed closer. Meanwhile, in Washington, a Japanese peace mission was curtsying and bowing to the United States government. There wasn't the slightest room for doubt that the Japanese would launch a surprise attack, for Blitzkrieg was the bloody order of the day. To make my story clear, I must mention that an old Nippon steamship line linked Japan to Chile. I travelled on those ships more than once and I knew them very well. They called at our ports and their captains spent their time buying scrap iron and taking photographs. They touched shore at points along the coastline of Chile, Peru and Ecuador, going as far as the Mexican port of Manzanillo, where they pointed their bows toward Yokohama, across the Pacific. Well, one day, while I was still Consul General of Chile in Mexico, I received a visit from seven Japanese who were in a rush to obtain a Chilean visa. They had come from San Francisco, Los Angeles, and other ports on the North American West Coast. A certain uneasiness was written across their faces. They were dressed well and their papers were in order, they could have been engineers or business executives. I asked them, of course, why they wanted to take the very first plane to Chile, having just arrived in Mexico. They replied that they intended to catch a Japanese ship in Tocopilla, a nitrate shipping port in northern Chile. I countered that there was no need to travel to Chile, at the other end of the continent, for this, because that same Japanese line called at Manzanillo, which they could reach even on foot, if they wished, with time to spare. They exchanged embarrassed glances and smiles, and talked among themselves in their own language. They consulted the secretary of the Japanese embassy, who was with them. He decided to be open with me and said, Look, colleague, this ship happens to have changed its itinerary and won't be coming to Manzanillo anymore. And, therefore, these distinguished specialists must catch it at the Chilean port. A confused vision flashed across my mind, this was something very important. I asked for their passports, photographs, for data about their work in the United States, etc., and told them to return the next day. They objected. They had to have the visas immediately and would be willing to pay any price. I was playing for time. I explained that I did not have the authority to issue visas on the spot, we would discuss it the next day. I was left to myself. Little by little, the puzzle unraveled in my mind. Why the hasty flight from North America and the pressing need for the visas? And why was the Japanese ship changing its route for the first time in 30 years? What could it mean? Then it dawned on me. Of course, this was an important, well-informed group, Japanese spies beating a hasty retreat from the United States because something critical was about to happen. And that could be nothing but Japan's entry into the war. The Japanese in my story were in on the secret. The conclusion I had reached left me in an extremely nervous state. What could I do? I did not know the English or the North American representatives of the Allied Nations in Mexico. I was in direct contact only with those officially accredited as General de Gaulle's delegates who had access to the Mexican government. I got in touch with them at once and explained the situation. 
We had at hand the names of the Japanese and vital information about them. Should the French decide to take steps, the Japanese would be trapped. I presented my arguments eagerly at first and then impatiently before the indifferent Gaullists. Young diplomats, I told them, here is your chance to cover yourselves with glory. Find out the secret of these Japanese spies. As for me, I won't give them the visa. But you have to make a quick decision. This fast and loose game lasted two days longer. Sue still took no interest in the matter. They would do nothing, and I, a Chilean consul, could take it no further. Since I refused to grant them a visa, the Japanese immediately obtained diplomatic passports, went to the Chilean embassy, and made it in time to take the ship in Tokopila. One week later, the world would wake up to the news of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Myself as Malacologist Years ago, a newspaper in Chile printed a story about my good friend, the celebrated Professor Julian Huxley, who arrived in Santiago and asked for me at the airport. Neruda the poet, the newsman questioned him. No. I don't know any poet by the name of Neruda. I want to speak to Neruda the malacologist. That Greek word means specialist in mollusks. I was delighted by this story, which was intended to nettle me. It could not possibly be true, because Huxley and I had known each other for years and he is a sharp fellow, much more quick-witted and genuine than his well-known brother, all this. In Mexico I roamed the beaches, dived into the clear, temperate waters, and collected magnificent seashells. Later, in Cuba and elsewhere, I swapped and bought, received as gifts and filched, there's no such thing as an honest collector, gradually swelling my sea treasure until it filled room after room in my house. I own the rarest specimens from the China Sea and the Philippines, from Japan and the Baltic, Antarctic conches and palmitas from Cuba, painter shells dressed in red and saffron, blue and purple like Caribbean dancers. One of the few specimens I did not have, I admit, was a land snail from Brazil's Mato Grosso. I saw one once but couldn't buy it, and I was not able to travel into the jungle to get one. It was all green, as beautiful as a new emerald. I became such an avid collector that I visited the most remote seas. Friends also began to hunt for conches to become snail crazed. When I had gathered together 15,000 shells, they filled every last shelf and began to spill from tables and chairs. Books on conchology or malacology, call it what you will, overflowed my library. So, one day I took my whole collection and carried it to the university in huge crates, making my first donation to my alma mater. It was a famous collection by then. Like any good South American institution, my university received it with praises and panegyrics and buried it away in a basement. No one has seen it since. Araucania While I was far away, at my post on the islands of the remote archipelago, the sea hummed to me and the silent world was filled with things that spoke to my solitude. But cold and hot wars corrupted the consular service and eventually made each consul an automaton, without personality, unable to make any decisions for himself, and his work became suspiciously close to that of the police. The ministry insisted on my checking the ethnic origins of immigrants, Africans, Asians, and Jews could not enter my country. This stupidity reached such extremes that I, too, became its victim when I started a handsome magazine, without a subsidy from the National Treasury, and named it Araucania. On the cover I used the picture of a lovely Araucanian wearing a toothy smile. That's all the foreign minister needed to give me a severe dressing down for what he considered something debasing, even though Don Pedro Aguayo Cerda, whose pleasant and noble face had all the features of our mixed race, was president of the republic. It is common knowledge that the Araucanians were crushed and, finally, forgotten or conquered. What's more, 
history is written by the conquerors or by those who reap the spoils of victory. There are few races worthier than the Araucanian. Someday we'll see Araucanian universities, books printed in Araucanian, and we'll realize how much we have lost with their clarity, their purity and volcanic energy. The absurd, racial, pretensions of some South American countries, which are themselves the results of many national origins and mixed breeding, are a colonialist vice. They want to set up a days where a handful of snobs, scrupulously white or light-skinned, can appear in society, posturing in front of pure irons or pretentious tourists. Fortunately, all this is becoming a thing of the past and the UN is filling up with black and Mongolian representatives. In short, as the sap of intelligence rises, the foliage of all the races is gradually displaying all the colors of its leaves. I ended by getting fed up and one day I resigned from my career as Consul General forever. Magic and Mystery Furthermore, I realized that the Mexican world repressed, violent, and nationalistic, cloaked in its pre-Columbian civility would get along without my presence or approval. When I decided to return to my country, I understood less about Mexican life than when I came to Mexico. Arts and letters thrived in rival circles, but God help any outsider who sided with or against any individual or group, everyone came down on him. When I was almost ready to leave, I was honored with a monstrous public demonstration, a dinner for almost 3,000 persons, not counting hundreds who couldn't even get in. Several presidents sent congratulations. Still, Mexico is the touchstone of America, and it was not an accident that the solar calendar of ancient America, the node of irradiation, wisdom, and mystery, was carved there. Everything could happen. Everything did happen there. The only opposition newspaper was subsidized by the government. It was the most dictatorial democracy anyone can imagine. I recall a tragic event that left me badly shaken. A strike was dragging on in a factory, with no solution in sight. The strikers' wives got together and agreed to try to see the president and tell him perhaps of their privations and their distress. Of course, they had no weapons. Along the way they got some flowers to present to the head of state and his wife. A guard halted the women as they were entering the palace, and they were allowed no further. The president would not receive them, they would have to go to the appropriate government bureau. Anyway, they must vacate the premises. It was an ultimatum. Nay women pleaded their cause. They wouldn't be any trouble. They just wanted to deliver the flowers to the president and ask if he could do something to settle the strike soon. Their children had no food, they couldn't go on like that. The officer of the guard refused to relay any message. And the women would not go. Then a volley of shots from the direction of the palace guard splintered the air. Six or seven women were killed on the spot and many others wounded. A hasty funeral took place on the following day. I had believed an immense procession would follow the caskets of the assassinated women, but only a few people showed up. Oh, yes, the union leader made a speech. He was known as a prominent revolutionary. His speech at the cemetery was in an irreproachable style. I read the entire text the next day in the newspapers. It did not contain a single line of protest, not a single angry word or any demand that those responsible for such an atrocity be put on trial. Two weeks later, no one even spoke of the massacre. And I have never seen it mentioned in writing by anyone. The president was an Aztec ruler, a thousand times more untouchable than England's royal family. No newspaper could criticize the exalted functionary either in jest or seriously, without suffering immediate consequences. Mexican dramas are so clothed in the picturesque that one comes away astounded by all the allegory that is every day more remote from the essential throb of life, the blood-spattered skeleton.
The philosophers have become euphuistic and launch into existentialist dissertations that seem foolish under a volcano. Civilian action is intermittent and difficult. Submission takes on varying aspects that stratify around the throne. But every kind of magic is always appearing and reappearing in Mexico, from the volcano born before a peasant's eyes in his humble orchard, while he was planting beans, to the wild search for the skeleton of Cots, who, rumor has it, rests in Mexican soil with his gold helmet protecting the conquistador's skull these many centuries, and the no less intense hunt for the remains of the Aztec Emperor Cuauhtémoc. Lost four centuries ago, they keep showing up here and there, safeguarded by secretive Indians, only to sink back time and again into unfathomable darkness. Mexico lives on in me like a small stray eagle circulating through my veins. Only death will fold its wings over my sleeping soldier's heart.